The following message is best viewed on an oscilloscope. So good afternoon. Welcome to the second session of the uh, quark and lepton flavor physics. Uh, so just to remind uh, the speakers, uh, you all have uh, 12 plus three minutes. Uh, our schedule is tight, so please be on time. I'll be, uh, we and me and Karin will be sharing the session and we'll uh, let you know when you have five minutes less and then two minutes. Um, as I said uh, just, just now, we prefer that you broadcast your slides and uh, your image. So if there are no problems with connection, this is best. And uh, please, uh, if there are more, more questions that the time allow us, the use, we encourage people to use the Mattermost channel, which is open. And at the end of the, the block, the, the session today, we also let the, 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 the space for speakers to continue discussions if they wish. So I think we can begin. So I invite uh, Fabio to, uh, to start. Measurements of CKM metrics elements. Uh, yes, hello. So you should see the slides now. <laughs> So, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, uh, today I will uh, report about the measurement of um, CKM matrix elements uh, on behalf of the CD collaboration. So, uh, the CKM paradigm uh, has been tested to a very high precision by several independent measurements, uh, as you can see from, uh, from the results of, of the CKM uh, FITA collaboration on, on the right part of the slides. And uh, in the CKM paradigm, BDKs can, can be exploited in many ways. For example, CKM angles uh, are useful, uh, are obtained from CPV measurements, and uh, the, the, these angles are getting more and more precise. The module of VTD and, and VTS uh, uh, are constrained by, by oscillation measurements, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the model of VCB and VUB uh, are obtained from selectonic decays. And in this case, the main players uh, have been the B factories. And uh, uh, regarding uh, VCB, there has been a long standing puzzle that I will try to. Uh, summarize in the next slides. So as you can see in the right plot, the, the, there is a tension of about three sigma between the, the, the exclusive and the inclusive determination of VCB. And um, as, you can, as you can see from the bands, there are several measurements and the B factory performed uh, uh, lots of measurement with B0 and B minus decays. Then uh, some years ago, there was a first step into the field by the LCB collaboration with the measurement of, UB of, of the model of VUB of a VCB with lambda B decays. Uh, in this case, the measurement is uh, affected by different systematic uncertainties and brings up uh, independent information. So it's a very important measurement. But uh, uh, what I want to stress is that also B sub SDKs can be exploited for the measurement of uh, the model of UB and, uh, and the model of BCB. Uh, there is a, a big interplay with, with theory. Uh, uh, for example, uh, lattice QCD calculations are very promising and will have a very good precision uh, on B sub S form factor to extract the model of BCB and I invite you to, to, to follow the next talk by Oliver. Uh, in our case, the form factor for the B sub S to the sub S we knew uh, are, are available uh, over the few Q square spectrum, uh, whereas the, the form factors of, of the B sub S to the sub S time we knew are measured uh, with a good precision uh, only at uh, zero. 
Uh, going to the LCB experiment, uh, the, the experiment collected about nine inverse pentobarns at the uh, 7, 8, and 13 TV uh, center of mass energy in uh, six years of data taking. And uh, we have about 10 to the 10 B sub S produced per inverse pentoban. Uh, 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 we, we have one kilohertz of reconstructible B sub S that are interesting for physics. And th these uh, B sub S decays are selected mainly thanks to, to, to muons by requiring uh, threshold on the transverse momentum and, and displacement from, from the primary vertex. And, and these uh, uh, results in uh, hundreds of thousands of sub -S candidates that are saved on this and are available for physics analysis. And uh, all of this paves uh, uh, the way to, towards a measurement of BCB with a sub -S to sub -S and a sub -S time in any case. So uh, just a, a few words on the strategy and the data set. So uh, the, the, the impulses knowledge of, of, of the collected the integrated luminosity uh, and of the PP to BBX cross section would be a limiting factor for the measurement of the model of VCB at the order of five to eight percent relative uncertainty. Uh, but this uh, systematic uncertainty uh, can be uh, greatly reduced by, by using a normalization channel. And uh, uh, in this case, we decided to use uh, uh, the B0 to D mu nu and the B0 to this time mu nu the, with the D reconstructed in the same visible final state as the sub S, so is the KK pi final state. And, uh, <clears throat> but in this case, we, we need a, an additional ingredient that is the, the, the ratio of the normalization fractions uh, that, that is called the S over FD. And this is measured with a precision of 5% that translates into a 2.5% uh, uncertainty on the model of VCB. And on, on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the, the KK pi invariant mass spectrum. On, on the left side, you can see the, uh, the D plus with 82,000 uh, signal candidates. And on the, on the right side, you can see the, the, the sub S with uh, 272,000 uh, signal candidates. Uh, one challenge of this, uh, this analysis is to separate signal from background, and uh, this is uh, uh, very hard due to the uh, unreconstructed neutrino, since we cannot reconstruct a clear B sub S peak, uh, unlike, uh, for example, the, the B factories, and, uh, and, and thus uh, it's very difficult to separate signal from background. Uh, but LACB already pr uh, proved to be able to overcome this challenge by, uh, by employing the corrected mass. Uh, the definition of the corrected mass is reported in the red rectangle in the top right corner. And uh, uh, you can see here, for example, one previous analysis in which uh, the, the two B sub S decay channels can be separated both uh, between themselves and also uh, from, from the physical, physics and, and combinatorial backgrounds. Uh, in this case, uh, VCB can, can be obtained from a measurement of the decay rate as a function of, of the recoil W, uh, but this recoil W needs to be um, is a, an approximate quantity uh, because we have a, a missing neutrino in, in the decay chain. So the idea, uh, the novel idea of this analysis is to exploit the perpendicular component uh, of the momentum of this, this sub S with respect to the B0 uh, uh, or B sub S flight direction, as you can see from, from the sketch. And uh, this quantity is fully reconstructed. So it's, it's a very good, uh, good known. And, and it's highly correlated with the W, as you can see from the from the from the top from the the, the, the bottom right uh, uh, plots where uh, you can see the true w from the simulation as a function of this uh, uh, per perpendicular variable uh, in a two dimensional plane and uh, also the, the form factors are functions of, of w so is since we are sens sensible to, to 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 w it's also possible to measure the the form factor of the decay uh, so um, we need to analyze the inclusive sample of this best uh, new uh, candidates, where the this best star is partially reconstructed, and uh, uh, we perform a two-dimensional fit to the corrected mass and the perpendicular of the this best in order to determine uh, the modulo BCB and the form factors simultaneously. And uh, to do this, uh, we use uh, two-dimensional templates that are built from a simulation and, uh, and that account for efficiency for, for the efficiency on the two-dimensional plane. And, and uh, you, you can see the relation between the, between the differential uh, observer yields and, and, and the differential decay rate uh, that contains VCB and the form factors. Uh, we decided to constrain the form factors from lattice QCD uh, in order to obtain, uh, to, to gain precision on the model of VCB. And uh, the, the factor kappa that you see in the, in the, the formula in the middle of the slides 
cont contains the measured B0 reference yields, the, the, the input branch infractions, uh, the ratio of the transition fractions at S over FD and the B sub S lifetime. Going to the results, so we needed to, to, to choose a form factor parameterization in order to determine VCB. And uh, we, the first choice was, uh, was a general model from Boyd, Greenstein, and Labet, that is uh, commonly called the VGL. And here you can see the, the results for the model of VCB and the two uh, fit projections on the left for the corrected mass and on the right for the perpendicular uh, momentum. And you can see that the fit quality is, uh, is pretty good. And we have a p-value of 63%. Then uh, we also performed analysis uh, using a different uh, form factor parameterization. In particular, we decided to use the Caprini, Lelluc, and Neubert parameterization that is called CLN. But uh, as you can see from the projections in the two bottom plots, uh, the, the one on the left is for the B sub S to D sub S menu, and the one on the right is for the B sub S to D sub S star menu. You can see that the, the fit results and, and, and the data uh, compared between B CLN and BGL, uh, they are almost identical. So that there are no significant difference found uh, in, in, in between the two parameterizations. Uh, for the measurement, the dominant uncertainty is due to external inputs and is a 3% relative on, on the model of VCB, and this is mostly due to FS over FD. And the second one, dominant uncertainty is the knowledge of the D and the sub S KK pi die structure that brings up 2% relative uncertainty on VCB. Uh, some additional results of the analysis are the first measurement of the exclusive branch ratio that, uh, that you can see here, and also the, the, the ratio of the two exclusive branch ratios. And these results are compatible within 0.1 and 0.7 sigma with precision from Bordone, Guvernari, Van Dijk, and Young. Now I go to another uh, complementary measurement that is the shape of the B sub S to B sub S time in new differential decay rate. This, this measurement is performed on a completely independent data set. And the, the main challenge in this case is to, is to reconstruct the photon in this best star to this best gamma uh, decays in a cone that is around uh, the this best flight direction. And uh, then the one performs a, a fit with this best gamma uh, invariant mass in order to, to subtract the background that is due to, to, to uh, random photons uh, in, in the events. And on the right part, uh, in, on the right plot, you can see the, the, the results of this fit. Uh, then uh, one needs to approximate the W by employing uh, some uh, MVA-based algorithm and, uh, and uh, fit the correct mass in means of the uh, approximate W in order to obtain the, the differential decay rate. And uh, on, the, on the right part of the slide, you can see two fit projections for two different beams of W. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, in these cases, the main backgrounds are due to the B sub S to D sub S star tau new decay and to this B sub S to this DS1 2460 mu new decay. Uh, the result for the analysis uh, can be obtained once one uh, unfolds the efficiency and the resolution by using uh, simulated events. And then uh, one can fit the differential decay rate uh, with, both, with both the CLN and the BGL parameterization. And you can see the results of this fit in the top right plot. And uh, also another important thing to notice is that uh, uh, this analysis shows a, a good agreement with the four factors that are measured in the, in the analysis that I pre uh, presented before, so the BCB analysis, that are represented uh, uh, as a shaded histograms in the, in the bottom right, right uh, uh, plot. So coming to my conclusions, uh, the LCB collaboration proved to, uh, that the B sub S to the DS menu and B sub S to the S time menu decays are a viable option to measure the foreign factors and the model of VCB. Uh, in particular, today I presented the first measurement of the shape of the B sub S to the DS time menu uh, differential decay rate, and the first measurement of the model of, of VCB at, at the Hadron Collider using B sub S to the S uh, menu and B sub S to the S time menu uh, decays. And uh, in the red box, you can see the, the, the results obtained in the two different parameterization, the CLN and the BGL parameterization. And uh, those results that we obtain are uh, in agreement with both the exclusive and the inclusive determinations, as you can see from the uh, right plot that collects all the uh, measurements, uh, uh, exclusive measurement of VCP performed in the, in the last uh, 20 years. And uh, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, questions for Fabio? You can raise hands or just jump in. Yes, Doris, go ahead. Uh, can you go back to page 14? 
where we, we show the uh, distribution of uh, over recoil. Yes, uh, 15, sorry. I was oh. talking about, yeah, okay. it doesn't matter, yeah. Uh, I was wondering how you, you are, how, whether the lattice people will give you a distribution similar to these plots. Uh, sorry, I didn't... Lattice QCD, lattice QCD. So when we will get the prediction from lattice QCD on this, is that... Yeah, the... in this, this recoil variable. Uh, I, I'm not sure uh, that, that on, on the timeline uh, of this, or if we already have a prediction on this, actually. Uh, I'm not sure. We have prediction for sure on the form factors that we have, and uh, and uh, by comparing them with the, with predictions, uh, uh, they, they they agree pretty well. But I have uh, we have also to say that uncertainties are, are pretty big at this stage, so uh, it's not a very precise step. But 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 the, but the prediction from uh, from form factors uh, they agree with the with the LCD results. That that I can tell you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we can go to the next question. Someone, okay. oh yes, uh, Christoph. Yes, can you hear me? Uh, so I have a similar question. Um, this um, measurement of BS to DS mu, uh, does it cover the whole uh, Q square or W range or is your sensitivity um, concentrated in a particular range and does it match the latest prediction, do you have a good overlap or do you have to make an assumption to connect the poles? So, uh, so you are referring to this spectra in Q square? Yes, exactly. Okay, okay. so uh, as far as I know, the, the W range is from 1 to 1.5 approximately. And this can be translated directly to Q square. So uh, uh, I would say, yes, this is a measurement of the full spectrum of Q square that, Q, that, that you can have. Yes. And the latest prediction and, is also over the full range, or is it only in a particular? Uh, the, 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 uh, for the uh, for the B sub S to D sub S time you knew, I am not sure if we have lattice prediction just at zero recoil, uh, that is Q square uh, equal to, to, to zero, okay. or, or on the full spectrum. Probably Oliver in the next talk can be more precise than me, but but I, I'm not completely sure on this. Thank you. No problem. Okay, thanks Fabio again. We can move on. The next talk is from Oliver Witzel on non perturbative calculations of form factors for exclusive semi leptonic B isobastic case. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so uh, sunny greetings from Colorado and um, Thank, thank you, Fabio, for the nice introduction. So I will continue talking about V sub S decays, but from the lattice per perspective to calculate the non-perturbative contributions. And first of all, I would like to thank my collaborators on this project, in particular, Jonathan Flynn, Ryan Hill, Andreas Jutna, Edwin Lizarazu, Amjit Sony, and uh, Tobias Zhang. So as you all know, we are interested in determining fundamental parameters of the standard model like the CKM matrix elements. We are also interested uh, in addressing uh, observations or challenge, challenging the standard model, which are interesting. So in particular, the uh, lepto fl flavor universality tests in the ratios RD and RD star have caught a lot of attention recently. And so far, we are looking at this typically for semi-leptonic B decays, but we can also look at that for B sub S decays. And as we just learned, LHCB can do a wonderful job in measuring these decays. And so we get an independent cross-check on the commonly used channels B2 pi L nu and B2 D star L nu if we look at B2 BS2 DS L nu and BS2 K L nu, for example. Since we are only exchanging the spectator quark, flavor symmetry should hold very well. And we expect that this is really a good cross-check on what we have. And we can also hope to address these long-standing discrepancies between exclusive and inclusive determinations. Likely, looking at B sub S decays will be more precise than uh, B to tau nu decays. And it's a further alternative is to look at the um, baryonic decays of a lambda B going to a proton. 
From the lattice point of view, looking at strange quarks is definitely favorable because they are making the lattice calculations easier. Now, basically a one page summary of the lattice calculations. We work in Euclidean time. So we do a wick rotation and discretize space time to a rectangular grid. And then we can turn the path integral into a large but finite dimensional job, which we can tackle with statistical methods. However, we do have the length of the box as an infrared regulator. And at the same time, the lattice spacing works as a, uh, as a UV regulator. So we have to obey constraints that the light quarks are happy, not feeling too squeezed in the small box. But at the same time, we do need to have high enough resolution to uh, deal properly with the heavy quarks, in particular with the bottom quark. And the general rule of thumb is that the quark mass and lattice units needs to be less than one. So depending on the lattice spacing, whether it's coarse or more fine, we have different concepts on how to deal with the charm and bottom quarks. And while well, for the bottom quarks, I'm going to refer to a relativistic action in this work. We are trying to, we are using a fully relativistic action for the charm quarks in the B sub S to the S decays. Now let me jump right away to the first decay. So looking at BS going to KL nu. But, and the process is uh, sketched here. So we have the strange quark, which just go, goes unchanged. And then we have the bottom quark, which on the left forms our B sub S state. And it decays under the exchange of a W to a U quark and forms the kaon. The W itself will give us a lepton neutrino pair. So this is the charge current decay, three level in the standard model. And the experiment will determine the branching fractions. And then we can parameterize that in terms of known coefficients plus the CKM matrix elements highlighted in blue, VUB. And in addition, we need to have the form factors, F plus and F naught, which are the non-perturbative inputs. So they parameterize the contribution due to the strong force. And we use an operator product expansion to identify the short distance contributions. And these we can calculate um, uh, on the lattice by determining matrix elements for the flavor changing currents, and that's basically a point-like operator. Schematically, this is that then how we really enter the lattice calculation. So we want to calculate this matrix element, a BS changes under the vector current to a K on. That can be parameterized by the two form factors we defined earlier. And in the picture, it's shown as we have a, so have a, at a, at a source on the time slice T0. We let the strange quark propagate in time to a time later T sync. At that point, we create a so-called sequential source for the B quark, which goes then back in time and is contracted with a light quark also originating from T0. And at this point here, we have the, um, the operator insertion and vary the range between T0 and T sync to determine the signal of the three point function. Um, now on the lattice, we are having discrete symmetries. So instead of directly computing F plus and F naught, we prefer to compute F parallel and F perpendicular, which are then just the temporal and the spatial directions in the three point function. And both are, however, linearly related to F0 and F plus by forming the appropriate combinations given on the bottom. And to give you a picture how this looks like, this is an example for our finest ensemble. In this case, the B meson is on the right, the K on is on the left, the blue data points are the signal we are observing, and then we are looking for the flat range in between. And on the left, this is F parallel um, at zero momentum, and on the right, it is at one unit of momentum. And uh, we then look for the flat range, and we can uh, account for so-called excited states contributing so you see a little bit of curvature. It's better resolved on the left, where we um, account for these additional states in the fit function to determine the plateau. And what is shown on the left here are how the two determinations of just fitting the ground states or including an excited states perfectly agree, which gives us a handle on the systematic of the signal we are determining. Now we have to do this exercise for all the ensembles we are using. And for uh, 
different momenta. So what you see here are now a set of six different ensemble. Each ensemble has, is given by the same color and is statistically independent. The red colors refer to the coarsest ensemble, the blue ones to the medium ensemble, and the green one is our finest ensemble. So we have three lattice spacings. And then we have on the coarse and the fine different values of the light C quark mass, which gives us um, a handle on, uh, on how to estimate the effects due to having unphysical heavy pions in the C at this point. What you see is that we could determine the values for different momenta of the k on, and these data points of the same color are now correlated. So what we do is to obtain a Cairo continuum limit, we fit all of these data points together using an ansatz inspired by heavy meson Cairo perturbation theory given on the bottom. And then we obtain the colored lines, which are supposed to pass through the same color data points. And in addition, the chiral continuum limit where we are extrapolating all quark masses to their physical value and the lattice spacing is sent to zero. That is the black line with the gray arrow band. And this covers the range where we have data in our simulation directly. And on the left, this is the result for F plus and on the right, it is for F zero. Now, once we have done that, this result only shows the statistical uncertainty on the con Carl continuum limit, but we now have to estimate all sorts of systematic errors. And I have a long list here. And um, instead of going through this list in detail, let me just show you a few plots. First of all, we need to address the systematics due to our fit ansatz. And this is done by doing variations. And in these plots, you see the gray background is our statistical, is our preferred result with a statistical uncertainty. And then the colored lines give us different um, systematic effects from varying the fit function by omitting terms or by changing the pole term and so on. And basically what we see is that everything is on the same order as our statistical precision for F plus, whereas there is one uncertainty which is relatively independent of Q square, which is a little bit larger for the higher Q squares in case of F zero. Now, in addition, we have to estimate the uncertainties which we cannot get from just varying the fit function. We, are, we need to look at discretization effects and uh, uncertainties of the input parameters, et cetera. And this gives you then the layout plot where the statistical error is on top. The systematic due to the fit is given in blue and the other uncertainties are then color coded on the bottom. All in all, we get a result of around 4% for both form factors in the range where we have Q square. Now, as Christoph was asking in the last question, this is a restricted range in Q squared, which we are studying, and we want to extrapolate that over the full range. And for that, we need to refer to the kinematical extrapolation or Z expansion, going back to Boyd, Brinstein, and Lebet, and later refined from Borelli, Caprini, Lelouch. And it is basically mapping the Q squared plane with a cut onto the unit disk in Z space. And this is the equation you do. The basic philosophy is that you are converting the parameter range from Q squared to a well-defined range on the unit disk. And you symmetrize the fit range to improve the um, kinematic extrapolation. And so you can just go forth and back between Q squared and Z. It's just easier to perform the expansion in the Z parameterization space. Specifically, we are using BCL right now for testing out our uh, fits. So the equation is given up here, and then we need to account for the, sub for the product of factors for subthreshold poles in the case of BS2K. This is now a first look at our um, uh, BS2K extra expansion over the full Q square range. And since I'm running out of time, I can just show you a quick comparison to other, other lattice results. And all in all, there is good agreement with this still persisting discrepancy at zero Q squared to the HBQCD 14 result. But we are still working on making the comparison here. We are also working on including analytic predictions. So in the last minute, let me quickly jump to BS to DS, which basically has the same equation, except that we have to deal with the charm quarks here. And this is the status of our result. We, are, uh, we have the 
chiral cut genome limit um, implemented, and we have a good result here. And there you can see that the range in Q square is significantly smaller because the DS is eating up much more of the energy. And what we are doing here is either an extrapolation or a small interpolation to the physical uh, DS meson mass. Now we are still working on uh, estimating the full error budget. And what we already see, it is a harder task because the statistical errors are significantly lower. They are of the order of 1%. So you have to be more careful in considering all the systematics because they can be more, more easily be significant. And um, at this point, we hope to have a final result of a few percent, but uh, that is still under heavy discussion within the collaboration. So let me briefly summarize. The calculation for BS to KL mu is essentially complete, and we are working on the comparisons and extracting phenomenologically interesting quantities. Um, whereas for DS, L, BS to DS L mu decays, we are still finalizing the systematics, but we are hopeful to finish the result very soon now. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. We have time for one question, maybe. And we encourage people to make questions at the Matamost, too. So any question? OK, so I see no raising hands. So uh, thank you, Oliver, again. Uh, we can move on to Russia. First results on VUB and VCB with the bell, bell two. Okay, should I share my screen? Huh? All right. Okay. All right. So I don't know how to get rid of the Zoom, but anyways. So uh, these this is a talk on the first results on VUB and VCB with the Bell 2 experiment. So um, the Bell 2 experiment, a uh, brief intro, it's a B-meson factory in Tsukuba, Japan. Uh, we collide electrons and positrons at an asymmetric energy, and we produce uh, B-meson pairs uh, primarily. It's an upgrade of Bell 2 uh, to higher uh, luminosities. Our target is to collect 50 times the Bell 2 data set. This will give us a large uh, number of B, uh, charm, and tau uh, events, and these will uh, therefore allow for a very rich physics program in uh, determining, uh, like studying B anomalies, uh, looking at lepton flavor violation, or uh, studying charm mixing. So our current Bell to data set, we recently started data taking. Uh, our current data set is around 74 inverse femtobarns. Uh, for today, our results are presented with uh, our 34.6 inverse femtobarns of reprocessed data. <clears throat> so VCB and VUB, as presented uh, by Fabio, uh, you know, precision measurements of the CKM matrix elements are at the core of the Bell 2 physics program. We're a flavor factory, and so we will uh, we plan to determine these elements uh, precisely. Um, and for VUB and VCB, these are determined uh, primarily from semi-leptonic decays of B mesons. And you could see here there's this uh, tension between exclusive and inclusive VUB and VCB measurements, which we want to uh, uh, Start, I guess, uh, investigate and measure along with other related B anomalies. And so for inclusive decays, you know, there are a couple of ways to um, um, target these. So inclusively is where we fully reconstruct, uh, where we don't fully reconstruct the X system, which is seen. Um, and, and then exclusively is where we fully reconstruct the uh, decays of the B meson in, in the semi-leptonic decay. And we could also use tagged measurements where we reconstruct also the other B in the event along with the include along with the signal B. So here I'll, today I'll present where we're at in terms of the in terms of measurements of VCB and VUB at Bell two. 
So um, to start with, one of the modes we've looked at is this exclusive B to D star L nu uh, decay. Here, this is an untagged measurement. We exclusively reconstruct one of the, um, uh, we, we don't exclusively, sorry, we don't re exclusively reconstruct one of the Bs in the event. We exclusively reconstruct the B to D star L nu signal decay. This is the flagship decay for uh, BCB measurements. Uh, to determine this, we reconstruct D to K pi, uh, our, um, and then their D star is reconstructed by combining it with a D and a pi on. The lepton is identified using a PID algorithm, um, and we express continuum events uh, by requiring that the D star momentum should be less than 2.4 GeV and by cutting on the Fox for a moment. Here you see a plot of cos theta by in both the electron and muon channels, and you could um, here where cos theta by is the angle between the B and the Y, and the Y is the system made up of the D star and the lepton in the center of mass frame. So for signal events, we expect the cos theta by to range between minus one and one, and we see this clearly in our in our two uh, plots. Uh, we extract the signal using a fit to this uh, cos theta by distribution, and we find that our branching fraction is compatible with the current world average. We also look at the ratio of the d star e nu to the d star mu nu modes, and. Um, Moving on, we, we also examine the hydronic recoil parameter spectrum, W, uh, defined here in the top left corner. Um, what we do is we divide our, our spectrum into five equal bins of 0 0.108. Here you see a plot on the top uh, center, a plot of W um, for, the, for the full spectrum. And we also see for the muon modes, uh, D star mu nu, um, entries um, in the first W bin. This, these, determining these partial branching fractions in bins of W are a key step to, to actually determine VCB. And so we see here we have a good agreement between uh, our expectation and, and data. So this is um, a, good, uh, a good milestone for further precision measurements here. We also unfold the W spectrum to, to compare with theoretical distributions. So we remove, uh, we unfold the spectrum by, and remove uh, reconstruction and resolution uh, effects. And we do a first comparison in these five bins with the BGL, uh, if, um, BGL theoretical predictions uh, in the partial decay rates that shown here. And we see general good agreement. And so um, in the future, we plan to uh, determine uh, these partial branching fractions of VCB and, and perform further uh, comparisons with more and more data for higher precision. So uh, another uh, important decay uh, is the B to D L nu, where here we also exclusively reconstruct the decay product as D to K pi. Um, uh, in addition, this is very similar to the previous D star L new results just presented, but in addition, we apply a D star veto by combining the, uh, the D candidate with any uh, soft pi on or any soft pi zero or gamma uh, and see whether we get a mass uh, D star candidate with a mass compatible with the D star mass. And you can see here in the yellow, the D star cross feed is, is, is um, important in this mode as expected, but we see good agreement in data in Monte Carlo. And this is also the first measurement of this mode in, in both the electron and muon mode. And will uh, more precise results will follow in the near future. So moving on to inclusive B to XL nu uh, decays, we start with uh, B to X U E nu. So this is a, a flagship decay for measurement of inclusive VUB. Here we don't fully reconstruct this X system. And to determine VUB, what we do is we look in for uh, a BB, in a BB bar event, we look for a lepton. Uh, and we look in the endpoint spectrum of the center mass momentum. So that endpoint spectrum is defined between 2.1 and 2.8 GeV. Um, and to uh, look for these events, we identify one lepton using PID algorithms. 
we suppress uh, continuum events uh, using a multivariate uh, trained on event shape variables, and uh, we use off resonance data to uh, to estimate our continuum contributions. We use simulated uh, Monte Carlo in uh, sideband regions, so not in the endpoint below 2.1 GeV to uh, fit other BB bar contributions. And then we subtract these from the endpoint spectrum and look for excess. And here you could see an excess in B to X enu uh, in data. And this excess is equivalent to, uh, uh, is greater than three sigma. So moving on, we now look at tag decays. And by tagged uh, is here we use um, hedronic tagging, where we fully exclusively reconstruct one of the B tags, uh, one of the Bs in the decay using hedronic modes, and then look in the rest of the event for our signal B. This allows us to infer the momentum of our signal B and is ideal for decays where we have missing energy, because any missing energy in the event can be attributed to the signal B. Um, a, we here for these analyses, we're using this full event interpretation, which is a novel technique developed at Bell for Bell 2. See the talk by William Sutcliffe on Thursday. But this is um, this uh, tagging algorithm has almost twice the efficiency at the same purity for similar techniques. So using this tagging, uh, we also measure B to pi L nu, which is another flagship decay for VUB exclusive determination. Here we uh, reconstruct the hydronic tag and then look for pion and lepton. Um, and then we uh, reconstruct this missing momentum vector and look at the missing mass square distribution shown here. Um, the signal region is defined in the uh, missing mass squared region below 1 GeV. We extract the signal using a fit in that signal region and we find uh, a branching fraction of 1.58 times 10 to the minus four, which is in agreement with world average. And our current um, significance is around 5.7 sigma. We also using our tagging technique, look at the exclusive B to D star L nu decay. Um, and we here we construct D star to D pi, D to K pi. Uh, we identify this high momentum lepton and we also um, look at this missing mass square distribution and extract the signal yield using a fit to this distribution. Our current result is in agreement with the world average and we see good agreement between our data and Monte Carlo expectations. So, um, and finally, using our tagging, we also look at the hydronic mass moments, which are uh, uh, one of the targets, uh, one of the um, goals in our uh, with Bell 2 to determine these hydronic mass moments. Uh, these are used to determine BCB and the mass of the B quark. Um, to do this, we use FBI hydronic tagging, but we don't, we uh, infer this X sub C system using whatever is left over in the event. So the rest of the event after reconstructing the tag B and the lepton. Um, this is our X sub C spectrum shown here. Uh, we subtract backgrounds. Uh, the backgrounds are shown on the right-hand side we, by assigning a signal probability to each event. And these backgrounds are estimated using two control samples where we have um, the, B, the, B, the signal B and the lepton have the same sign. And um, once we subtract our backgrounds, we extract our moments. We first determine these calibration moment uh, functions to, as, to correct for any experimental and resolution effects. And we have an additional factor of to correct for calibration and reconstruction bias. And we extract the first six moments um, with uh, in, in the B to XCL nu. Um, here we saw we show our moments uh, with in comparison with previous experiments, the Bobar and Bell specifically, and we see reasonable agreement given um, a good agreement with our statistics. So towards higher luminosities, we uh, so we've we have the platform. I guess we're building up our our measurements with more uh, data. We expect to reach higher precisions, and we better understanding our detector performance. We expect to decrease our statist uh, our uncertainties on VUB and VCB, both exclusive and inclusive measurements. These uh, uncertainties will be decreased by a factor of two or more depending on the mode. So in conclusion, we've shown uh, first measurements for both the tagged and untagged B to D star L nu at the Bell 2 experiment. We also 
we did the first measurement of beta pi L nu and showed evidence of non-zero VUV in the lepton momentum endpoint. And we, um, we also performed the first measurement of the hydronic moments for inclusive beta XC L nu. There will be more to come with increased luminosity. Thanks. Thank you, Rasha. Very exciting to see results from Bell too. Are there questions? Okay, uh, Liz, as I said before, please use the Mattermost for any questions that may appear. Well, thank you. And now I pass the baton to uh, Karim. Hello, thanks. Okay, so there are uh, still two talks uh, before uh, the coffee break. So I propose uh, we go on with uh, Franco Simonetto about the angular analysis of the B2D and the star uh, leptoneutrino decays at Babar. Okay, can you hear me please? Yes. I'm trying to share my screen. There we are, there we should be. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, very nice. So I thank you for inviting me to have this talk. We pass from a brand new experiment to a very old one, we, which stopped running several years ago, but is still producing the results. And here I'm going to present a measurement of form factors in B2D star lepton neutrino decays. So the reason for that, uh, well, it's pretty clear to all the people in this audience, uh, we have uh, many long-standing issues in heavy flavor physics. Uh, among these, uh, the poor or completely uh, wrecked uh, the compatibility between the determination of BCB from inclusive and from uh, uh, exclusive decays. Uh, which might either be a sign of some problems in our understanding of the decay processes which bring to these final states, or maybe could even be a hint that there's new physics in the form factors which describe the decays. Let me briefly remind uh, the game uh, of rules by one side. This is a measurement which uh, exploits a deep interplay between theory and experiments because the role of theory is to convert from the very beautiful ideal and easy life at the quark level world to the hard reality of the absurd hadrons. Then the role of the experiments is, of course, to the compute rates and branch inspections. But in addition to that, they can provide constraints to the theory by measuring uh, spectral shapes, uh, differential rate, and particularly form factor, as is the case for this talk here. So you have already seen this formula before. You know that we can decompose the partial decay rate uh, in terms of uh, well, well known parameters as the Fermi constant, then some electroweak correction, VCB, which is the name of the game, then phase space factors, and uh, a term which is connected to the helicity amplitudes, which describe the decay, which can be also formulated in terms of three form factors, one vector, and two actual vectors. And in fact, uh, they can be measurement or measured, or I could, should say more correctly, constrained to a four-dimensional fit to, well, the Q square, the square of the uh, momentum carried by the W meson, and then three helicity angle, which parameterize uh, in detail the, de the details of the decay of the W and of the discharge. Due to the limited data size, however, you cannot really determine the shapes of form factor just from the measured spectra, but you need some input from theory, and then you can interpolate the theory prediction uh, determining a few free parameters. 
So the first step in determining from factors is uh, redefining the variables in such a way that they are easier to be dealt with. So we move from Q square to the omega, which is in fact V times V, and uh, which is related to Q square in this way, then omega can be mapped to another uh, variable Z, which has the quite uh, pretty feature of uh, being contained in a very small region. So, uh, so perturbative expansions can be done in this parameter. And that's what, for instance, done with the um, parameterization of void greenstein lebed which express the form factors uh, in a power series expansion with a really minimal theoretical assumption. This formula is very well known. And you see basically that you can, can express the form factors in terms of well-known functions, and then a power series in Z, uh, which depends on few unknown parameters that are, that are this AI. Well, they are free parameters, but they have an analytic bound which limits uh, their uh, maximum uh, possible value. So already should be a small. Uh, so the sum of AI must be less than one. Okay, so in practice then uh, for this measurement, we will not uh, uh, push the fit, the development to infinity stop at 10, one equal to one due to statistical limitations. An alternative approach has been proposed by Caprini, Lelouch, and Albert. This is a bit more aggressive than the other one in the sense that it uses HQT bounds to reduce the number of free parameters so that we have uh, this expression for the form factor, the uh, one of the actual form factor, which is expressed in terms of a normalization term produced, produced by lattice QCD and the slope. And then we have the other two form factors that are expressed as ratios to the first one. And the only three parameters are the normalization of the two ratios. So basically for with this approach, you need the only need to fit a slope and two normalization parameters. Coming now to the measurement we have seen in the previous nice talk to what we, I would like to call an old approach the first approach that all experiments has been following since the time of Clio and Lab, And basically you select what a, an untagged sample which provides you a large like a set. However, with a sizable background, with a coarse resolution because you missed the neutrino. And up to now, all experiments didn't perform a full fit, but they fitted to 1D projection and then take it into account correlation to get the result. What I'm showing here now instead is a new approach based only on take the event, which gives, however, a small data set. But as we will see with the GBLOOK background, with a terrific resolution in each of the parameter due to kinematic bounds, which allow these two facts allow to a full effect to the 4D space. So it's a tagged analysis. So we have a tag side and the signal side. The tag side consists, as we've seen before, in fully reconstructed, that don't be the case. We use uh, 10,000 modes, more or less, which gives a very loose selection with high efficiency and low purity. But we don't care about the low purity because the signal side is pretty clear. We have a fully reconstructed semi-leptonic decay where only the neutrino is missing. So in the end, we have very clean data sets. So as for the selection, I wish to underline that we have a very constrained system because we know everything about the two, every fully reconstructed, reconstructed one of the bees. We know everything about the other, then we have mass constrained. So it's an over constrained system, which allows us, for instance, to reconstruct both the energy and the momentum of the missing neutrino and compare the two of them. And so you see what's the resolution that we get when we make the difference between the missing energy and missing momentum. It's of the order, sorry, I wrote, uh, uh, yeah, yes, the full width of maximum of this distribution is about 50 MeV, which is quite a score for neutrino reconstruction. In addition to that, you can use the confidence level of your overall fit in order to further 
the trees, the background, and then we also have a, tile, a light uh, cut on the extra energy carried away by low energy photons. All in all, as you can see by inspecting these plots, which contain all the cuts apart of those for the variable we are looking at, you see that we have a wonderful signal to noise ratio. Background is below 3%, which is quite a score for semi-leptonic measurements. So as PITS, we perform a couple of them and not extend the mean maximum likelihood in order, that, in order to determine just the shape parameters. Or in addition, we can we also perform an extended and bin maximum likelihood where, however, we feed our feet from with information from outside. In fact, we ask that our integrated rate be equal to the ratio of the branching ratio and the lifetimes of the B involved uh, as provided by the HFLAB working group. So first, before coming to results, I show you the fit quality. It's not easy to compare, but on top, you have the data distribution for the chi versus cos theta v and integrated along Q square in three bins of cos theta l. So this is a, an attempt to make a, a full description of all the variables uh, employed in the fit. On bottom, you have the output of our Monte Carlo reweighted to the fit results with input parameters corresponding to the fit results. And you should try a 2D uh, comparison of the two plots. If your eyes are not well trained on that, you can look at the chi square over n bins, which is coming out from each of these three plots to say that all in all, we have quite a good agreement. So coming to the results, uh, here I have on top, you see the results uh, for the Boyd et al. Uh, uh, parameterization. On bottom, you see the results uh, for the Caprini, Lelouch, Neubert. Well, these numbers are not going to tell you much. The value of VCB, you can see it's quite consistent with the one you have already seen in the past. The, statist the overall error, which includes statistics and experimental systematics, is uh, small, but not as small as in other cases because of statistical limitation. What is worth to underline, however, is uh, that you should look in the three plots where we show the form factors in the Caprini parameterization. You can compare the blue line to the red one, showing that these are our experimental results. And they simply uh, confirm that uh, our data are both consistent with both parameterization, Boyd and Caprini provide a similar result, even if they have different structure. What is more striking is the comparison of the blue line with the green line, because the blue line is our result, which I remind you is much less dependent, for instance, on background, and is driven by a much better resolution with the world average, which is the green uh, line you see here, and you can appreciate that in all the three cases, uh, the, two per, the two curves uh, don't uh, match well. And this is particularly true if you look at the second uh, actual vector form factor, where the difference between our fit and the world, and the world average is uh, quite striking. If we perform an overall comparison of our results with those published by HPLAV, we see that the compatibility, the p-value is less than two per million. So coming to conclusion, I have shown you a new approach to measure, to make a very old measurement nowadays, which I'm sure is paving the way for future measurement of VCB and form factor thanks to the fact that it has negligible background and excellent resolution. The main, most striking result of this analysis is that the shape of form factors is not consistent with what is tabled uh, from a previous measurement. 
even if apparently this is not explaining the, uh, the difference between inclusive and exclusive results on VCB. So clearly Babar is over for this game, but we have just heard that Baltu is entering the game. And so uh, we can be pretty confident that quite soon, uh, if Baltu will apply this same technique to, its, to the huge amount of data that they are going to collect, we will probably solve all present tradition or at least hopefully, and maybe be able also to release theory constraint in, mother, in order to provide a less model dependent determination. Okay, with this I'm over and I thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one question. I see already, well, okay, I, I see two. If uh, Let's see if uh, they are quick enough. So, Christoph. Yes, uh, I hope it will be quick. So, I'm a bit puzzled by your claim that uh, your shape that you measure is not consistent with the world average. Because, in principle, um, you use the world average at least a new branch fraction. To get a value of VCB, you must extrapolate to the zero recoil point, and the result is consistent with the world average. So, if your shape would be inconsistent with the world average, how can you get a consistent value of VCB? So, that doesn't seem to. to well, uh, first of all, uh, you should notice that the main discrepancy is coming from one of the three form factors. And uh, you remember that one of the, that the parameters that we are fitting is the normalization of one of the form factors to the other one. If when I, sorry, I don't know if I have uh, in the, uh, yeah, here I have, you can maybe appreciate the fact that the main discrepancy we have from the world average is in fact on the normalization of the second uh, form factor. Uh, you can also see that the slope is not very different. Slopes are quite consistent, but the normalization of the second form factor is uh, quite different. So here is that where we have the problem. Apparently, however, this is, you know, it's very difficult uh, going from one projection to a four dimensional adjustment. Apparently, uh, this is not affecting the overall rate, but just the shape on one, uh, just uh, the, the, well, the normalization of one of the four factors. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, if, if the other question is uh, much faster, then uh, I would uh, also take the other. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, following up essentially from, from the previous question, so it can be very fast. So I, I, I want to just to notice that the, uh, the actual h uh, combination for, uh, for this uh, uh, measurement has a pretty poor uh, uh, consistency, has a pretty poor p-value. So I wonder whether the discrepancy is uh, with any of the specific measurements that, that uh, enters the, the combination or uh, uh, or, or, I mean, if you looked into a little bit more details, and, and not just at the overall combination, but if, even at the individual measurements, there are a bunch of measurements by Babar and Bell that enter uh, the determination of this word average. Okay, of course, uh, sorry, I cannot answer to your question, but I take the point uh, and uh, we will make a comparison. I could also just go through the parameters measured by all other collaborations and uh, let you know the answer in, in not a long time. Okay, thanks a lot. So for uh, any further discussion, please uh, use the Mattermost uh, channel. Now I would say we go on with the last talk before the coffee break. Uh, Marcella Bona uh, will uh, discuss about the updates on the unitarity triangle uh, by the UT fit. Mm. I need to share. Hello, everybody. Hello. Okay. Okay, you can start. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'll uh, give you uh, the usual update on the uh, on our fits uh, with uh, the user fit collaboration. Um, so I've uh, uh, updated the, the analysis with um, new inputs. So every single plot and single number updated with uh, what I label the summer 2020 inputs. Um, and I'll go through the standard model analysis and the uh, new physics analysis uh, for with uh, the different uh, um, properties uh, and interests. So um, this is just a reminder of our website. Uh, as the plots and numbers, as I said, that they are um, really just a hot off the press uh, for this conference. So they are not on the website yet. I expect uh, I need to do a little bit more um, statistics, but in general, they, they will appear in the next days. Um, again, I'll, I'll just uh, remind you what we use. Uh, uh, we use the um, uh, variation approach uh, and we need to have the, um, uh, the uh, observables. Uh, we need to have the connection, the, the functional connection with the uh, theoretical parameters. And then we need some uh, um, parameters that, that allows us to go from the hydron level to the fork level that we are operating at. Okay. So um, we have heard already a lot, so that's good that I included this uh, um, slide. So I have, uh, we have our own, uh, um, so from our point of view, we try to use um, the ECB and the UB as inputs. And of course, as you know, there is a little bit of a discrepancy. So these are the latest uh, numbers that we could uh, um, cook up a little bit. So the um, exclusive numbers both for, from uh, U, um, UB and VCB are from um, FLAG. Uh, that was the, uh, the, the latest updates that we got. And then uh, the inclusive results are from HFLAG, but you see that uh, for the UB, we, um, we noticed that there was a, a spread in the central values there, and so we uh, took a flat um, error to cover that given spread. The other um, thing, so in the, in the plot, you see the uh, various uh, uh, visualization of these uh, numbers and their errors. Um, and there's the usually, so we heard about uh, LACB and, and their measurements with UB over VCB. Uh, we have nothing against uh, LACB in this measurement. However, uh, we follow the flat guidelines uh, and because the lattice numbers are a sing coming from a single collaboration, they, they're not included in our average. So um, regret regretfully, we um, took it out from our um, average. However, what we did is also um, to um, do a PDG inflation, uh, a la PDG inflation of the averages. So you see that the blob, the, the orange and yellow blob uh, of the user feed average in, in the plot is really covering uh, all possible uh, intersection of the, of, uh, the inputs. Um, and basically these are the numbers that we get with this procedure um, on this page. At the bottom, you see also the comparison with the user feed prediction that, uh, I mean, I call them prediction when I run my fit and then I remove the inputs that I'm interested in looking at. So this is what the, the numbers that fit prefers without using VCB or VUB respectively. Um, so then the other game we do is run the full fit to separating the exclusive and inclusive um, values. So I run this with uh, um, VUB and VCB only exclusive on one side and only inclusive on the other side. Now, the fit is becoming very precise, so I need to zoom in. And then this is the zoom in version. And you see there is a little bit of, uh, of the confusion, in, especially in the exclusive part, where there is a little bit, of, uh, there, there are tensions, uh, especially with epsilon k. I report here the tension that we see with the sign to beta, uh, which is the, the usual way we look at this uh, type of, of tension, and that we are at the 2.3 sigma level. Um, so then uh, the other update I did we did is the lattice PCB inputs. Um, there's been lit some updates and also some uh, different choices in calculating the average by our um, lattice colleagues. I don't, I, I don't uh, um, have too much to say on this. 
uh, just to make sure that we um, that, that people know what we're using as input. There is a little bit, so most of the results are similar to our past update. Um, because of this different way of calculating the error, the error has gone down a little bit in the first the three lines. So the the BK and the DF, the F, the BS, and then the the ratio, um, the BSDD. Okay, so that's a little bit the effect that we've seen with respect to our uh, last update. Um, and then we put everything together. This is just uh, the summary of the main constraints, and we get to the uh, full standard model picture. Um, and with this number again, it's getting hard to see the area. So I zoom in, and uh, and this is uh, uh, showing quite a nice agreement. And of course, uh, uh, you can see, clearly see that part partially this nice agreement comes from this uh, a, a little bit bigger band from the VUB, VCD, the yellow band that you see there. And uh, and that's uh, that's clearly uh, one effect that we can uh, see. Now, then what we can do, we can do several configurations. So I chose the, the classic ones that we've been looking at. And so at the top um, left, uh, uh, you have the universal, the Burris universal unitary triangle. Um, and then the, the bottom uh, uh, left, uh, the three only case uh, where you only use three level, pro three level processes. Uh, so um, gamma and the uh, UB over VCD. And you see there for those I, I also put to the values for rho and insert with with a little bit increased um, uncertainty with respect to the full fit clearly. And then on the right you see the case of the angles only and the size. Again, it's good to uh, zoom in. So I did the same for in, in this slide. You have exactly the same uh, structure as the as the previous one, but it's just zooming so that we can actually see area that is selected by the fit. Um, the other way we have to uh, look at to how the inputs are compatible within, with each other is uh, this compatibility plot. And basically, we run the fit without uh, the observable that we're interested in. And then uh, um, we uh, plot uh, the, uh, on a two-dimensional play, uh, plane the observable and its error. And then the um, experimental value that uh, we usually use as the input it will become just a point in this grid. And that's what you see here. And this is the, the case of, uh, of alpha and gamma, uh, where we have a, a rather good agreement at the level of 1, 1.1 uh, sigma. Uh, if you go next, uh, we usually then check the usual tension that we expect in a way. And so there is a uh, uh, VUB, as I've already mentioned several times. Uh, here you have uh, the, the, the cross uh, uh, is the input value that we use. And as, you, as I already, we already, uh, I already mentioned, it has an integrated error. So you, you have no tension there. Uh, but then if you split into the exclusive or inclusive values, you see that the inclusive is the one that less agree with the rest of the fit as we already know. On the right, you have the uh, sine two beta. And again, we have a 1.8 effect of from, sigma effect from, um, of, of tension with the fit. Um, this slide shows a, a summary of all this. And um, you have, again, the measurement as the, the inputs that we use and also the prediction that comes from the fit without using the given input. And then the last one, the, um, the sigma of agreement is somewhat. Um, and then again, you have uh, the arrow uh, is not matching. But anyway, you see that 2.3 uh, from uh, UB inclusive and then the 1.8 of sine to beta are the main highlights here. Then the other things that we can do, we can reverse the, our fit, uh, not really reverse, it'll just add extra um, observable. And basically saying, because we have, uh, we are over constraining at the moment because we have a, a distance amount of constraints, we can even push it a little bit more and add extra constraints that represents uh, new physics uh, um, uh, spaces. So, for example, we can imagine to have a, a, an amplitude from new physics and a phase coming from new physics. And that's the most generic parameterization. 
and that uh, means though that you need to reinterpret your your, um, your observable in line with this extra um, amplitude and phase and you see how we reinterpret the standard constraints at the bottom of the page and the then we can look at this the new physics parameters two ways either as a as a, a multiplicative um, factor to the amplitude or you can also look at the, the ratio between the new physics over the standard model amplitude. So the, to, to do this, we are also helped by new other, other constraints that are not particularly used in the, you, they're useful in the standard model one, but they are uh, useful to, um, to constrain also the sub S sector and also to have constraints that act on both the, the, the size and the phase of the new physics that we um, implemented. And so this is typical, for example, the semi-electronic asymmetries are giving you this kind of uh, uh, constraints. And at the bottom of the page, I mentioned phi S. Now, um, we used to, we had different type of inputs, but at the moment uh, for our uh, analysis, we use the only phi S. And so no, we don't use also delta gamma S at the moment. And so basically, um, I redid uh, a, a UT fit style plot with the current situation. And if you project on the, on the X axis, so you, you look at from the point of view of phi S, the, the measurements are not uh, particularly in tension. And so we can do a simple average, which is the, the, the gray blob that you have there. Of course, if you want to use a delta gamma S, uh, then you need to think a little bit about it. And, and that's what gonna, we're going to do in the next month. Um, because clearly there is some discrepancy, or maybe the LAC will, do, um, will look into that as well. So um, it, then we run the uh, new physics analysis and uh, the fit, and we get out so the usual rho and eta um, uh, uh, values. And this is the um, rho and eta plane where we um, uh, plot only the constraints that are unaffected by new physics, so the three level constraints, basically. Um, and, uh, and you see that the errors on here are a little bit uh, bigger because, of course, you have added degrees of freedom to your fit. Uh, but then you can also look at the new physics parameters as I, I implemented them. And uh, here you have the, uh, on the left side, the B sub D um, system and the, and the right side, the B sub S system. And then you see that the, there is uh, the area allowed for these new physics parameters and also the red cross is the standard model. So you can see how there is a little bit of tension in particular in the phases, not too much in the um, amplitudes. Another way to look at this and is uh, judging the amount of, of uh, new physics uh, amplitudes still available with respect to the standard model um, that the fit can accommodate. And here you have uh, so this uh, ratio on the on the x axis and then again the phase on the y axis. And basically you you see that uh, the sub axis we saw that the errors are re, uh, reducing so it becomes quite constraining of, of uh, your new physics uh, space. Uh, but still you still have a 25-35% of uh, of uh, of uh, new physics uh, um, that is still uh, possible in this uh, scenario, in the current scenario. Now, the last thing that we usually do is uh, to um, reverse, again, in the new physics scenario, to uh, switch on uh, all, this, uh, all the operators that can, uh, um, that can um, um, appear once you have new physics. And, and there, you, the new physics effects are um, um, coded in the Wilson coefficient. And then the Wilson coefficient can be then uh, be uh, interpreted as, a, uh, um, as, as made of the three factors coming from the, uh, the flavor coupling of the new physics, so a loop factor that is the, the, how the new physics coupled with, uh, with the standard model. And then the lambda, which is a, a, we call the new physics scale, but it's basically, you can imagine there is a mass of the new particle mediating the delta f equal to two processes. 
And then uh, you can uh, um, uh, revert your constraint, you get the constraint from the feet and the Wilson coefficient, and then make a different assumption in different scenarios, you can extract, extract a constraint on lambda. And that's what we want to do. If you don't have new physics effect, you get a, a bound, uh, a lower bound on the new physics scale lambda. And of course, you can choose different type of couplings, uh, your flavor couplings uh, that are some model like or not or, or generic, uh, or and, and then uh, different type of couplings of new physics with the standard model. Now, the default uh, we we take is at, as one, so a strongly coupled new physics with some model, although it's unrealistic, but it's not important because whatever result you get, then you can just uh, scale it with the coupling that you want. And so this is the result for the uh, Wilson coefficient and the new, phys well, new physics scale, really. And the different colors are the different uh, neutral Nelson systems. And so the, the stronger one, this is usually chaos, and it's still okay, the case uh, with this updated results. And on the, on the left, you have the generic scenario where you have a, a generic uh, um, flavor um, structure. On the right, you have an extra flavor violation scenario where you have uh, basically a, a, a CKM structure with upper story space. And, uh, and this is, uh, and the, the limits on the lambda, of course, uh, for, is given for, uh, um, as a 4.3 10 to the 5 TV for the generic case and 89 TV for the next, uh, next minimum flavor violation case in the case of a strong uh, coupled uh, new physics, of course. And so what is interest, more interesting is the top to bottom case where, you, for example, you, you assume a, a coupling that is a, a weak coupling, and so you scale for 0, 0 0.03, for example. And that's something that, uh, for example, in the next um, uh, minimum flavor is flavor violation scenario is uh, getting us uh, closer to the to LHC rich, even if it's still a little bit high. So to conclude, um, uh, this is the usual conclusion where I always end up saying that uh, um, the analysis displays rather good overall consistency. Um, there's still the issue of the idea being inclusive that it still looks like the outlier. Um, we, I showed also the new physics contribution that are still allowed the, the current uh, precision of the fit and then the scale analysis uh, that uh, shows once again that um, the, 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 the indirect searches that we do with flavor are not only complementary, but of course to, to direct searches, but they can be more informative in, 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 uh, in depending on the scenario we're looking at. And of course, I, I, I talked only about bottom uh, quarks, uh, down type quark, um, but, um, uh, but it, there's, uh, there's still an eye to be kept on the up quark sector. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Marcella. I see already a few uh, people uh, who, want to, who want to have some questions. So I think the first was a Sheldon Stone. Hi, uh, a very nice talk, Marcella. On slide 12, in the standard model fit, I thought you had a value for ASL of 0.32 uh, plus or minus 0.03%. Um, oh, sorry, the table here. Yeah. Yes. Well, that, that's uh, strange because the standard model prediction is a few 10 to the minus five and you have a few 10 to the minus three. This is the, the so this is the uh, experimental measurement that we have. No, the, the measurement is- The input. Your measurement is minus 2.1 plus or minus 1.7. Your fit has minus 0.32 plus or minus 0.03, which is like a 10 sigma effect and it's, uh, I think it's 10 to the minus four for ASLD is the prediction. Yes. So you're, you're showing non-standard model physics here if we were to believe this. Um, I can check. I, I've, I might have done this one late at night. Um, no, but, it, but it's, uh, true. it's true. I just looked it up. Uh, the standard model prediction is a few 10 to the minus four. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what's your question. My question is, 
why doesn't this look like non-standard model physics in ASLD? If that's what you're, what you predict, which is what means that you're getting out of all the data and the prediction is 10 times smaller. I'm not sure I'm getting your point. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sure. it, so, sorry, somebody is trying to talk. Yes. No, okay. uh, I mean, the, the, I'm not a super expert on, on asymmetry, uh, asymmetry, um, asymmetries, but this, so, um, if you're saying that the prediction is in line with what we're, you're seeing, then I'm not sure uh, I see the point. In the, no, the prediction is a factor, the standard model prediction is a factor of 10 smaller than your prediction from your overall fit, which ah. would Ah, okay, but but the, the, if if it's within the error, it means uh, simply that no, it's not within the error. Okay, okay, I'll, uh, I'll check that then. Okay, now I understood. <laughs> Took me a while. Okay, you're ten sigma above. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll I'll check that. Um, I might I might have done a miscalculation of the error. But Excuse me, but isn't this number multiplied by ten to the three? So, so in fact, the number is 10 to the minus 4. It's 3.2, 10 to the minus 4. That explains it. Thank you. Oh, OK. OK. <laughs> oh, I see. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's 10 to the minus to the, to the, to the yeah. 3. That, that would definitely like that. explain it. Thank OK. You. OK. Sorry. <laughs> OK. I think we have uh, time for one last question. I see there was already a uh, Dory scheme. Uh, who wanted to, to ask something? Yeah. Uh, can you go to page number 19? Hello? Yes. I'm, I, in, in my, my view, I'm on page 19. Oh, OK. Then you have to go three, three more pages. Yeah, there. Uh, here you are showing uh, the plot of uh, Psi, S, and Gamma. Uh, I heard that all three experiments uh, updated their numbers during July. So I was wondering which version of numbers you are using. So this I did uh, this Sunday. So it, it should be the latest one for all the three of them. Uh, because yeah, I, would, I see. I wouldn't put my hand on, on the on fire on the fire because I really like um, it. It's complicated to uh, disentangle some some of the of the numbers. But what I did, uh, I this don't don't use this one. This is really just uh, me to uh, help me visualize and help me make the average and then compare with some other average. Uh, then I decided that uh, I mean the the LAC uh, uh, group is working on on averaging that, and so that they, they will. At some point, they will be um, talking seriously about this. As we are only using Phi S, uh, even with a, a, a PDG inflation, I guess I still get this. So there's no there's no difference. But clearly, there is a, there is an issue. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think um, yeah, I'm not sure about LACB because LACB published an update on uh, recently, and I'm not sure if I if I'm using this one, so I haven't um, um, checked, but I can easily check and-, and Yeah, yeah, I, I sent you an email. I think Atlas yeah. updated their number a couple of days ago. Yeah, so Atlas, of course, because I'm also in Atlas, but I didn't do that with any Atlas information. I just uh, used public numbers, just to be sure. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I know that Atlas updated. So I, I because I I I, I knew the updates. Uh, I updated the numbers. Uh, they are not public, so there's there's no conflict of interest. But I I have to admit that I'm not sure a hundred percent sure that I'm using the latest from LCB because what I want to use here is the KK only. Um, oh, I see. I don't want to use the Pi Pi as well because in principle, oh. it's different. Uh, um, theoretical uncertainty that comes in. Um, okay. And also, yeah. Also, what we plan to do is to do 
to add a theoretical uncertainty uh, once we, we have an estimate for this uh, to the bias uh, measurement. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks uh, a lot uh, for the discussion. I think uh, now it's time for the coffee break. Uh, I would propose uh, to resume at uh, five past five, uh, since we are a bit, uh, a few minutes late. Uh, okay, so see you later. Bye.
Okay, uh, welcome back. I think we can start uh, this uh, sub-session, which is mostly uh, uh, dedicated to lepton flavor violation and lepton universality, lepton flavor universality. So uh, the first talk uh, is uh, uh, by Stefan Weber uh, on uh, the lepton flavor violation at LHCB. So please, uh, Stefan. Yes. Hello. Uh, let Hello. me share my slides. Uh, I think you can see them now. Can yes. hear me well, I hope. Okay, thank yes. you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so welcome to my talk. Um, I will talk about lepton flavor violations and uh, I will do this on behalf of the LHCB collaboration. Um, in my talk, I will first give a brief motivation and then I will basically present uh, three searches for lepton flavor violation. This is a B2K mu electron, then a B0 and B0S to tau mu, and finally B2K mu tau. Um, so recently there were some tangents with the standard model discovered, um, for example, by the LHCB collaboration, and this especially within uh, B2S LL transitions. So examples are the ratios of branching ratios, which suggests that we see lepton flavor universality violations. And then we also have angular distributions of uh, these uh, decays. And uh, in general, one, one can say that uh, extensions of, uh, standard, of the standard model, which are able to explain this, these effects, they quite naturally should lead to sizable lepton flavor violation contributions also. And examples for these models uh, involve leptoquarks, or heavy uh, gauge bosons and uh, many others. And on the other hand, in the standard model, these lepton flavor violation processes are very much suppressed. So on the order of 10 to the minus 54. And this means this is unobservable uh, within uh, the foreseeable future. This means an observation of lepton flavor violation would be a clear sign of beyond standard model physics. Um, so that's why we are looking for them. And let me present uh, some selected LHCB results. The first one is the decay B plus to K plus and then a neon and an electron. Um, their various models make predictions for this and uh, they range between uh, several orders of magnitude and this can go up to 10 to the minus eight. The best experimental limits so far come from the Babar experiment. And uh, there one can distinguish between uh, two chart configurations and the limits are on the order of 10 to the minus eight. Um, in our LHCB analysis, we have been using uh, run one data. These are three inverse femtovan at seven and eight TeV. Um, the basic strategy is to trigger first on a high momentum, uh, high PT muon. And uh, then as the next step require three charts charged tracks, which form a common secondary vertex, which is incompatible with any primary vertex of the event, and which are identified as a kaon, muon, and an ele electron using our PID uh, detectors that we have. Um, to calculate the branching ratio, we don't uh, usually do this in absolute terms directly, but we normalize this to uh, well-known decay channels. And in this case, this is the decay B plus, 2K plus, and the J psi, with, with, which then decays further to a dimuon pair. And as a control channel, we also use the dielectron pair. So in the analysis, we uh, have to reconstruct an electron. Uh, this is a bit complicated because this can radiate Krems strahlung. Um, but uh, within our calor calorimeters, we are also able to um, to recover partially the energy loss from Bremsstrahlung. Um, this does not work perfectly, um, but uh, with this, uh, so we lose a little bit of resolution, but we can partially um, resolve this. And within the analysis then, analysis, then different fit functions can be used for the different cases of whether we have photons of Bremsstrahlung recovered or not. Um, in the analysis, uh, the main background uh, consists of a partially reconstructed BD case. So you can have this uh, case where you have a double semi-leptonic decay, which can produce this, uh, this pair of uh, leptons. And for this one can impose mass constraints on the uh, uh, combinations of the decay products. 
also uh, it's possible to have a germonium decay with one of the leptons misidentified as a kaon, and this can be cured with mass vitus. Uh, then in the analysis, we also employ two boosted decision trees against combinatorial and partially reconstructed background. Um, yeah, these uh, two invariant mass distributions here then uh, show that we do not uh, observe any signal in the uh, region where we look for it. And that's why we can uh, give upper limits for this decay. And uh, we arrive to a value of uh, 7 times 10 to the minus 9 for the k plus mu minus e plus charge combination and 6.4 times 10 to the minus nine for the K plus mu plus E minus. And uh, both of these are the world's best limits so far. Um, the next uh, decay which I want to present is the V0 or V0 sub S to tau muon pair. There the model expectations go up to the order of 10 to the minus five. Um, the best, best experimental limit on the B0 decay comes from the Baba experiment. It's uh, 2.2 times 10 to the minus 5. While for the B0 sub S, there is no experimental limit so far. Um, the analysis strategy is a bit different. Again, we use three fem 2 bonds from uh, run one. Um, again, we trigger on a high PT muon. But uh, in this case, we have to reconstruct the tau from its decay product. For this, we use the three pion uh, neutrino decay of the tau uh, as a, and then again we normalize to a well-known normalization channel which has a similar topology as our signal decay. Um, we can reconstruct the tau momentum with a two-fold ambiguity, uh, ambiguity from the known flight direction and under the assumption that we have a tau mass and that we have a massless neutrinos. And uh, one can also use the fact that the tau decays mainly via the A1 and rho resonances, and this helps also to reduce the background from other particles. Um, we can also use same sign tau mu pairs as a model for the combinatorial background, which is then used for the training of the BDTs. An important background are also partially reconstructed BDKs. This can be distinguished from the signal with the help of decay time, isolation variables, and uh, can be suppressed with mass vetoes. Um, here, we, I illustrate that the two the, uh, B0 and B0S, the peaks overlap. And that's why we perform our search for the hypothesis that we have the one or the other. Um, the search is performed in bins of a final BDT. Here, I, for illustration, I show the bin with the highest signal probability. Again, we don't see a signal. Um, that's why we can uh, give confidence limits. Um, so for the B0 sub S, we have 3.5 times 10 to the minus 5 at 90%. And for the B0 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5, which is the world's best limit. And the other one is the first limit so far. Um, then the final decay, which I want to demonstrate is the B plus to K plus mu tau. Again, uh, model expectations reach up to 10 to the minus 5. Best experimental limit, uh, 2.8 times 10 to the minus 5. Uh, here, the analysis strategy is a bit different. We use both run 1 and run 2 data. So this is 9 inverse fem 2 bonds. And we actually consider B plus from the decay of the B star uh, sub S2. Um, uh, the, this means we require a pair of a k on at a muon from a secondary vertex plus an additional um, tr charge track, and then we can calculate the missing mass squared of this track, and we expect the peak at the tau mass for the signal. Uh, this is illustrated here. So uh, for a signal, we expect a clear peak. As a, again, we uh, use a normalization channel, which is B plus to J psi K plus. Um, we can also extract the fraction of uh, which of the bees come from a B, from this B star S2 uh, decay and uh, which are independent of this. Um, and then uh, we have uh, several backgrounds which can be suppressed again with the help of, uh, of boosted decision trees. And the remaining backgrounds, we don't uh, we expect a smooth distribution in this uh, in this uh, missing mass squared. Uh, distribution. And uh, also in this case, we don't observe any signal. Uh, and we can ex extract limits from this. 
And our limits are 3.9 times 10 to the minus 5, which is comparable to the world's best limit. Um, in conclusion, we can say that uh, an observation of lepton flavor violation would be an unambiguous sign of beyond standard model physics. So lowering the experimental limits is very crucial also to constrain phase space of theoretical models. And LHCB has a very rich uh, search program for this lepton flavor violations of which I presented you a few uh, examples. And uh, often we are able to produce the world's best upper limits or we are close to. Um, a little bit of outlook. So of course, in the future, we want to uh, collect more data. This is about 23 inverse femtal ones in run three. Um, we will use a purely software trigger in, in this run, which will help us to cope with the higher luminosities. And uh, another as aspect which I would like to mention is that we are also able to measure lepton flavor violations and baryons, which can give complementary information. So for example, we have different dynamics due to the half integer spin of the baryons. And these are abundantly produced. And as one example, the lambda B to lambda E mu uh, decay is currently being analyzed by LHCB. So thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. So let's see if there are any comments or questions from the audience. I do not see any, but okay, I have one. Uh, I've seen that uh, you have, uh, among other things, you have presented uh, the upper limits on the branching ratio of the B0 to mu tau and the B plus to K mu tau. But uh, I, I was uh, wondering uh, regarding the, let's say, theoretical interpretation, which one would be uh, more uh, sensitive between the two, uh, for, for instance, uh, on uh, laptop work or uh, new particle? Or uh, if, uh, I mean, there are uh, different models which uh, are, uh, let's say, shared, like there is one model in particular for which the B0 uh, mu tau is uh, more sensitive rather than B plus. Uh, if you, could, if you could comment a bit on this. Uh, now, I, I'm not really an uh, expert on the models, and I think they give uh, vastly different uh, limits depending on the, on the flavor of your uh, models. But uh, I think uh, one thing uh, one can say that uh, really for this uh, decay involving a muon and electron, we go very deep. We go in the order of 10 to the minus 9. Um, while uh, model expectations, indeed, they reach up to 10 to the minus 8. So I think there we are indeed doing quite some uh, restriction of the, of the phase space of these models. But, um, okay, yes. Okay, no, I, my question was more about the mu tau, but uh, in any case, uh, it's clear that uh, the, I mean, the searches are very nice and interesting. Uh, uh, I mean, all, all the ones that uh, you have presented. Okay, so if there are no more uh, comments or questions uh, on these, uh, thanks again, Stefan. And Thank you. Uh, we move on to Olsir, uh, who will present uh, a review of the lepton flavor violation at LAC. Okay, C can you hear me? Yes. Okay, very good. So let me share the screen. Okay, so can you see it? Yes. Okay, very good. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, my name is Osir and I'm very happy to tell you a bit today about uh, flavor physics that can be done at high PT. And in particular, uh, I'll continue the discussion on lepton flavor violation. And I'll, so I'll present these results from this recent publication of ours. And uh, I'll start with a brief introduction uh, which is our, or, or our, our motivation here. So basically, when you do flavor physics, the ultimate question that we would like to answer is the flavor problem. And the, the flavor problem is basically the fact that uh, in the standard model, uh, we don't have a flavor symmetry uh, that would be equivalent to the, to, to the gauge symmetry, the gauge sector. So that flavor is pretty much unconstrained. And the consequence of that is, as you know, is that we have many parameters in flavor. So the Fermi's mass and, and mixing, which can be described by means of the Yukawa interactions. But then um, 
we have to extract this information from data. And this is a problem not only because uh, uh, flavor becomes then highly non-minimal, but most importantly, by the fact that uh, when you look at these values for the fermion masses or the mixing parameters, we see clear patterns that, that suggest something beyond the standard model. So, uh, so our goal then is to look for any signals of this beyond standard model flavor dynamics by, by using low energy observables. And the key observables are the ones where flavor is violated. And lepton flavor violation, as we just heard, uh, are particularly interesting. They are interesting because they're forbidden in the standard model by an accidental symmetry. Uh, we know that the symmetry should be broken because neutrinos are massive and oscillate. But even if you plug in the neutrino masses, uh, assuming that there is no other dynamics, we see that uh, all these processes are completely unobserved. So that's why we say that they are very clean and that's why it's important to look for them experimentally. And from the experimental prospects, uh, we also have a very promising scenario for the coming years as well. So this decays, they can, uh, can be in purely leptonic observables, such as the tau and muon decays. And here that there are many experiments that are pushing in this direction. And we also have the hadronic probes with the case of kaons, D and B mesons, uh, which are quite interesting. And, and these are the ones I'll be talking about today. So the goal of my talk is to tell you what can we learn by using proton collisions? Uh, how can we get some indirect information on these decay modes? And uh, a further motivation for that, uh, that, uh, that, that I'll mention very briefly, are of course these B physics anomalies. Uh, because here uh, it suggests that there is new physics around the corner with lepton flavor uh, dependent couplings. And nowadays we know that the only particles that can actually explain these discrepancies are the so-called leptoquarks. And they must couple to muons and taus. So here, if you just swap the flavor in one of these legs, you see that's almost unavoidable to have lepton flavor violation to some extent. So uh, this is a common prediction of uh, these viable models. And that's why it's so important to, to push in this direction like we're doing now with LHCB and Bell2. OK, uh, but today I'll be talking about LHC. And the, the main idea behind this talk is the following. When you collide protons, that's also a flavor physics process. So actually, the cross-section for proton-proton uh, into dileptons that can be factorized into a partonic cross-section where we can have five different quark flavors. And then we have these luminosity functions, which uh, depend on the quark PDFs and that weight the, the different contributions uh, to the total cross-section. And as you see here in these plots, uh, these uh, luminosity functions are bigger for the first and second and third generation, first and second generation, and then, then they are smaller for, for the big quark, for example. And uh, the approach we use uh, is effective field theories because um, this is the most economical one that we can have. And the only assumption is that new physics is sufficiently heavy. And then uh, this effective operator here with two quarks and two leptons can be constrained either by flavor, by some specific meson decays, or by looking at proton proton collision by this partonic interaction here. And then in the following, I'll show how these two results can be very much complementary to each other. So, um, this kind of analysis at high PT is possible um, because of a very simple argument, which is that when you have a dimension six operator, uh, like the ones I, I mentioned before, if you compute this cross section, uh, assuming that the EFT is valid, you get something that grows with the square of the energy. Okay, so, and that's of course different from all the standard model backgrounds uh, since the standard models were normalizable. So what we do is to take data from proton proton going to the different uh, lepton combinations and then look really at the high energy beams because here we know that signal over background will be the, the largest possible. And, um, when you look into this, there are many operators that can contribute to these partonic processes. They are listed here in this table. So within the standard model EFT and also the, 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 the broken phase. And basically you have vector operators, scalar operators and tensor operators with the different chiralities. So uh, you can try to compute this partonic cross-section and then uh, you get this formula here. So 
we have this energy enhancement that I mentioned before for all these operators. And uh, the funny thing is that they do not interfere with each other at high energy. And that's a useful input that I'll use in the following. So the only thing we're left are these multiplicative factors here that tell you um, how the limits uh, on each of these operators is, is scale when you compare them. So just a proportional factor. This was for total cross-section, but then uh, we, we have, of course, checked that when you impose the selection cuts from this experimental analysis, the total cross-section changes, but uh, this proportion between the different contributions remain more or less the same. Okay, so now let me show some results. So I'll consider the tau to mu lepton flavor violation, and I'll pick one example of operator, which is this V minus A, V minus A one. So factor with left-handed fermions. And here I have a Wilson coefficient with two quark indices and two lepton indices, which are mu tau. And then uh, here you see the LAT limits that we get with current in blue and red future data for each quark transition. And uh, the colored bands here are the limits that we get from flavor physics observables. So what are these limits um, from flavor? So here for the light quarks, they come from tau decays, tau to mu and some meson. So in the case of the B2S and B2D transition, these are the, the decays we just heard about in the previous talk. So leptonic and semi-leptonic B decays. And there is also the quark flavor conserving transition. And here uh, we have to use quarkonium decay. So J psi and oops. And finally, there is the CU coupling. And here, actually, there is no meson decay just because um, um, it's not kinematically allowed. So the D and tau mass are, are too close to, to allow you to have a decay. And uh, what is interesting is that the limits are very complementary. So in many cases, like down here and up here, flavor does much better than LHC. But there are situations where LHC limits can be much more constraining than flavor. So these blue bands here, actually, they extend beyond the picture, so you don't see them. So that's, they're very complementary. And this remains true when you look at uh, all the lepton transitions, emu, etau, and mutau, as you see here in this plot. So the ones where LHC can give you some useful information are the flavor consumption transitions and also the charm quarks sometimes because uh, we, we don't have a meson decay, okay? Um, so now uh, just to give you a feeling of these results, let, uh, let, let me make a small exercise here. So again, let's assume this operator and then let's take the limit that we get from high energies with proton-proton collision and let's uh, just take this coefficient and comp com compare with, compute a, a branching fracture that you can try to measure experimentally. So, so for each of these decays here, we, we took the LHC limit and we, we saw what is the sensitivity that we're getting with the LHC, assuming, uh, keeping this assumption. And these are the results that we compare here with um, the experimental limits today and uh, the future prospects that we were able to find. And the, the way to read this is, for example, if Bell 2 wants to improve the flavor violation test in Upsilon decays, so they have to push these limits 4 to 10 to minus 6 to be 10 to minus 7 to be competitive with what we have now, and then 10 to minus 8 in the future. And the color uh, are actually the, the limits that are the most constraining ones. So you see the things are very complementary, and it's very important to have both pieces of information when you want to constrain your physics. And um, of course, here there is an assumption, which is that I, I only have this operator which is left-handed. Then you might ask what happens if uh, the other operators are present, such as the scalar and tensor ones. From the point of view of LHC, uh, it doesn't change much because um, as I said, I mean, the cross-section changes by a factor of one uh, to three-fourths or four. So uh, there is a small numerical factors that can be taken into account and we give a full prescription in our paper. But for flavor, things change a lot. So the choice of vector operators here was intentional because here uh, the comparison was easier. And we knew that uh, in this case, LHCB had a better chance to give meaningful results. But for the scalar operators, the situation is a bit different. First, because when you run these operators from the TV scale down to the few GV, where you try to measure this decays, you see that for the scalar operators, we have an enhancement. And also, scalar and tensor operators can mix by electric running. 
Okay, so that's one factor. And the second one is chiral enhancement, because when you look at pseudoscalar meson decays, with a vector operator, they're going to be suppressed by the lepto mass. But as soon as you turn on the scalar operators, there is a chiral enhancement of order MD over MU, which is huge, and that can improve the signal. So um, just to give a, uh, an example, if you look again, this D0 to mu E decay for the vector operator we found that high PT was a bit uh, more constraining than flavor, but for the scalar one flavor is much better. So factor of 10 more. So uh, this tells that uh, flavor and LHC are complementary, not only about the transitions that you can probe, but also the, the chiral structure of these operators. And that's all uh, I wanted to say. And so um, the brief summary is that uh, there is a lot of possibilities to do flavor physics at the high PT. So today I, I spoke about this PP to leptons with different flavors, but there are other publications that studied dileptons with same flavor or the monolepton signatures, and they were motivated by other problems such as the B anomalies or charm physics. And um, so the, these are all meaningful constraints that uh, should be combined together and also combined with what we have for flavor when we try to look for new physics uh, in order to, to be the most sensitive to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So any comments or questions from the audience? I do not see any. Okay, so maybe I can ask you uh, something. So uh, I think, uh, okay, everybody given the B anomalies, let's say uh, is focusing mostly on the mu tau because of course uh, it should, uh, I mean, if there is any uh, lepto quark or similar, it should couple, uh, uh, let's say more likely uh, with the heavier uh, mm -hmm. leptons. But I was wondering how uh, suppressed uh, it would be if he said uh, he would couple uh, with, uh, for instance, I mean, looking uh, at the same uh, particle with the muon uh, electrons instead of muon tau. Uh, is, mm -hmm. is it that uh, strongly suppressed? Uh, how much? Uh... So, uh, yes, the, the point here is that to explain the B anomalies, we need a large coupling to the tau and a slightly smaller coupling to the muons. So um, when you compute these rates, you get not on, only an upper limit on this uh, B to S mu tau, but also a lower limit. Now, when you think about the electron and muon transition, there we have also an upper limit that you can compute if you assume that you have a coupling to the electrons, but there is no lower limit because the couplings to electrons could be super suppressed because we have no hint of new physics there. So, so that's, uh, I think it's important, of course, to push these limits because they're always useful to have a feeling of uh, if the anomalies are confirmed, uh, what is the pattern of flavor that we should have in these leptoquark couplings. But, uh, but um, it, it could be that super suppressed that we never observed. Okay, but let's say it would be a kind of a fine tuning, I guess. In any case, uh, yeah. Okay, well, not easy. not a fine tuning because I mean, um, so look, the Yukawas in the standard model they're very hierarchical and they're bigger to ah, the okay, third, okay. second, and first generation. So you could have something similar here. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, so uh, I would uh, propose to move on, uh, and uh, now there is uh, Beatriz Garcia Plana with the universal test with the semi-electronic BDKs at LHCB. Yes, hi. Hello. Hello, me deja compartir. Do you see the, the screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, you can start. So good afternoon to everyone. Today I will talk about lepton universality test using semi-leptonic behadron decays. This is the outline of my talk. First, I will make a small introduction about the concept of lepton flavor universality and how we can test it in semi-leptonic decays. Then we will move on to LHCB results. In particular, we will see the muonic R-D star, the hadronic R-D star, and the R-Jepsi. 
then we will see some future analysis and future strategies and we will end up with the global pictures and some conclusions. So within the standard model, the electroweak coupling between the gauge bosons and the leptons are independent of the lepton family, and this is called lepton flavor universality. LFU is one of the main ingredients of the standard model, and therefore any sign of violation would be a sign of new physics. Actually, it exists um, many models beyond the standard model that contain new interactions that involve the third generation of quarks and leptons, such as chart hits, leptoquarks, set prime, or W prime. There have been done many searches of this violation, and um, in particular, we studied two different kinds of transitions. Uh, within charged currents, so B2C electron neutrino, and in neutral currents, we study the B2S LL transition. In this talk, I will just cover the charged currents one, but if you want to learn more about neutral current, don't miss the talk of Carla on the 31st of July. So why semileptonic decays? Semileptonic decays offer us a good scenario to test electron free universality, and this is done by means of the coefficients RHC, which is defined as the branching fraction of a bihadron going to a C hadron tau nu with respect to the branching fraction of the same bihadron going to the C hadron mu nu where a uh, C hadron could be D or D star, D zero, D plus, DS, lambda C, Jepsi, and a B hadron could be a B zero, B plus, a lambda B, etc. Um, this is a three level decay mediated by a W boson. And therefore, if new physics coupled, coupled just to a third generation, this kind of transition are sensitive to new physics component at the three level. There are many advantages from the standard model. First, it's partial cancellation of hadronic four factors in the ratio. Then um, the high rate of charged current decays, for instance, the branching fraction of we going to the start of new is about 1.2% in the standard model. Then another aspect that I want to comment about these coefficients is the deviation from unity due to the different lepton masses between the tau and the muon. What happens at LHCB is that these kind of measurements are very challenging because we are dealing here with neutrinos and therefore with missing kinematic constraints. So in order to uh, obtain our beam momentum, we need to make some approximations and we will see in the next slides how do we do it. So basically we have two reconstruction, two decay channels for the tau the muonic mode in which the tau decays in a muon and two neutrinos, and the hadronic mode in which the tau um, decays in three pions, a pi zero and a neutrino. The first measurement so far this star in a hadron collider was done using the muonic decay of the tau. So the tau going to mu and two neutrinos, and here, the coefficient R D star is defined as the branching fraction of V0 going to D star plus tau nu with respect to the same decay, but uh, with a muon. Some features about this analysis is that since we have missing kinematic constraints, we have to make what is called the rest brain approximation. So here, the momentum of the final visible state, so the D star and the muon, is scaled by the mass of the B with respect to the mass of the final visible state. With this approximation, we obtain a resolution of 80% on the momentum of the B, which is good enough to preserve signal and normalization discrimination. We can see this on the right. So in green, we have the projections of the variables of the missing mass, the energy of the muon and Q square, which are the one with most discriminating power. So in green, we have the Monte Carlo truth, and in pink, we have um, the Monte Carlo reconstructed. So it means after we include the detector effects. So we, here we can see that we can um, differentiate between the signal component and the normalization one. For instance, for the missing mass, in the case of the normalization, it's a spectrum, it's speaking in zero. Um, the spectrum of the energy of the moon, it's harder and it ranges from zero in the Q-square variable. 
In order to obtain our coefficients RD star, we perform a three-dimensional fit to the variables that I just present, so the energy of the muon, the missing mass, and Q square. And here we have the projection of the three-dimensional fit. In red, we see the signal component, and in dark purple, we see the normalization one. So um, this was the result that was obtained for the R11, with its intention with the standard model prediction at the level of 2.1 sigma. Let's move on now to the RD star hadronic. Here, the tau decays in three pions, a pi zero and a neutrino, and therefore we have a overlapping signal decay mode. Actually, what is measured here is the coefficient that I call kappa, and in order to obtain it, we need um, to measure the signal yield, the normalization one, and correct them by the ratio of efficiencies. Again, we need to make some approximations in order to reconstruct the V and the tau momentum. An important feature about this analysis is that the signal and normalization channel share the same visible state, so these star and three pions. And therefore, most of the theoretical and experimental uncertainties are cancelled out in the ratio. Once we have the kappa coefficient, our star is obtained by multiplying it when by the external inputs, which are well known in, with a 4 and 2.2 precision. So in order to obtain RD star, we perform a three-dimensional fit. Um, we have here the projection of the tau decay time, Q square and BDT. In red, we have the signal component, and in orange, the main background. So um, this is the result that was obtained with his intention with the standard model prediction at the level of one sigma. Then we can generalize the analysis that we have done uh, for RD star in the VC sector, and we obtain the RG psi coefficient. The measurement that was done uh, was done using the tau decay, decaying in a muon and two neutrinos. And in order to obtain our coefficient RG psi, we perform a three-dimensional fit in the missing mass, the decay time, and set, which is a variable that depends on the energy of the muon and Q square. And the result that was obtained is in tension with the standard model at the level of two sigmas, depending on which um, theory you are, you are taking. So we may wonder now, which is the global picture? In the case of RD star, we have in the lab the different experimental measurements. So the one corresponding to Babar, to three from Bell, and two from LHCB, which is the green bar. And then we have the standard model prediction, which is the red one. So the RD star wall average is in tension with the standard model prediction at the level of 2.5 sigma. If now we take into account all the RD and RD star measurements, um, we have the average in the red ellipse, and if we compare it with the standard model prediction, we see that overall it's in tension at the level of 3.08 sigma level. Some words about the future. Here we have the projected uncertainty for Bell and LHCB for all our RHC coefficient. For instance, we can compare the two orange curves, which are which correspond to the Bell uh, RD and RD star prediction, and we can compare it with the one from LHCB that are the two green. So uh, it's expected that both experiments will be comparable in, in the future. Then we are expecting new results coming from updates or using the run two of all the analysis that I just present. And there are many analyses ongoing, so RD0, RD+, RDS, etc. And also combined measurements of RD and RD star for both the hadronic and the muonic mode. Then it's planned to perform some form factor measurements, and in particular, the VS going to VS star, it's already done. And then some angular analysis. And in the future, after the upgrade one, it's planned that LHCB will collect 50 inverse Fentorm. And we see here the projection of the integrated luminosity. 
So it means that we will have a five times more luminosity than what we have at the end of the urban two. Conclusions, we have seen that electron-free universality violation, it's a clean road to new physics. There are intriguing tensions with the standard model in the ratio of branching fractions in B2C electron neutrino decays. All the results that they present here were done using the run one data. And we have nine Fentovars in bed at the in inverse at the, re at the end of run two. So there is an exciting program ahead. About the systematic uncertainties, many are assumed to scale with the accumulated statistics and others will be improved with external measurements as the one coming from Bell 2 or Best 3. So stay tuned and thank you very much, very much for your attention. Okay, thanks a lot. So any comments or questions from the audience? Hello, hi. Yes, please. Uh, so uh, I want to know, are there any uh, updates on the experimental side uh, in the measurements of this uh, BS2, DS star, L nu, uh, means lepton flavor universally testing uh, those details? I don't hear you well, but I think that you uh, were asking for this coefficient, the RDS, yes. right? Okay, so it's ongoing already. So um, I don't know exactly when it will be finished, but next year probably thank you okay thanks a lot uh, if there are no other comments or questions i would uh, move on i don't see any other so thanks again thank you very much and uh, now we go to uh, joel swallow who will present the lepton flavor uh, number, uh, lepton flavor and number violation at the NE62 experiment. Hi, do you hear me and see the slides? Yes. Okay, great. Let me know if there's a, a problem. Okay, so uh, as Karim said, I'm going to be talking to you about NE62 searches for these lepton number and flavor violating decays. Uh, this is the quick overlay, over overview of the talk. So I'll tell you something about the NA62 experiment um, and particularly the new result on the search for K goes to PAM UE decays uh, and then some context uh, related to the other searches that we're doing. So the NA62 experiment is based at the CERN North area. We're at the end of an extraction line from the CERN SPS and you can see on the left that we sit roughly at the centre of the LHC uh, ring. Um, the primary goal of the experiment is the measurement of the ultra rare uh, K goes to Pine Nu Bar decay, but I won't go into any detail there because there's a very recent paper uh, on the archive from the 2017 data analysis, and there was a nice talk yesterday on our brand new result. Uh, instead, I'm focusing on the broader physics program at NA62. So, this was also covered nicely uh, in the last uh, couple of days with the rare K on decay, uh, K goes to Pine Nu Mu. Um, covered yesterday, and also exotic searches in particular for heavy neutral leptons, also the subject of a recent paper uh, and a talk. Uh, the run one data set was taken from 2016 to 2018, and in this talk I'm focusing on the data uh, from 2017 and 18. Okay. Um, as has already been covered quite well so far, and I, I won't labour the point, um, in the standard model, uh, we have this uh, conservation of lepton number and lepton flavor numbers, uh, which is somehow an emergent property, but uh, we've seen with the, the neutrino oscillations that these individual flavor numbers can be uh, violated. So it's worth checking to see if we can also violate them with uh, the charged leptons as well. So in particular, you could have uh, scenarios with uh, in K and decays where you have uh, mediation via Majorana neutrinos, as you see on the left-hand side, or mediated by leptoquarks, as shown on the right. In any case, the experimental signature here that we would look for is uh, a pion and two leptons uh, with the decay consistent with uh, closed kinematics. If we then go uh, to the next slide, you see just a picture on the left and the schematic on the right of the NA62 experiment. So we're using uh, an unseparated uh, secondary hadron beam that's produced uh, 
when uh, protons from the SPS hit a beryllium target. Uh, the experiment is uh, very long, as you can get a, an idea of on, on the picture and in the uh, schematic of the detector, and this is governed by the momentum of the uh, k -ohm, which is 75 GeV, and the Lorentz boost in the uh, lab frame. I won't go into too much detail on uh, the whole detector, but just to comment on how it's used in this analysis in particular, I told you that only 6% of the uh, secondary beam is k -ons, so we tag these with the Sherenkov detector, the K-tag, with a very good time resolution. Downstream, we're looking for a three-track event, and we reconstruct the tracks and measure their momentum with the straw spectrometer. And we can then reconstruct a vertex in the fiducial volume. So this is uh, indicated, it's a long vacuum tank region in which we're reconstructing this. Uh, for particle identification, we're using this ratio of E divided by P, where E is the energy deposited in the liquid krypton calorimeter, and P is the track momentum. And then also we can use the muon Vito 3 detector, which is at the very end of the, of the experimental apparatus behind the calorimeter and an iron wall, which is sensitive to veto or identify muons. There is a hermetic veto system at NE62 with uh, 12 large angle vetoes surrounding the vacuum tank, uh, small angle vetoes and a liquid krypton calorimeter. In this analysis, we're using the large angle vetoes to, to reject stray photons. The tracks must be in time and we're using charged hodoscopes to, to make these timing measurements. And in the end, we're building an invariant mass of the pi uh, candidate final state with the resolution of about 1.4 MeV. On slide seven, you see uh, the search uh, strategy. We're searching with 2017 and 2018 data uh, using a blind analysis strategy. There was actually two independent analyses and these were cross-checked uh, for, the, for the final result. At NA62, we have a two level trigger system with hardware level zero and software level one. And these triggers that we're using for this analysis, as shown in the table, are run concurrently with the pioneer bar trigger and downscaled by certain factors. Um, the inefficiencies of the tr these triggers importantly need to be accounted for in the analysis. We're using a minimum bias uh, multi-track trigger to collect the normalization channel, which is the K goes to three pi decay, which is the most common three track uh, K on decay with a branching ratio of about 5.6%. We're then using all three of these triggers uh, to collect the signal uh, candidates and the overall effective number of K on decays in the fiducial volume that you can use then for this analysis is about 10 to the 12. There's quite a number of backgrounds that have to be considered in the analysis and these enter by two, uh, two ways, either by misidentification or decays in flight. Just uh, to give a feeling for the misidentification, you see on the right the misidentification probability as a function of track charge times momentum for the processes of pion looking like electron or positron or vice versa. And this comes from uh, using this E over P ratio that I was discussing before, uh, where the electron is basically depositing all of its energy in the calorimeter. So you have an E over P ratio close to one. There is also the decays in flight that must be considered. Uh, importantly, the decays in flight of the charged pions, either to a mu neutrino or e neutrino. Uh, and the former is more important uh, in general because it's much higher branching ratio uh, is, is there. There is also the pi zero Dalitz decay, which is a particular nuisance uh, in one of the two channels I will talk about in a moment. And this means there's a dedicated cut uh, used for this, uh, to reject this. Here you see the invariant mass distributions uh, on the left for the pi minus mu plus e plus channel and on the right pi plus mu minus e plus. We have a blinded region which was kept blind for, for, for the optimization of the analysis which is centered on the count mass and the central signal region that you can see indicated uh, sits at the count mass. We then have these sideband control regions that are also indicated. Above this uh, blinded region, you can see we, we expect uh, a certain number of events as indicated, and the observations match quite well to, to these expectations. 
If we move forward now, we look at the sidebands, uh, we can see again that the agreement between the expectation and the observation is good. The acceptance for the two channels are also indicated on the slides. So for the pi minus channel, it's about 5% and it's about 6.2 for the mu minus channel. And the main difference here is this uh, additional cut to reject the Dalitz decays, which I already mentioned. You can see also the single event sensitivity, which is calculated here at the level of about 10 to the minus 11, uh, calculated using the equation at the bottom of the slide. Okay, so now we go ahead to the result. And as we saw, the expectation in both channels is about one event. And for the pi minus channel, we observe zero events in the signal region. So we set an upper limit at less than 4.2 times 10 to the minus 11 and 90% confidence level. And similarly in the mu minus channel, we actually see two events. And in the same way, we set an upper limit at less than 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 11, 90% uh, confidence level. On the next slide, uh, all I'm doing is summarizing the, uh, the results. So we see the acceptance of, for the signal, uh, the single event sensitivity, and the expected and observed number of events. Takeaway message here is to compare these, these new limits that we've uh, placed with the old previous uh, best limits and we see we've improved by uh, roughly a factor of 10. This uh, goes into the context also of the uh, recent studies that we've uh, published last year on the pi minus and two same sign, same flavor leptons. So pi EE or pi mu mu. And again, using quite a similar analysis strategy, uh, we observe uh, these uh, upper limits on the branching ratios of these processes. This brings me to the conclusions uh, slide. So alongside these nice headline Panu Nubar uh, studies at NA62, we have this broad physics program with the world leading sensitivities to these rare and forbidden chaos decays. And I invite you to see the other nice talks at this conference. In the table, I summarize the, the picture for the lepton number and flavor violating searches at NA62. So I've just shown you the top two uh, where we've improved the previous limits using just 2017 data, and this was published last year. And now in this talk, we're showing the improvement in the pi mu e searches, uh, which improved by a factor of 12 and uh, 8 for the two channels using both 17 and 18 data. Uh, we're going to resume data taking in 2021, and already we have our eye on some other channels, uh, as you can see in the table. So stay tuned for future updates on this. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Joel. So any comments or questions uh, from the audience? I don't see any. Okay, so uh, maybe you can uh, just tell us uh, more or less uh, do you have an idea on uh, how uh, big could be the improvement uh, on these limits uh, uh, adding, let's say, the, 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 the next data taking uh, data? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, when we resume data taking, the intensity will be a little higher. And uh, so there's definitely potential to improve in terms of uh, taking data. And we're not background limited in these analyses. Analyses. So this is uh, this is the good news. Um, one thing that we have to be uh, wary of is that because we're going to this higher intensity, the trigger strategy might have to change a little bit. So this might mean that relatively we're taking less data for these kind of analyses in the future. But uh, overall, you may, it could be possible to improve by a factor of order five uh, potentially with the next data set. Okay, that, that would be very good, yes. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot, Joel. I don't see any other uh, comments or questions, so I would propose to move on. And of course, uh, if anybody, I remind anybody that uh, there is a Mattermost channel, so if you want to have uh, uh, more discussion about uh, some particular topic, uh, please uh, feel free to, to have a discussion there. <laughs> Uh, so now we go on with uh, uh, the next talk, uh, which is uh, by Amarizzoni on the lepton flavor universality violation and their repercussion. Uh, 
Hello? Yeah. So just give me a second. Uh, I guess I'm going. Oh, yes. So this is the video. Okay, very good. Um, how can I get the full screen here? All right, so can you hear me? Yes, you can start. Right. So I'm not sure why I cannot use the full screen, but I, I think uh, I, I'll go ahead with this. So yeah, I will be talking about the flavor anomalies and in particular because of the shortage of time in the co context of our parity violation, uh, Susie and uh, the three deer I'll explain in a minute. So anyway, this is a uh, paper with a, a work, on, work on, on Altman's half friend Dave in, uh, for the last of uh, three, four years. Second in, in a sequel district took place a couple of years to uh, get all the pieces together. All right. Hmm. Okay, so I'm sorry, I don't know why the next, okay. So here's the outline and I'm gonna remind you the anomalies. And then the point is this RPV Susie has a uh, lots of uh, in reasons for going after that. And uh, we are putting the three there for the, the because of uh, starting from about 2017, we have made the, uh, you know, for good reasons that the third generation super partners are the lightest. And then I'll explain some three special cases for which we study this scenario. So of course you all know about the anomaly, the chart current anomaly and the neutral current anomaly and um, there are all three experiments, B experience experiments showing deviations in the, in the simplest three level chart current case on the left and uh, amounting to at the moment about three sigma. And on the right is the LACB, RK, RK star, this is about three and a half sigma. And, and the fact, uh, of course, we always need to worry is there are so many experiments from the charge current case, there are altogether 11 of them and all 11 central values are higher than theory. And uh, again, I don't have time to spell it all. And this needs to be kept in mind. So it, it seems as if you, have, you know there is no way out and uh, we have seen the breakdown of the standard model. But uh, this is, uh, in my opinion, not, not we cannot uh, assume that that easily because, uh, you know, so the, this is category of the experiment, three different exper major beef, uh, B experiments are involved, three with B to D, seven with B to D star, one with B C to Psi, nine with tau going to uh, leptonically and two with tau going hadronically. Each and every 11 of them show central value higher than uh, standard model. So it seems as if the universality is breaking down, but I think there are cautionary things that uh, we have seen in the past in our history. And this is a 10, 12 years history and long ago in the Michelle parameter, which is standard model V minus A predicts 0 0.75. The experiments for 10, 12 years kept on seeing it below. And then uh, somehow magically it starts to uh, come in agreement. So things like this can happen. There are, there are sometimes the systematics are there and I'll uh, elaborate later on more. And so anyway, then I also bring in here G minus two and G minus two Booking an experiment is deviating from theory by a three and a half sigma. On this slide, only the phenomenology theory dispersion relation is shown. Um, the lattice has made a lot of progress and, and it's about a factor of two larger errors at this point and then the dispersion theory, but it will catch up pretty soon in the next year or two. And I'm also showing here, uh, not showing here at the moment, uh, the next slide for the, the balloon experiment called Anita because the systematic errors are not in, under control. I don't like to show that. So in the, in the bottom are the pool for all of the three experiments that I talked about, RK, RK, RD, RD star, RK, RK star, G minus mu. And whether um, there is some issues in our mind is that theoretic, theoretician, we take the liberty, poetic license of leaving our Baba uh, because it, Baba has a lot of uh, deviation there. And if you leave out those, those and, uh, you can see that when you take all of these three different types of experiments, uh, the pull uh, reduces to 4.6 sigma, but otherwise it's over five sigma. So it would appear as if this is compelling, but as I said, in each case, there were some features. But in any case, 
and this is a Anita balloon experiment, two gigantic energy, um, uh, 10 to the 9 electron volts neutrinos, and both of these events, people have argued, uh, cannot be understood from the standard model. So the, I, I don't have the time to explain all this. But systematic errors worries, are worrisome. So we take Anita along with the others that I mentioned, and we are looking for a SUSY solution, but in particular RPV. The reason for that is the following. So starting in the 2017 paper, what we started, what we said was the, the reaction B to D star tau or leptonic decays uh, is the B going to uh, tau. This is the third generation, and it we and perhaps it is all related to uh, we, the problem that we have uh, Higgs naturalness, Higgs uh, stability under radiative corrections, which is shown in the picture below. And so we want to, um, we just proposed that the, let's consider the third family of uh, super partners, partners to be the lightest. If that happens, the proton decays, it becomes irrelevant and uh, largely irrelevant. And so you go from uh, the minimum uh, MSSM to you can go to R pair evaluation. R pair evaluation is, becomes, um, you know, a very good um, candidate. In fact, remember that. Uh, our peri conservation just put in by hand because you want to protect the proton. But in this case, when the sup those super partners, first and second generation are super, super heavy, only the third generation is lightest, uh, that proton decays are not really relevant. So we go, uh, we, RPV is uh, very natural. And in RPV, then lepton universality violation becomes natural. And uh, it left a quark to become natural. And G minus two and epsilon prime, thing like this, you can accommodate. And uh, the, at the LAC, uh, looking for signatures for our, our peri violating uh, theory is harder. So the, all of those reasons may make us wonder if this is, a, um, this is the way things are going. So, so anyway, so this is uh, again saying that the third generation is taken to be the lightest, super partners are taken to be the lightest. And a, a key point here is that uh, the, one of the best uh, interesting things about you, uh, you know, Su Suzy is that it gives you um, gauge coupling unification. And you can see here, we show that explicitly, whether you're one generation or three generation, the gauge coupling unification stays. It's just that the scale stays, it's just that coupling shifts a little bit. All right, so it has that nice feature too. So um, more on that, why it is, so uh, there are these effective Lagrangians that come in for a quark uh, lepton interaction and lepton lepton interaction and all that. And we use those, and there are a bunch of diagrams of this charge current, and this is a neutral current. For the neutral case, both tree level and loop level have to be kept because you want to get the sign correct for RK and RK star. The signs are correlated, and having both tree and boxes are important. So then this is for muon and also for G minus. Uh, Anita, I show you all the pictures and all a lot of the calculations are available in literature. We had to put them all together in the context of scenarios that we are studying. So then to simplify things, we take uh, three specific scenarios, benchmarks. One is very CKM-like. <clears throat> in CKM, you know that first, if you, when you go to from first generation to second, you have to pay our prize. And when you go from first to third, you have to pay even a higher price. So we, we went to that. And in, in so far as the third generation super partners being lightest, uh, the, there was a very nice paper, I'll give the reference later, which formally put this in the context of a U2 cross U2 flavor symmetry. And this also has, in each of these two cases, there are three independent couplings. And the third benchmark scenario, no such symmetry is imposed. And again, there, in each of the three, three cases, there are six three parameters and three independent couplings are being used. So this is the case one that I mentioned, and you look for uh, a common solution to all the anomalies, and a common solution cannot be found, in particular G minus two cannot be accommodated, and uh, the others perhaps could be. And then uh, we look for case two, this is the reference for the very nice uh, idea of making a super third generation super partner lighter, where the others are very heavy. And in this case, you do find a solution in green there, which overlaps. And uh, um, there are some issues with perturbativity in the horizontal scale up there, but you don't need to go there. It's just an indication. All right, then the third one, 
uh, is when there is no symmetry, again, you are able to accommodate all of them and there is an overlap. And this is pretty interesting that, uh, you know, uh, that you are able to accommodate the, the things if the anomalies stay with you. Of course, if you can, you also have the capacity of taking whichever one is, it does not for, stand for the scrutiny, taking it out and seeing what happens. So it gives us a parameter space. The key point here is that, that the bottom mass uh, has to be around uh, you know, around 2 TV or, or heavier. And then, you know, you have to look at our papers for other uh, masses and so forth. I, I don't have the time to do that. So very interesting things happen in this kind of scenario for tau uh, flavor violation decays, in particular tau to mu gamma is quite enhanced. And B decays, the most interesting B decay is tau tau. And it has a rather large spread ratio, whether you go inclusive or exclusive, uh, that's pointed out. And it is, it, experimentalists ought to uh, go after them. This, uh, this would be a very important key. So what we are trying to do here is ask for repercussions of uh, under this theory of the anomalies, and that's what we are doing. And, in the, and that's the first table. And the bottom below shows what you do, what happens. You're making no theoretical assumption. This is crossing symmetry. You see uh, RK, RK star, which means um, B quark goes to S quark plus dielectron. And that automatically implies the reaction, the best reaction below. Um, S quark plus gluon goes to B, L, L. And this should be anomalous. If the LACB result is correct, then in the Atlas and CMS and Collider experiments, they should be seeing an enhanced rate for uh, this um, um, B plus dielectrons. So anyway, so I'm going to summarize now. The hints of the lepton universality violation are extremely interesting and intriguing and very important. And there is nothing that we know now that says that these hints cannot be true. While these are rather serious, they don't appear to be compelling uh, to me. And in each case, there are issues. Uh, for example, the RK, RK star is just one experiment, and G minus two is only one experiment, and we have to wait for uh, formula. And one of the issues in all of these is that systematic errors are, are take, you know, taken to be in quadrature. And I, I think in all three experiments, this is, uh, there is no rigorous theorem that you have to, for, to justify this. Uh, in fact, even in my own experience, I have seen uh, three or four um, cases in which, uh, you know, several, four different effects all line up in one direction to cause an effect. Uh, fortunately, the progress will be made both experimental and theoretical uh, in the next couple of years, so that's good. And then, as I said, um, the, the third generations, uh, assuming, assuming the third generation super partner that the uh, lightest is a very, you know, RPV becomes a very interesting candidate. And it also gives us stability of Higgs under radiative corrections. We showed three benchmark cases, each has nine parameters and a bunch of masses. And we are, um, showed some interesting signature uh, predictions for the intensity frontier for B and tau case, the lepton flavor violation. And they are complementary tests in our LEC experiments. And this, these are being followed. I showed one and more will come uh, in due course. I'm sorry about the phone. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So any comments or questions from uh, the audience? I do not see any. OK, so I, I just uh, wondered, because OK, I missed uh, uh, the how, let's say, uh, these would explain the G minus two uh, muon anomaly in the sense that what is uh, exactly going in the loop? Uh, is there a, a muon to tau contribution or there is a, a supersymmetric particle? Yeah, yeah so, so the muon goes to, to third generation B, for example, you know, and yes, okay, okay. RPV, there are things like that will happen, you know. But there are many graphs, and one of them, them will be. Um, lepton changing to, uh, to, to quarks and things like that. Okay, okay. So, can I ask a question? Sure. Sony, can you also calculate the case of k not only B, with the same model, the same parameters? 
Yeah, this is a very good question. I'm glad you asked. Yes, you can do that. And, and this is, I was mentioning in some, in one case, uh, in fact, you can, you can ask what happens to um, K to two pi and epsilon prime and all that. Uh, of course, uh, the setting here is suggest uh, the, the effects will be smaller, but you know, there is wealth of information and rather than making a theoretical assumption, one can use that uh, to, to put better constraints. Unfortunately, it takes time and uh, our hands are full and uh, you know, the, this already took uh, three years. So <laughs> someday, uh, it, it's, it's a very good question. We are trying to follow it up. Yeah, I agree it would be very nice, especially since there are also some uh, I mean, count experiments running uh, also in the future. So it would be very interesting to have uh, also that uh, predictions. Okay, uh, so maybe we can go on. If you have other comments or questions, of course, uh, as always, please uh, use the Mattermost uh, channel. So now the next talk uh, uh, is by Alexei Sividanov on the Tau Mu Lepton Flavor Universality in Babara. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, could the previous speaker unshare, uh, yes, screen? Do you see slides? Yes. Okay. Today I will talk about uh, tau mu lepton flavor of universality in epsilon 3s decays, uh, which uh, was conducted at the Bobar experiment. So uh, what you, see, you can see here that uh, E plus E minus collision produces uh, in, uh, uh, off-shell photon, and then uh, it produces a BB bar loop and then this BB bar loop again uh, goes to a shell loop. And uh, finally, we have uh, uh, final state uh, leptons. And the width of this resonance uh, was known since uh, standard model exception, which is shown here. And uh, so it's very clean and uh, theoretically uh, uh, very well calculated. And so any deviation from this uh, and uh, ratio of those uh, uh, of those uh, widths into different species of uh, leptons uh, are very well known and free of hadronic uncertainties. So, and any deviation to this uh, uh, ratio from the standard model uh, prediction can uh, give hint about new physics contribution. For example, in this work, you can see uh, uh, that we have light CP watt Higgs boson and uh, in this model uh, with large tangent beta and uh, this A0 boson exclusively decays into tau tau. And thus uh, in, in presence of new physics, uh, this ratio R tau mu will be enhanced. And also in this work, uh, uh, a new physics contribution to B to C tau nu, which explains tangent uh, in R D star ratio also necessary modifies r tau mu, tau mu or tau e observable. So uh, why uh, uh, we are uh, uh, measuring r tau mu, not e, r tau e. Here you can see a uh, cross section of e uh, plus e minus to mu mu. So you can see that uh, uh, at the peak, it is about 30 times larger than uh, uh, continuum production. However, we have uh, E plus E minus collider and we have beam energy spread. So, and with beam energy spread, we have this uh, picture here. So it's only 15% uh, larger than continuum production. And, uh, Similar uh, continuum cross section for E plus E minus to E plus E minus is more than 500 times larger. So in this case, only dimion production is possible to extract or dimion uh, uh, decays of epsilon stress is possible to extract. So uh, 
data for this analysis uh, uh, were collected at the Babar experiment, and the Babar experiment uh, operated uh, at these uh, dates at uh, TEP2 uh, collider at SLAC. And uh, we use uh, data from RAN7, about uh, uh, 28 inverse femtobarn on resonance and 2.6 inverse uh, femtobarn of resonance. So, and blind analysis uh, was uh, uh, involved. So only 2.41 uh, inverse femtobarn were used to tune analysis uh, selections and, uh, and cuts. So, and since uh, you see this uh, uh, off resonance uh, statistic is slow, we uh, employed also epsilon 4s uh, uh, decays as continuum production for our uh, epsilon 3s uh, measurement. And it has this uh, statistic is much larger. So, we do not have uh, problems with uh, statistical uncertainty of a background uh, prediction or a description. So here you can see signal selections for uh, new plus mu minus and for tau tau. So uh, they are uh, for uh, new plus mu minus they are usual selection to select high momentum collinear uh, particles and uh, uh, to select muons uh, we have uh, uh, cuts that uh, energy deposition in the calorimeter should be uh, compatible with the muon hypothesis and at least one particle having IFR response. And with this, we have 99.9% .9 purity. For tau tau selection, it is more tricky because uh, uh, it uh, doesn't have uh, such uh, uh, obvious kinematics in the uh, uh, reconstructed kinematics in calorimeter. So, uh, 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 main feature of this analysis is that we require that one one particle have to be identified as an electron and other shouldn't pass uh, 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 or must not pass such uh, uh, electron identification procedure. So it's like electron and not electron. So it suppresses a lot of uh, backgrounds this condition. And uh, with this, uh, we have 99% uh, purity. And all selections are designed to be beam energy insensitive since we are trying to uh, 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 employ uh, also epsilon 4s, which is about 300 MeV uh, higher energy. So we performed uh, Monte Carlo selection efficiency correction, which is shown here. Uh, so we, we did this on using only uh, off peak. Uh, 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 data in, in off peak epsilon 3s and off peak epsilon 4s data. And you can see that uh, this uh, very nice agreement between two, uh, uh, two data sets, and uh, we can apply such correction. So, and it's conclusion that uh, this ratio of tau mu candidates does not depend on energy in data and Monte Carlo. So we can safely apply this correction to our own peak uh, 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 analysis. So, and how to uh, uh, separate our continuum production and resonance production of muons. So we can see on this picture that uh, uh, here you can see simulation of uh, uh, epsilon 3s to uh, mu mu, and you can see that radiative tail due to initial state radiation is highly suppressed in this decays. Whereas for continuum production, you see that uh, this radiative tail is much more prominent. And since Babar detector has uh, had excellent momentum resolution, we uh, can exploit this uh, difference in the uh, radiative tail. So, and uh, so you can see uh, in numbers, you can only 7% are below three sigma resolution. And whereas for uh, continuum production, about 23% of uh, events have uh, 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 invariant mass less than three sigma resolution. 
Another background uh, is uh, so-called cascade decays when uh, epsilon uh, 3s decays, uh, we have cha uh, decay chain where uh, finally we have epsilon 1s or epsilon 2s, which uh, consequently decays into a lepton pair. So in this case, you can see that uh, uh, such decays are visible only in uh, uh, Damion uh, mass distribution. So we can uh, fix amount of, of such events and assuming lepton flame or universality for epsilon 1s and epsilon 2s decays, we can somehow subtract them from uh, our tau tau sample. So another uh, uh, background is ISR produced epsilon uh, NS. Uh, so we use uh, epsilon 4S data with, uh, uh, so, and this template contains also ISR produced epsilons. So which are shown here. This is uh, our uh, simulation. Uh, we used Fakara 10 to estimate this radiative uh, function and uh, and subtract such a background from our uh, continuum template histogram. Also, since we uh, use uh, uh, Ypsilon for S data, we have also BBVAR contribution, which in a case of new daimion uh, production is negligible, but but for, uh, for tau, we, we uh, calculated a uh, possible contribution and applied this correction of 0.4%, which is quite small. So now you can see uh, the fit result to the invariant mass distribution and to uh, measured energy in the detector for tau tau. And so, and minor contribution, as uh, you can see, this is cross hatch histogram, which corresponds to continuum production of uh, muons and uh, tau tau. On this picture, you can see already uh, continuum here subtracted, and you can clearly see uh, 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 resonance peak and also cascade decays shown here. And also you can see uh, how well we describe uh, uh, our energy deposition in the detector, measured energy deposition. And the result of the feed shown here that this ratio number of tau tau to number of uh, muons is shown here. And this uh, translates to these uh, numbers shown in red. And you can see that uh, uh, statistical error is uh, quite small less than uh, one percent. So here you can see a result of ISR produced epsilon and S. So on this uh, histogram, you can see that uh, continuum template is not correct for ISR. And you see this deep here and also this deep here. Whereas uh, this, uh, 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 this ISR correction, uh, you can see very nice uh, agreement between two uh, uh, plots. So systematic uncertainty estimation uh, is shown uh, on this slide. So mine is a particle identification uh, and uh, the rest are uh, uh, quite small. And in total we have 1.4% uh, total uncertainty. So here is a conclusion. So this analysis uh, uh, was done using Babar data collected at epsilon 4s and, uh, and epsilon 3s resonances. So we set up uh, our uh, selection uh, procedure, which uh, yields uh, finally background level at le uh, less than 0.1% for mu mu and less than 1% for tau tau sample. Uh, we also developed uh, a correction to uh, our continuum template uh, to exclude radiatively produced uh, epsilons. And the result is shown here, final result shown here in red. And this result can be compared with the standard model prediction, which is in blue here, and with uh, uh, the only measurement uh, reported by the CLIO collaboration.
and you can see that statistical uncertainty is 10 times better than the previous the only previous measurement preprint is available okay i am done okay thanks a lot so any comments or question I do not see any. Okay, so uh, I well I try to uh, follow as much as possible. Uh, so basically, the what, what is the dominant systematics uh, of uh, of your measurement, and uh, I mean, do you have uh, any plan on uh, how to improve it, or? Is, it's already. This is uh, uh, the main uh, so systematic it, it, it really comes from particle identification. identification. Yeah. So, and this uh, particle identification is very hard to improve since it's so uh, for, limit so of, of, of our knowledge how we will model interaction with the material of the detector. It's uh, okay. No, well, I, I, I I was wondering if, for instance, you can exploit the tau to mu decay, but this is probably uh, too complicated. Yeah, because already all, all such tricks already were exploited in this analysis, like uh, mm -hmm. all, all this babar uh, 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 accumulated knowledge already in this analysis, sure. let's say. I guess, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks a lot. So I don't see any other comments or questions. In case you have some, please uh, use the Mattermost channel. And uh, at this point, uh, thanks again. I would uh, move uh, to the next talk. So uh, Samadrita Mukheri. So, uh, and uh, the talk will be about uh, probing lepton flavor violation in minimal uh, supersymmetric super symmetric uh, st standard model. Yes, can you hear me? Hello, yes. Yes, yeah, so let me share my screen and... Here it is. Uh, I hope you can see it. Yes, yes, we can. So thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to the people from all over the world. And we will be discussing lepton flavor violating decays in MSSM with non holomorphic soft terms. And this work is done in collaboration with Professor Utpal Chattopadhyay and Professor Debutam Dash, and based on this work. Overviews are outlined in this slide. So let's see how it goes. Among the many models of BSM physics, supersymmetry is a well celebrated one for many years. And since it's uh, Solve the hierarchy problem supported by the measurements of gauge coupling strains consistent with precision electric data and Higgs mass, of course. Now, SUSY links different class of particles known as bosons and fermions. Now, it must be badly broken in nature and uh, in general. And SUSY breaking Lagrangian consists of this gauging of mass term, analytic and non analytic squared mass term, and cubic scalar couplings. Now, MSSM is usually claimed to include all possible soft Susie breaking terms, that is the terms which split for partners, but do not remove the protection against the quadratic divergence to the scalar mass. Uh, but however, are there any more possible terms? In a most general framework, it has been shown that certain non-analytic cubic scalar couplings also qualify as soft terms. That is, soft breaking sector is extended to include this phi square phi star type of interaction. Taking these interactions in the Lagrangian density, we have this Q tilde times HT star times AU prime U tilde star, and for the down type squawks and slip terms and their Hermitian conjugate. Now, these terms are not generally considered because several reasons. Firstly, there is high scale suppression. It comes from the one by M prefactor here uh, in the order of magnitude of these terms, which can be very large for gravity mediated case as for the CMSSM type of scenario. And another is reappearance of the divergence. 
what happens in a presence of gauge singlet which is singlet under the overall gauge group there can be quadratically large loop corrections depending on the masses of singlet field but uh, however if uh, the mass of singlet field and the chiral supermultiplet is of the same order then there is no problem and of course phenomenological minimal supersymmetric standard model evades these two uh, reasons to not consider this term there is no separation as we are considering all our input parameters in phenomenological scale and there is no gauge singlet under the su3 cross su2 cross u1 gauge group so there is no question of reappearance of this uh, bad divergence again now let us see uh, what happens uh, to the structure of slepton mass matrices if we consider this uh, phi square phi square terms that is this uh, trilinear non holomorphic slepton mass terms in the mass matrices we are concerned with the mass matrix in the slepton sector actually so the general form of the 6 by 6 slepton mass square matrix is given by this where each element is a 3 by 3 block the non holomorphic trilinear coupling modifies mainly the slepton left right mixing here we have written the uh, trilinear term explicitly and as you can see uh, the term is uh, here a minus mu plus a prime tan beta in mssm it was only a minus mu times tan beta so both the diagonal ones and the off diagonal ones are getting changed by uh, this uh, a prime ij or a prime ii type of interactions so um, our analysis however only explored this non diagonal holomorphic and non diagonal non holomorphic trilinear couplings to study the lepton sliver violating observables so uh, what we know uh, about the lepton sliver violation the observation of oscillation between neutrino sliver eigen states implies that lepton family quantum numbers are not considered and uh, as a consequence one can also explain the flavor violation in transition between charged lepton however charged lepton violation flavor violation has never been observed in any experiment which would have been a clear signature of the beyond standard model physics null results from this experiments in uh, indeed constrain respective model parameters uh, and tremendous effort is currently being realized in to achieve unparalleled sensitivity to probe lepton flavor de violating decays at like uh, meg bell babber lhcb and at all other experimental facilities what is uh, happening all over the world uh, now we will see that uh, we know that absence of any flavor changing neutral current significantly constrain the non diagonal elements but charge and color breaking Uh, minima aspects are more robust in this aspect uh, now in the lepton sector there is no color breaking uh, breaking contest so we will study the charge breaking minima here in a theory with multiple scalars uh, choice of desired electric one puts restriction on the allowed parameter space the total free level potential is given by um, this uh, equation involving higgs electrons muons tau coefficient a b c for two cases are here please note the presence of both uh, diagonal and the off diagonal trilinear couplings in both cases now considering all the three generations the condition avoid any charge breaking minima is derived as follows for uh, the first one is for the um, holomorphic trilinear couplings note the presence of aij here and the corresponding of diagonal uh, ukawa coupling element and the one with non holomorphic and holomorphic one is given by here so aij minus aij prime mu times yij is present so in uh, okay i will hurry up so in uh, as i have 5 minutes more so here in our numerical analysis we will consider this uh, bilinear soft uh, square uh, slepton mass matrices element to be exactly equal to 0 so whatever be the flavor violation that will be due to the aij and aij prime so let us see uh, how the results come out, uh, comes out to be 
फ्लेवर वायलेटिंग हीक्स टेकस प्ले एन सिग्निफिकेंट रोल्स फॉर इन्वेस्टिगेटिंग लिप्टन फ्लेवर वायलेशन द इफेक्टिव लैग्रेंजियन फाइ एल आई एल जी वर्टिस हैज थ्री पार्ट्स द फर्स्ट को टर्म डिनोट्स द इफ गोवा इंट्रैक्शन वेयर एप्सिलन 1 एनकोड्स द करेक्शन टू द चार्ज लिप्टन यू गोवा कपलिंग फ्रॉम फ्लेवर कंजर्विंग लूप्स एंड द लास्ट टर्म कोरिस्पोंड्स टू द सोर्स ऑफ फ्लेवर वायलेशन एंड एप्सिलन 1 एंड एप्सिलन 2 अराइज आउट ऑफ लूप फंक्शन इन्वॉल्विंग न्यूट्रलिनो एंड स्लिप्टन्स This effective Lagrangian essentially generates all the off-diagonal Yukawa couplings radiatively in the respective trilinear coupling is non-zero. Now, strengths of physical Higgs boson to the leptons uh, are given here with kappa i j uh, factor. Typically, dominant contribution come from the CP even heavy Higgs and CP odd heavy Higgs, which are evident from the factors in front of them. That is sine alpha minus beta in the decoupling limit is close to one, and for CP odd heavy Higgs it is one. The scatter plot shows the branching ratio h to mu tau and h to e tau as a function of a i j in cyan and a i j prime in blue, respectively. An appropriate non-holomorphic coupling that is in the blue additionally multiplies with tan square beta, leading to an enhancement by a factor of ten to the power three compared to the MSSM uh, values. As mentioned earlier, the Heavier Higgs are dominant one in the LFBD case for decoupling limit. Spread of the branching ratios as shown for uh, 1.5 TV heavy Higgs mass. All points here satisfy the upper mass uh, bounds for various uh, ma masses which have been uh, searching in the LHC. The various LFBD cases like mu to e gamma, mu to three, and other flavor constraints and mass bounds from LHC, and of course avoid deeper charge breaking minima than the electric one. Now, with the identical Yukawa couplings that MSSM inherits from standard model, we will use constraints of LHC from uh, uh, constraints of LHC on relevant off-diagonal Yukawas to restrict the trilinear parameters. To draw these bounds, we need to fix the neutral Lino and Clifton mass at some fixed values. Clearly, the larger radiative correction are induced in case of AIJ, particularly as is uh, it is seen from the uh, right column. And the left panel is for holomorphic, and right panel is for non-holomorphic trilinear couplings. The black horizontal line in each plot relates to the upper bound on uh, root over y i j square plus y j i square, as can be uh, seen here. And the for first two generation, it is coming from the mu to e gamma limit, and for uh, first third and second third generation, it is coming from the LHC thirteen T V data. And uh, here you can see the extent of variation of, uh, due to the non-holomorphic couplings is much more larger. At uh, actually, it is ten to the power three times larger. Now, with the understanding on how off-diagonal Yukawa couplings can directly influence the free rise of trilinear coupling, uh, we have uh, shown here the bounds in the y mod y i j times mod uh, y j i plane. And here, the different uh, light and deep redshirts region are restricted by the upper bounds of flavor violating LFPT case. Again, it is shown that for first two generation, mu two e gamma is the most constraining one, and for the uh, other two generation, it is the CMS and Atlas thirteen TV data. Blue points are uh, derived from the non-holomorphic couplings, and as you can see, it is ex uh, the large extent of non-holomorphic couplings are. Ex, uh, excluded from the search of the uh, LHC and null results from the mu to e gamma. So uh, let us wrap up quickly. For most of the charge lepton flavor uh, violating observable, the standard trilinear coupling A, that is the holomorphic one, turn out to be inadequate to produce any significant result for the present or even the future sensitivities. So we have two class of uh, we have. Classes of non-holomorphic coupling. One of them is A I J prime. May imprint significant contribution in these processes. A uh, reasonable amount of off-diagonal couplings, together with the diagonal one, may lead to potentially dangerous charge-breaking minima. And we derive the condition analytically to uh, preserve the glo global minima, which is charge conserved. And non-holomorphic coupling is bet always better suited in achieving large rays than compared to the Holomorphic couplings, and as we discussed from the results, that mu to e gamma constraint is uh, more favorable to test A i j prime for the first two generation, and the L H C limits are more favorable to test the second, third, and first third generation of diagonal couplings. So, with this, let me thank you all for your attention. So that's it.
Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, any comments or questions from the audience? I do not see any. So I just wanted uh, to, to ask you, so I, I've seen uh, you, you are mostly discussing about uh, lepton to lepton gamma decay or to yeah, the yeah. X to lepton lepton. But do you think that, I mean, is, uh, is there any, uh, let's say, possible constraint coming from the meson, uh, uh, let's say, lepton flavor violating the case, or uh, it was just not considered? I mean, is it uh, sensitive, not sensitive, or was just not uh, considered? Okay, we uh, have not studied this uh, mesons to lepton flavor violating decay in this analysis, but I think it will be sensitive because we have considered this slepton lepright mixing and for uh, quarks, quark sector also, we can have the non-holomorphic of diagonal elements. So uh, meson containing like uh, UD bar or some K mesons, et cetera. Then if we consider uh, the non-diagonal couplings, non-holomorphic in the squawk sector, then we can have some imprints of them in that decays also. That may be a study. We can okay, have okay. their imprints. So, so uh, okay, so it also can, uh, can occur there. Okay, very nice. Okay, thanks a lot. So if there are no other comments or question, uh, I thank you again. And uh, I would move to the last talk of this uh, uh, session before the coffee break. And uh, we have uh, met uh, Yusel about the uh, new 2 e experiment. Hi, uh, yeah. I will share now. Yes, please. Uh, and then I'll start the presentation. Can you see this? Yes, okay. So um, I'm going to talk about the Meteor experiment at Fermilab, our motivation, the design of the experiment, and I'm going to report on the progress. So uh, we we'll start with uh, what is a charge lepton flavor violation. Uh, we know that quarks mix, but uh, why don't leptons is the actual question. So uh, as uh, discussed in other talks today, uh, the charge lepton flavor is not conserved as uh, you know, uh, indicated by neutrino masses. So um, let's you know, use that and uh, let's look at a process which is mu to e gamma and, uh, in the standard model and uh, calculate the branching ratio. That turns out to be 10 to the uh, minus 54, which is heavily suppressed. So that means if you point something here, it will indicate into new physics. So uh, here I list uh, some uh, newer experiments uh, focusing on the muon sector. And of course, we're going to talk about mu -TE, which is the neutrinoless uh, conversion of the muon. So uh, which uh, scales uh, mu -TE probes? Uh, here's our effective Lagrangian. Uh, here is the lambda is the mass uh, term. And the kappa is a scale factor between the first and the second terms of this Lagrangian. So if the kappa is low, uh, you get uh, effects uh, you know, sensitive uh, from the loop contributions uh, to the Lagrangian, uh, you know, as indicated here. You know, these uh, can be supersymmetric model, heavy neutrinos, uh, and you know, uh, all, all those things. And if you increase the kappa, then your uh, second term dominates, and this is sensitive uh, to what we uh, so-called contact term, and you know, these uh, couplings uh, interactions. So uh, why is mu unique? So let's try to understand that uh, by looking at this picture, uh, the plot of kappa versus the mass scale. Here we can see the, uh, the mass scale mu probes. Start, let's start with syndrome two, which is the older experiment. Uh, this puts uh, our limit at uh, conversion limit at 10 to the minus 13 and covers this region of the spectrum. And we have mu gamma experiment, again, at 10 to the minus 13 covering uh, this sector. So in comparison, uh, mu -TE can uh, probe up to 10 to the 4 TeV. And uh, not only that, uh, like uh, for, uh, in comparison to collider experiment, uh, mu -TE is free from standard model backgrounds. Uh, you can also have intense muon beams uh, for high statistics, which uh, you can't get in a general collider experiment. So uh, let's look at our signal, uh, the coherent electron conversion with the aluminum. 
Um, here you can see a muon going in orbit around the aluminum. Uh, so it will lose some energy uh, when it converts the electron to uh, some to the binding and some to the nuclear recoil. So you put that in and you can calculate the, this uh, monoenergetic electron of 105 MeV. Uh, so uh, what we're looking for is the rate of this conversion divided by all the other captures. And this will uh, give you your uh, conversion rate, uh, which uh, we aim three times 10 to the minus 17. And uh, this will be a 10 to the four improvement over syndrome two, the last experiment. So let's talk about our backgrounds. Uh, the biggest background we have is decay in orbit electrons. Here again, the same picture, Mion goes in uh, around the aluminum. Uh, it's uh, this time regularly uh, decays into an electron with neutrinos which then you know, shares uh, the momentum with the electron. Uh, this means uh, it has a lower energy peak compared to our uh, muon mass. Uh, so uh, the spectrum, let's inspect that tail end of it, it decreases sharply. So if, the, uh, if we plot our conversion electrons on top of this uh, decay, uh, the background will we'll get this. So the METI experiment tries to uh, separate this red signal from the blue background. And to get that, uh, we need a good momentum resolution. So uh, let's summarize our, our design principles. So we want to get 10 to the 4 improvement over the last experiment. Uh, the question is how to get there. So uh, firstly, we get there by having a high intensity pulsed muon beam. Uh, this provides you with high statistics, uh, but also with the beam, it introduces beam backgrounds. So what are those? like pions and uh, muons coming with the uh, beam and then decaying in flight, uh, radiative pion capture or antipodal annihilation. These are some examples. Uh, secondly, we, we need high resolution on the momentum to be able to separate 105 MeV uh, conversion electrons from the DIOs. Uh, to, to achieve this, we have a tracker and electromagnetic colorimeter. And then uh, to get a discovery, we need a, a background suppression of less than one event uh, for the whole experiment. So that means uh, making, uh, making the detector basically blind to lower energy particles. Uh, we're going to use an event window separation with pulsed muon beam. And we need a, veto, a way to veto cosmic rays because they're also a big part of the background. They produce one conversion-like electron per day. Uh, and uh, so the discovery we need, we need 99.99 veto efficiency, which is really hard. So uh, let's talk about our live event window. Uh, our 8 GB pulsed proton beam uh, comes to the target at 1695 nanosecond intervals. Uh, we wait 700 nanoseconds before we uh, take any uh, conversion data. So this allows for all that uh, prompt background that comes with the beam to die out even before we start taking uh, beam uh, data. So here's an example, radiative pion capture, one of the biggest pion is captured by the aluminum, releases a gamma, which then converts into an electron and positron pair. Here you can see that it just uh, dies out while we're uh, taking signal uh, 700 sec nine seconds later. You can ask, what about the uh, out-of-time protons? Well, uh, out-of-time protons uh, per beam, we limit that to 10 to the minus 10. So uh, here's an overall picture of the experiment. Uh, it has uh, three superconducting magnets. Uh, there's a production solenoid. Uh, HU proton beam comes here and hits the production target uh, housed in the production solenoid, uh, which uh, you know, produces muons. Uh, we direct them to the transport solenoid, where they transfer into the muon stopping target. So this transport solenoid has an um, S-shaped uh, geometry, which selects uh, low momentum and negatively charged particles. Uh, and then uh, these go into the detector solenoid. Uh, the conversion electrons go into a helical orbit, hitting the tracker and the colorimeter. So uh, all of that uh, is covered by our cosmic ray veto system. Uh, here you can see uh, these are like giant uh, scintillators. Uh, here you can see that it is uh, covering the whole of the detector solenoid and some part of the transport solenoid. So our progress on the solenoids, uh, here is a picture of the muon beam line showing uh, where different parts of the uh, solenoids are at. Uh, I would say uh, the transport solenoid is the farthest one apart in uh, terms of completion. So let's talk about the tracker, uh, which uh, I work on. Uh, this is the main detection element of MUTE. 
It's a low mass tracker uh, using uh, draw, uh, straw drift tubes uh, running argon CO2. Here's a picture of the straw, five millimeter in diameter. Uh, we have a 96 per tracker panel uh, staged in double layer configuration like this. Here's a panel. We put six of them together to produce a plane and the whole tracker uh, consists of 36 such planes and it, uh, it is three, three meters in length. This uh, highly segmented uh, nature of the tracker uh, helped with the particle identification and our uh, momentum resolution hits our design goal of 180 k. So our progress, the pan, pan, tracker panels are produced in the University of Minnesota. 40 out of 216 are produced. Uh, in comparison, planes are going to be uh, produced at Fermilab. We did a, a trial at the, uh, back in February before quarantine. Now we're planning to do a vertical slice test, which is a, a complete uh, test of tracker plane uh, with the collection electronics. And this is uh, going to be done in uh, September. Here's an example of the tracker construction, uh, panel upside down, a uh, uh, particle uh, comes down, uh, and then uh, you can see that it uh, hits uh, both layers, and uh, we calculate, uh, we determine uh, the distance of closed approach on each straw to uh, construct our track. So uh, let's switch to the electromagnetic colorimeter. We have 1,348 uh, cesium iodine crystals. These are all read out by uh, silicon photomultipliers. The design is similar uh, to Tracker with this uh, annular uh, structure with a hole in the middle. Here we can see a prototype from 2017, uh, which you know achieved uh, all uh, the experiment's goals, like the time resolution, energy resolution, and spatial resolution. So the progress on colorimeter, we have uh, cesium uh, iodide crystals expected to be done by August. Uh, they're uh, measured at Caltech. Uh, for light yield and resolution. All the systems are completed and assembled into these uh, plates, which will be then installed into the colorimeter. A co cosmic ray widow, uh, we talked about this. Uh, it uh, it's consists of these polystyrene scintillators layered in this uh, four uh, layered uh, staging, uh, and it covers all of the detector solenoid. Uh, whenever a particle uh, muon passes by, uh, it is. Uh, we do a coincidence of three out of four and uh, elim uh, eliminate the cosmic neon. So the progress, uh, all of the SIPM, 8% of the SIPMs are tested. Uh, the die counters, 58% of them produced. Then they're being assembled into modules. Here you can see a picture of a vertical one. And here you can see a side one. And two out of, uh, 20 out of 83, 24% is complete. So, um, all of that uh, design and detector elements uh, combine into this background summary table, which lists intrinsic, uh, this uh, prompt, uh, beam related prompt, uh, uh, and the cosmic ray backgrounds. Uh, and in total, we have, uh, we achieved 4.41 uh, uh, event uh, per, the ex uh, per the experiment lifetime. So uh, let's talk about our sensitivity. So this is what we want to find uh, to get the five sigma discovery. Uh, we need uh, uh, our METE two times ten to minus sixteen. If we have, uh, if, if the conversion is uh, above that, we get five sigma discovery uh, with uh, nine uh, nine uh, ninety uh, confidence, the ninety percent confidence level uh, for the exclusion at eight times ten to minus seventeen. This interestingly means. To get this, we need we only need seven conversion electrons. Uh, so, in summary, uh, MUT will improve current limit on conversion rate by uh, 10, uh, 10 to the four at the single electron sensitivity of three times 10 to minus 17. It will probe mass scales up to 10 to the four TV. Our current schedule is the installation and commissioning uh, starting in 2021, the physics in 2024. Uh, this means a thousand times improvement over the current limit by 2025. Then th there's going to be a shutdown, and uh, it, will, it will we will then uh, by the end of the decade uh, hopefully get a 10,000 uh, improvement over the current limit. And uh, the next two three years uh, we'll see a big effort on building uh, and commissioning the detector. So uh, thanks for listening. Uh, here's a, a nice picture of Fermilab campus with a METI building in the uh, lower left corner. So that's all. Okay, thanks a lot.
Any comments or questions from the audience? Uh, hi, I ha uh, thank you for a good talk. I have uh, uh, two, two questions. Yeah. So one is that um, if, there is a, if there is any plans for upgrade or something else during the PIP2 shutdown, and next question is that if there was any chance to measure the extension directly. So um, for the first uh, first one, uh, let's do uh, so. Yeah, so there's an upgrade already uh, planned uh, MUT2. The schedule is uh, you know uh, is uh, not uh, solid yet. But uh, this, of course, uses the uh, the PIP2 uh, uh, beam line uh, to get a get a better beam for the experiment, which in then you know uh, uh, you know increases uh, our resolution. Uh, of course, you know this uh, has to come with uh, like all the upgrades to the tracker uh, and uh, and the saunas and you know uh, or or the improved CRV. So uh, uh, the studies are. Uh, Currently, you know, being done on how to how to upgrade those for the next generation, but it is planned. Uh, what was the second one? Your the second, second question? question was the uh, if, if there was any chance to measure the beam extension directory. Yeah, so uh, not here on my slides, but uh, we have an extension monitor. Um, let's go here to get a picture of the experiment. Yeah, so uh, right around here, before the beam comes to the production solenoid, we have an extinction monitor, which uh, you know measures this uh, uh, out of time particles and then uh, and collimators that limits uh, limits that uh, number to uh, ten to minus ten. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I don't see any other comments or question. And uh, in case there are, uh, uh, please uh, use the Mattermost channel. At this point, uh, uh, I would uh, propose the, to, to go on with the coffee break and uh, I leave uh, the chair to Carla. So please, Carla, tell us when to reconvene. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to unmute. So we reconvene here at, uh, at we are on time, so at uh, 7.08. Okay, thanks a lot.
If someone wants to test the slides in this three minutes. Um, Carla, could I please? Yes, sure. <clears throat> um try to pass it yeah okay great it's, it's working great okay yes i will stop so someone else can uh, okay anyone else yes uh, i will yes. okay uh someone else before i will test later uh, okay i just show can you see them Yes. Okay. Great. Next. Yes, that will be me. One second. Can you see them? Perfect. Great. I can, can, I, can I also try? Anyone? Try, yes, sure. Can I can I try? Uh, uh, just a moment, uh, Eva. I can't see your your son full screen. Yeah, I can see that way. Maybe you just use from there. Can I try to speak? Eva? Sorry, yes. yes ah, I'm okay, to just, just a test. <laughs> yeah. So anyone else? I'll, I'll stop sharing now. No. Yeah, probably you need to, to pass from there. I, I couldn't see in the other way. We can try later, but uh, just be... Yeah, no, no, I'll just keep it like that. Okay. Can you stop sharing? Okay, I just stopped for you. Well, it's time to restart, so. Um, otherwise we won't be able to be on time. So the, we, have, we are uh, uh, resuming the last block this evening of the uh, session two of the quark and lepton flavor physics. Uh, we'll have uh, seven talks on CP violation from Atlas CMS and LHCB, and the last talk uh, from the Dipole B project. So we start with Sneha from the uh, with uh, time integrated measurements of angle. Please go ahead. Um, so good evening. Um, I will be telling you about our latest measurements of the CKM angle gamma from the LHCB experiment. So we know that the standard model is, is not the full story. There are empirical and aesthetic reasons to expect there to be physics beyond the standard model. A promising area that we can, that we can um, explore to try and look for the effects of uh, new physics is CP violation. Within the standard model, the CP violation in the quark sector is encoded within the CKM matrix, which describes the coupling of the weak and the mass eigenstates of quarks. Using the properties of the unitary matrix, we can represent that matrix as a 
unitary triangle and the angle gamma is of particular interest at the moment. So gamma is interesting because it's the only angle which is easily accessible in processes that only include tree level decays. Tree level decays basically mean that they are standard model benchmarks because it's very difficult for new, for new physics to interfere and change the values. Also with gamma, we have effectively no theory uncertainties. So how do you go from a standard model benchmark to new physics? Well, you can also make indirect determinations of gamma. So here one assumes that the triangle is closed and we make measurements of the other sides and, ang and we use measurements of the other sides and angles to infer the value of gamma. Here, new physics is more likely to contribute because a lot of these, uh, these processes have, have loop decays in them. And so there is a potential for a different central value. If we take a look at at the current values, we see that the um, direct measurements and indirect measurements are a little bit different. Um, it used to be about two sigma different, that, that, that's a bit less so now. Um, but nonetheless, the uncertainties on the direct measurements of gamma are, are still very large um, and significant progress is possible in the next few years. And that's one of the reasons why this is so interesting at this point in time. So um, time in, time independent measurements of gamma are typically made in B to DK decays. There's a favored decay and a suppressed decay. And the amplitude ratio between them is um, RB um, is, is, is dependent on some hadronic uh, parameters from the strong interaction, RB and delta B, and then the weak phase, which is the one that we're interested in. Now, in order to access the phase gamma, we need to have um, a system that has interference, which means that we need to have uh, the D0 and the D0 bar mesons decay into the same final state so that we can have access to the phase from the interference. The level of interference and its exact manifestation is going to be dependent on the physics of the B decay, but also of the D decay. The measurements I will be telling you about today will mainly be um, our new result, um, shown here for the first time on B to DK, where D goes to K short pi pi or K short KK. I will briefly uh, show you the results from um, uh, an, an, a similar analysis where the D decays to K short K pi. Um, and Ava will tell you about some of our time dependent results in the next talk. So if we take a look at our data collection for B to DK and B to D pi, this is our full data set from 2011 through to 2018. We can see that the excellent detector performance has given us great, um, you know, it, it, it's given um, us great performance here. So we have very large yields. So 15,000 B to DK and 210,000 B to D pi. Um, and this is a result of having excellent hadronic trigger efficiency. The IP resolution that we have means that we can really beat down those combinatorial backgrounds. And the momentum resolution means that we can separate this partially reconstructed background on the left-hand side from the signal very well. And finally, our Hadron PID means that we can select out B to DK very cleanly um, from B to D pi, which has 12 times the branching fraction. So if we were interested to see what CP violation would look like, we would take a look then at the Dalitz plots of the D decay from B plus and B, B minus decays. You can see that already with the statistics that we have, that these, these differences are visible by eye. So for example, if you take a look at the red circle, you will see that the points in the left-hand plot are more concentrated than the ones on the right-hand side. And the magnitude and position of these differences is driven by the values um, of gamma and also these other hadronic parameters. So the idea of the analysis is quite simple. We just want to compare the bin yields between B plus and B minus decays. We don't use a standard rectangular binning because we know that this is likely to dilute our statistical sensitivity. So we use these highly non-uniform binning schemes um, for K short pi pi, and we can also add K short KK. And these have been designed to maximize our, st our statistical sensitivity. The key point here is that the results are independent of any amplitude model. And this means that we um, don't have to worry about how we are assigning our systematic uncertainties, which is important when it comes to precision measurements. Um, so we can compare the yields to um, 
um, a, a number of parameters. Um, so the equation looks complicated, but it boils down to uh, these X and Y parameters, which are our physics parameters of interest. And they basically parameterize the real and imaginary parts of the amplitude and they have the sensitivity to gamma. We then have um, the CI and SI, which are essentially strong phase parameter measurements of the DDK. So this is the information that we need about the DDK. It comes from BEST3 and CLIO. And the reason why it has to come from another experiment is that we need um, a system that can access these parameters. And, and one of those systems are quantum correlated D DDKs from the SI double prime. Um, and finally, we have um, the, these, these F parameters. And this is just the fraction of the pure D0 decay into a given bin, taking into account reconstruction and selection efficiency. One of the key parts of the analysis is is, is, is um, attaining these FI to, to measure them. We know that our efficiency profile is not uniform at LHCB. Um, and previously we've used B to D star mu nu as a control mode to determine the FI. But the trigger and the selection can't be the same. And it was becoming clear that we would be leading for you know, very large systematic uncertainties if we continued to, to, to follow the same path. Ideally, um, the, if, uh, the, the best control mode would be B to D pi. It has the same efficiency uh, because the topology is the same and we can apply the same selection. Also, the branching fraction is 12 times larger than B to DK, so there are enough statistics there to, to, to control. But it had always been a worry that the CP violation in the decay mode and other physics effects in this channel may make um, a, a problematic, may be problematic in the actual execution of the analysis. However, we've understood these physics effects much better now. And we also know how to take into account the CP violation. And so for the first time, we use this as a control mode to, to determine the FI and simultaneously determine the CP violation parameters in B to D pi. So we perform a fit, which is essentially the fit to the invariant mass model, um, the invariant mass spectrum in each bin separate, um, simultaneously. And we use that to determine the X and Y CP observables. What I've shown here is um, bin plus four, which is one that exhibits um, a large amount of asymmetry. If we take a look at the results, we can plot X and Y. And the signature for CP violation is that these two blobs are separated. And so you can see that they clearly are separated. And if we take a look at the bin by bin pair asymmetries, you can see that we do in BTDK see some very large asymmetries and that the fit predictions match the data very well. Um, on beta d pi, the CP violation is expected to be an order of magnitude smaller. So the asymmetries that we're expecting are much smaller. And for this reason, the data is not yet sufficient to be able to um, say that we can see CP violation in this decay mode. We can compute um, the value of gamma from these CP observables. And so we measure gamma to be 69 plus or minus 5 degrees. That is nearly all. Um, that is dominated by the statistical component, um, which is about five degrees. And then we have two sources of, um, well, we have two classes of systematic uncertainty. One comes from the propagation of the uh, uncertainty on the strong phases, which are the measurements from BEST3 and CLIO. And you can see that they um, have an uncertainty of around one degree. And then we have um, a number of systematic uncertainties from the experimental side on LHCB, and these add up to about one degree as well. We can compare that to our previous measurement that used uh, 2011 to 2016 data. And you can see that this is um, a substantial improvement. Um, we've gained in statistical uncertainty by adding the two years of data and some small improvements to the selection. But one of the key points here is that the old um, uncertainty from CLIO, which was about four degrees, is now shrunk to about one. Um, and this is. Um, and you can imagine that if we still had a four degree uncertainty, we would, you know, there is no way we could reach a, a precision of five degrees. Um, and so these new inputs from BEST3 have made a big difference. And then secondly, we've been able to very much reduce the systematic uncertainties from the experiment by using this B to D pi mode um, as the control. We also measure um, a number of hadronic parameters and um, the B to D pi hadronic parameters are measured for the first time and they will have impact um, when they go into the full gamma combination. The measurement of gamma reaches a, a similar position as all other measurements of gamma combined. 
As I said, we have a large number of B and D decays are being pursued at LHCb to measure gamma, and um, a large amount of there is a large amount of current activity to update these to the full data sample, um, or even introduce new methods. I show here another decay mode, which is B to D K, where D goes to K short K pi. Again, asymmetries um, are, are are visible in in these decay modes. Um, this is a um, as, as a standalone measurement, this doesn't have direct sensitivity. Uh, it, it can't make a measurement of gamma on its own, but it uh, does contribute to uh, a, a combined measurement of gamma, which will be put into the next combination. So to, to summarize, LHCB have started to release full run one and run two measurements of gamma. We have um, a new result, um, which has um, uh, a precision of, of about five degrees, and it's the most precise measurement from a single measurement. And we have benefited from new control modes and new um, external inputs of strong phases. If we take a look at how the LHCB combination looked in 2018, you can see that once these measurements are added to it, the LHCB is, is well on track to, su to surpass the four degree one one plus root one two target. And so we put ourselves in a very good place for the upcoming upgrade. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zuneha. Um, questions from the audience? I don't see any. So I think we just uh, continue with uh, Eva Gessebeck with uh, the time dependent measurements from B to D. LHCB. Thank you. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. Yes, now I can. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so what I'll speak about now is pretty much complementary to um, what uh, Snea presented. Uh, I'll be speaking about the time dependent uh, beauty to open charm analysis we do at LHCB. Uh, we're interested in them because they are sensitive to the weak phases uh, beta and gamma uh, and beta S. Um, and uh, we do them in a time dependent way uh, when we deal with uh, neutral beam mesons. Uh, this we do in order to resolve the um, uh, meson, beam meson oscillations, uh, and to do that, uh, we fit for the decay time dependent decay rates, uh, and um, we, we extract the uh, parameters of interest. So these measurements also require uh, knowledge of the external parameters, uh, gamma, delta gamma, delta m, um, and a few others you will see in the slides thereafter. Um, and, uh, to check for further um, updates on these uh, charm final states at LHCB, you can uh, check the uh, talk by Wojtek tomorrow in, in this session. I'll start with uh, the B0 to D star D uh, decays, uh, where uh, D star and D are charged. And um, this is the first measurement we do in this decays at, at LHCB. It's been done previously by Bell and Babar. Uh, here we're dealing with a B2CC uh, deep arc transition where we have three penguin and exchange and uh, annihilation diagrams. Uh, therefore, uh, in addition to the mixing induced CP violation, we also expect possible direct CP violation contributions. Um, and in the little sketch in the corner, you see the possible decays of the B0 and the B0 bar decays. Um, they are uh, they are all accessible from all states. In addition to that, you have the B0, B0 bar oscillation. Uh, therefore, uh, we are sensitive to CP violation, as I said, in the interference um, and also the direct one. On this slide, you see the time dependent decay rates. Uh, I've highlighted with yellow. Uh, the external coefficients we used, uh, the decay time and delta m, and I've underlined uh, with purple the CP coefficients, which are of uh, interest to this analysis. Um, 
And you see the definition also of these coefficients uh, using the H-fluff convention and their relation to the, for instance, lambda F, uh, the CP uh, parameter um, and um, uh, overall um, the overall asymmetry between the F and FFR uh, final states. So the one CP coefficient which is of most interest to us in this case is the uh, S D star D, uh, which if we assume uh, uh, no, if we assume uh, that we can neglect the penguin contributions, uh, which are known to be uh, about a few percent, uh, and we can essentially assume there is no direct CP violation, if we can assume that, uh, then uh, the uh, SD star D would be a good approximation of the uh, sine to beta, which is the angle of the unitary the triangle. So for this analysis, uh, we use the full sample of run one and run two, which is uh, about nine inverse time to bond. And uh, here we split our data into four subsamples according to the decay of our intermediate um, the zero mason, uh, and according to the LHC run. Uh, and we fit that. You see on the left plot, you, the fit to the invariant mass of one of those four sum samples. And then we fit simultaneously all the four um, uh, subsamples and we perform a decay time fit. Um, and uh, we use about a total of 6,000 candidates uh, to, to, to measure uh, the CP coefficients of interest. Uh, on the plot on the right, you see the uh, asymmetry between uh, B0 and B0 bar decays. Um, and actually on this slide, you see the results for all uh, five coefficients. Uh, and th this is the most precise measurement of CP violation in this decay channel to date. This is a relatively new result. The publication went out uh, this spring. Um, and uh, the hypothesis of CP conservation is excluded with the great significance in this decay channels. Um, what you note here is that the coefficient C and the coefficient A are compatible with zero. Uh, therefore, this indicates no CP violation in the decay. Um, and then we can make this assumption that there is no direct CP violation. We can fix them to zero and we can repeat the fit. Uh, and then we get a value for a sine to beta, uh, which uh, you see here. Uh, and this is uh, about 1.9 sigma away from the world average. Okay, I'll move to the next uh, decay I'll discuss. This is the second out of three time dependent measurements. Uh, so here we have neutral B0 going to charge the meson and the pion decays. Uh, the two leading uh, Feynman diagrams contributing to the interference in this decay channel you see below. We have a transition of B2CW and another one of B2UW. Uh, this is uh, analogous to the last decay I'll discuss later, BS to DSK the case. Um, so I mentioned we have an interference between them uh, and the weak phase difference uh, between these is um, gamma plus uh, two times beta. Again, we have the time dependent uh, decay rates uh, with the external inputs and the um, CP coefficient CF and SF. Uh, those CP coefficients are um, expressed uh, with um, uh, the, um, this is the relation basically to the ratio RTP uh, to the strong phase delta and to the weak phases uh, beta plus two times beta plus gamma. For the coefficient CF, um, we, we can start at 2, 1 because we know that the um, uh, magnitude of RTP is quite small, it's below 2%. So, thank you. Uh, we basically effectively um, remove this out of the equation uh, and we set it to one. Uh, RDP would also be used in the other uh, as an input and we can constrain that from the bar and bell. Uh, two times beta, we would constrain from the H-flow. Um, therefore, uh, we extract the values uh, of SF and SF bar from a multidimensional fit. Well, one of the components um, 
uh, one of the fixes we perform is to the invariant uh, deep-pine mass, uh, which you see on the top plot. We have a very, very clean peak, very significant. The data, we have close to half a million events. And you see our results for SF and SF4 uh, using our run one uh, sample. And then we, we use this CP coefficients to constrain um, further uh, the strong phase delta and gamma. And you see the intervals, uh, the, com the, the the confidence intervals for uh, these variables, delta and gamma, and also the two-dimensional uh, scan uh, at the bottom plot uh, of uh, delta versus gamma. As I mentioned, uh, we need the uh, RTP as an input. We are able to calculate it. And for the analysis I just presented, that's been done using um, information from the PDG, uh, using measurements of Bell and Babar. Uh, but we can also measure it at uh, LHCB, and we're doing it using uh, B0 to DS pi the case. Um, we, we can do that because we have uh, a clean hedronic 3 decay. You see the Feynman diagram here in the upper corner. Um, and the branching ratio of uh, this decays uh, is interesting because it's proportional to the CKM element VUB and also to some non factorizable strong interaction effects in BTU decays. However, what's most uh, interesting for us in this case is that we can use this branching fraction to calculate uh, RDP using the second formula on this slide here. Uh, and here it's uh, how this um, branching fraction enters. So using uh, five inverse time to burn around one plus run, part of our run two data, uh, we're able to measure this branching fraction and RDP. This is a new uh, result, uh, which is also preliminary, and Voita would discuss it in more detail tomorrow. Uh, and uh, here we have the best precision in this case in, in agreement with the world average. OK, I'm at the last time-dependent measurement I would discuss. Uh, this is the measurement of the CKM angle gamma with a BSTDSKUK. So uh, this, this is very well known. Um, here, essentially, uh, we have a similar situation. We have two leading diagrams with transitions of the B2CW and B2UW. So here, in contrast to the uh, B0 to D pi decays, um, we have two amplitudes uh, that are both proportional uh, to the, uh, the, the amplitudes are of the order of uh, lambda to the power of third, of th to the third power. Um, and here we have the weak phase difference um, of gamma minus two times beta, uh, analogous to the uh, gamma minus two beta. So beta s uh, we take from uh, other external measurements. And if you're interested, uh, check out the talk of Paley and Lee uh, on uh, the recent uh, BS measurements uh, with the LHCB experiment. Um, Again, we have a time-dependent decay rate uh, with external inputs um, and the CP coefficients. You see their relation to the thank you to the um, um, strong phases and the weak phases uh, and the ratio RTSK. Uh, here is what we determine with our run one data sample, and using that, we we can actually also um, plot the asymmetries. Um, shown here above. Um, we can also interpret these variables uh, in terms of RDSK, uh, delta and gamma. You see the two-dimensional scans uh, of RDSK and gamma, the strong phase uh, versus gamma, and then the single uh, measurement uh, of gamma, which is at about 128 degrees, which is very nice. Then we use those uh, as input to the combination of gamma. And Matt Kenzie uh, has shown this plot at FPCP. Um, so here, the BS contribution is in red. And you see it's uh, a bit far away from uh, the results uh, with using B plus and B0 decays, B plus being the results that Snea just discussed. And probably uh, this, this would be updated uh, now after the uh, results that Snea updated. So there is a certain tension. We are very curious to understand uh, where we have uh, this tension from. Um, 
And I arrive at my summary and conclusions. I've presented uh, three time-dependent measurements um, at LHCB. They, were they, they are sensitive to uh, the CKM angles, uh, two times beta and gamma. Um, we've done some um, future projections, what we can do with 50 and 300 inverse pen to burn at LHCB. And probably if there is one number to take from this slide, this is uh, that with the LHCB upgrade two, we can uh, reach uh, a precision of about one degree with uh, the SKB case, which is, which is very nice. Uh, we're also working towards uh, finishing our run two analysis and adding a new decay channels such as the BS to DS KPI or some new states, uh, including excited D and this star mode. Um, so hopefully uh, this would be available soon. Okay, that's, that's all for me. Thank you, Eva. Questions from the audience? I don't see any. Please don't forget to use the Mattermore channel so you can, if any question arises later, the okay. discussions proceeds there. Thank you. Thank you. So we can move to the the next two talks on FIAS. The, the first from Atlas results on FIAS from Thomas Jacob Beck. Yes. Hello. Do you hear me? Um. Not so loud. Okay. What? Uh, give me a second. It's better. It's better now. Yes. Okay, um, so do you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. So, yes, I'm Tomáš, Tomáš Jakubek. Uh, it's Czech name, so I'm almost here in this conference. Um, so, on behalf of the Atlas collaboration, I'd like to show you the latest or the updated results of our measurement of CPA violation in the BS2 Jape Sci Fi uh, decay channel. So, this channel is expected to be uh, sensitive to new physics contributions to CP violation, and it's often called um, golden channel by, by the community. Uh, before the decade, the B-meson can uh, oscillate into its antiparticle, and this oscillation can be characterized by, um, by the mass difference between uh, heavy and less, uh, light mass eigenstates. Uh, if uh, in the absence of the CP violation, these states would then correspond to the, the flavor eigenstates. So in general, we define two types of CP violation, violation in decay, uh, where the amplitude uh, of meson to the final uh, state is different from the decay amplitude of an anti-meson to anti-final state. Uh, then there is a violation in mixing. In other words, uh, there's an asymmetry uh, in, the part, uh, in the particle antiparticle oscillation. And these two processes or these two uh, types of violation can interfere. And so we define CP violation in the interference of mixing and decay. Uh, this one is only possible if, uh, if meson and its anti-meson decay in the same, uh, to the same final state. In other words, the oscillation can occur before the decay. This is of, of course the case of the BS2 J Psi Phi decay channel. So uh, what, what defined the CPA violation in this channel is a weak phase, uh, weak phase difference between the mixing amplitude and uh, B to C, C bar S transition amplitude. In the standard model, this phase can be related to the Kabibo Kobayashi Maskawa quark mixing matrix and thus can be predicted uh, very precisely to be minus 0 0.037, let's say. So any sizable deviation uh, would be a clear sign of uh, beyond the standard model physics because these processes could then introduce a contribution or contributions uh, to the box diagrams uh, describing the BS mixing. Uh, so to our measurement uh, in ATLAS, so it was done using the data collected by the ATLAS detector, of course. This is one of the multipurpose detectors on the LHC. From all the important parts, let me mention the muon spectrum it's used for triggering the data views for analysis and the inner detector, which uh, is used for precise tracking. A uh, new innermost part uh, was inserted before run two. Uh, we call it an insertable B layer. 
And thanks to this layer, uh, we have much better mass and lifetime resolution. Um, for triggering, the physics rely heavily on low PT muons and the yields of our typical diamond triggers with vario invariant, invariant mass windows are shown on the, on the right plot. Uh, basically, all our triggers are four or six GeV uh, diamond triggers. Uh, our analysis started many, many years ago. Uh, the first paper was based on five inverse Fenton bands of uh, 70 EV data. Then we've published the full round one analysis with addition of 14 inverse Fenton bands of 80 EV data. And today I'd like to show you uh, the latest result and its update. Um, uh, it's our partial round two analysis using uh, 80 inverse Fenton bands of 13 PEV data from years. 2015, 16, and 17. So without the uh, last last year of data taking. Um, in our analysis, we require at least four tracks in the in the event, uh, two muons and two other tracks. Uh, we do not have any particle identification atlas, but uh, because of the muon spectrometer, we can of course exclude muon tracks uh, from the from the set. Uh, then we refit the vertex. Uh, or then we refit these four tracks to the common vertex under the k on -Kern hypothesis for the remaining tracks. And by refitting these four tracks, we can then obtain the secondary vertex and the decay length or the lifetime of the, of the B particle B meson. Um, if it happens that there are multiple BS candidates in the event, uh, then we take uh, the, the one with the best vertex fit. All signal background separation uh, is then done completely by an unbent maximum likelihood fit. Uh, so BS to J psi phi is a decay of pseudoscar to vector vector final state, uh, which is thus an admixture of uh, CP odd and CP even states. Uh, we can distinguish these uh, states through time dependent angular analysis, uh, but our data are still polluted by by non-resonant S-wave uh, decay BS to J psi K plus K minus, and also by the uh, decay BS to J psi F zero. Uh, unfortunately, these uh, these events can be identified in the data, and thus can significantly bias the measurement of the weak phase. Uh, they also interfere with the signal decay, so we have to include them in the differential decay rate, and uh, everything is then uh, treated by by the fit. So a few words about the flavor tagging, uh, which is of course very important in every CP violation measurement. Uh, we use so-called uh, um, opposite side tagging, where we try to deduce the, the flavor of the, the signal B meson uh, from the flavor of the other B meson produced in the, in the event. Uh, for a calibration and performance estimation, we use a self tagging channel. Uh, B plus minus to J psi, K plus or minus, uh, where the flavor of the Mimeson can uh, is, is given by the by the Keon charge. Um, uh, so uh, to identify, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. So to identify uh, the flavor, uh, we use a lepton uh, lepton tagging, where it's uh, this is based on the semileptonic decay of, uh, of B meson, where the flavor is uh, given by the lepton charge, but of course it's diluted by the B to C quark transition as well as, as uh, oscillation itself. Uh, this, this fact can be improved by the moment weight charge of the lepton and tracks in the cone around the leading lepton. Uh, if there is no additional muon or electron uh, in the event, we try to use a DJ charge tagging. We calculate the moment to weight track, track uh, charge in the, in the jet. Um, from the calibration, uh, calibration B plus to minus sample, uh, we then map uh, these charges to the probability that the given candidate is BS or anti BS. And this of this probability is then used in the fit on the per candidate uh, basis. If there is no tagging information, uh, we assign a probability uh, 0 0.5. Uh, in this way, we can take uh, uh, <laughs> we can uh, we can take about 15% of all BS candidates. Uh, 
yeah, so you can see the comparison of uh, our tagging methods and also the mapping uh, from the charge to probability on the bottom plots uh, as an example. Um, so to obtain the physics parameter calculation in the decay, we use the mean maximum likelihood fit, uh, which takes all possible information about the event, so the mass and its uncertainty, proper decay time, uh, angles between final state particles, uh, Vs momentum, and the tag probability. And the fit then determines nine physics variables, uh, the weak phase, uh, decay width of heavy and less, uh, light mass eigenstates, and three amplitudes and relevant uh, strong phases. So the likelihood function consists of four main parts, the signal part, two specific backgrounds from misreconstructed BD and lambda BD decays, of the BD case and uh, common through background. Um, and then all of these probability density functions are weighted for the proper decay time uh, efficiency. Uh, here we can see the fit results of our uh, partial run to uh, data analysis. Uh, this is the fit projection to all, all data passing the uh, passing selection. Uh, the ratio plots uh, below each figure uh, include uh, both uh, statistical and systematic uncertainties. And we can see that uh, these plots uh, cover all the, all the differences between the data and the model. Um, during the, uh, during the uh, analysis of the full run to data set, we observe there is a secondary minimum uh, with respect to the two variables to observe this, it's a uh, delta parallel and delta perpendicular. We have both solutions here. Uh, the origin is an approximate symmetry in the signal uh, particle, uh, sorry, in the signal probability density function. And uh, we measure the, as the two, to, this two solutions as difference of 0 0.03 favoring A, but without ruling out B. So we are uh, including both uh, solutions uh, analysis and you can see the uh, likelihood contours uh, of uh, all the one two and three let's say sigma intervals uh, on the plot on the bottom uh, then there are results of our combine combined analysis of run one plus uh, partial run two data set uh, the ambiguity of the delta gamma sign uh, is uh, constrained by the measurement of lhcb experiment uh, for the combination, we make use of the best linear, linear unbiased estimate method. And you can see that the both solutions or the differences between the two solutions are negligible uh, even in the combination. So in the table, table below in the three left, uh, sorry, three right columns, the red cars show the, the, the different number for each value. So for example, the phi s for the combination of solution A is minus 0 0.087 and with solution B it's minus 0 0.088. So all the differences are negligible. Uh, the combination is better shown on the on the plot on the next slide where you can see the 7 and 8 TeV uh, result in blue, then in green the 13 TeV result and then in red the combine, uh, combine measurement or combine result of uh, the run one plus uh, partial run two analysis. Uh, these are uh, one sigma uh, confidence level contours for the, the most important parameters, uh, the weak phase uh, pi s and the difference of the decay length uh, delta gamma s. So there is a small comparison uh, before and after and also uh, between the experiments. Uh, very sorry for the different color code of the, of the plots. The left plot is uh, made by HFLAP group uh, before uh, the latest uh, LHC results from all the experiments. And the right plot is the comparison uh, of uh, newest results from, I believe, all four, sorry, all three experiments uh, in the LHC. Uh, you can see we are still compatible uh, with a standard model prediction and with a uh, LHCB j psi 2 k plus k minus channel. Um, we are slightly away from the from the combined LHC measurement and also from a CMS. So uh, to summarize that, uh, 
we are not the B physics experiment, but we can still produce very impressive and competitive results. Uh, I've just shown you the latest uh, update of the partial run to analysis of uh, the data from 15, 16, and 17, which is together 80 inverse center bands. And the results are consistent with those obtained in the previous Atlas analysis using 7 and 80 EV data, so we can combine them together. Uh, our All our results are consistent or compatible with the standard model prediction. Um, the analysis of the full run to data, so uh, another 60 inverse center bands is currently ongoing. And please visit the TDK page of all our B physics public results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, really impressive. <laughs> uh, do you uh, any questions from the audience? Otherwise, uh, we move to the FIAS measurements from uh, CMS now. Okay, thank you very much. Let me stop the share. Could people see the hand drying of the time? The text wasn't uh, working when I wrote in the, the slide. No. Sorry? Uh, could you see the time that I wrote? Yes. wrote in Ah, okay. Because yes, the it was very nice. I, I see the first work, five minutes label and then okay. the writing. Yeah. So uh, we can move on then uh, with um, Enrico. Yes, let me share the screen. Can you see the slides? Yes. So, uh, hello, my name is uh, Enrico Luciani, and I'll be presenting the measurement of the CP violating phase VS in the BS to JPSI sci fi channel at 13 TV by CMS. So, let's start with a brief uh, introduction. Uh, FIES is the CP violating phase arising from the interference between uh, direct decays so as to a CP final state and decays through the BS anti BS mixing. Uh, the standard model predicts this to be close to minus two uh, beta S, where beta S is one of the angles in the unitary tri triangle, and equal to about uh, minus 37 millirad with uncertainty below the millirad. However, new physics can change the value of Fies up to 10% via new particles contributing to the BS anti BS mixing. Currently, the results agree with the standard model, but the experimental uncertainty is much higher than the theoretical one. The decay of uh, FIES into JIP sci fi is a good channel to, to measure FIES because there are no direct uh, CP violating predicted, only one CP violating phase, and uh, uh, it's uh, easy to reconstruct uh, using the two muons and the two k. Uh, also, in the same analysis, uh, we can extract uh, several other interesting observables, such as the decay width, the difference decay width between the two uh, eigenstates, the difference in mass, and the module of lambda, which is a parameter quantifying the CP violation. Let's now go to an overview of the analysis. The main issue in the analysis that is that the final state is not a single CP eigenstate, so we need a time-dependent angular analysis to disentangle CPO the CP even components. Uh, for this, we need a parameterization of the angles in the decay. On the right, we can see the one used by CMS, which uses uh, CT, which is the elicity angle of the chaos in the phi rest frame, and theta and phi, which are uh, the spherical coordinates of the muons in the j psi rest frame. We also need the proper decay time of the meson, and this uncertainty, which is evaluated in each event. Finally, we need uh, an accurate flavor tagging to infer the initial flavor of the BS meson, as the terms most sensitive to FIES in the decay rate depends on this. So for the tagging, 
we use the, an algorithm based on the opposite side uh, muon, which uses the um, semi leptonic decays of the second B in the event. Uh, for the analysis, it's important to not only have uh, an accurate uh, estimation of the flavor of the meson, but also um, a measurement of the accuracy uh, for, this, uh, for the flavor. For this, uh, we trained our neural network so that the, uh, the output is directly the missed probability on each event. And we calibrated this output on data using uh, B plus to J psi K plus to set that in the case, as it, we can see in the plot on the right. Uh, post calibration, the average mistake is found to be close to 27%. Since we need uh, a muon uh, for the tagging, we developed a new trigger strategy to enhance the tagging efficiency, which is the number of uh, tagged events over uh, the total number of selected events. Our trigger requires a J psi decaying to two muons plus an additional muon, which is used for the, for the tag. This trigger allows us to improve the tagging efficiency, but at the cost of a reduced number of selected single events. For example, uh, the luminosity of this analysis is about five times the one uh, used in a previous run one analysis but uh, the number of events is similar. We will see that uh, this, is, this has important consequences in the precision of the measurement. Thanks to this new trigger strategy, the tagging efficiency is close to 50%. Let's now look a bit at the model. Without going into details, uh, there are three main terms. The first is the signal, which contains uh, the decay rate, of course the efficiencies and the uh, PDF of, the, of our nuisance parameters. Then we have uh, the combinatorial background and then uh, the, the picking background, which comes some from the case of B0 into J psi K star, where the pion was reconstructed as a K on. Another possible source of uh, background would be the lambda B to J psi K on proton but we estimated this to be negligible in our sample. Uh, the, the, the model is fitted to the data using the unbeamed maximum likelihood fit with uh, inputs, uh, the three angles, the proper decay time, it, its uncertainty, the mass, the tag decision uh, from the tagger and the mistake probability. And from the fit, we can extract uh, the physics parameter Fs, the, decay width, the different decay width, the difference in mass lambda, three amplitude for uh, the different final state, and three strong phases. Here we can see the one dimensional projection of our fit model. We can see the mass, the proper decay time, its uncertainty, and the angles. Here we show the systematic uncertainties for all the parameters in the, in the fit. And in red, uh, we evidence the leading systematic uncertainties for the main parameters. For FIES, these, for example, are the intrinsic bias of the model and the systematic uncertainty associated the, to the limited statistic we used the, to, to compute the angular efficiency. Here we can see the results of the fit. For FIES, uh, uh, we found it to be equal to minus 11 millirad with a statistical uncertainty of uh, 50 millirad and a systematic uncertainty of 10, which is in agreement uh, with the standard model. We also measured uh, uh, the different decay width, which again uh, is in agreement with the standard model. The decay width and the difference in mass, which are consistent with the world average, and the module of lambda which is consistent with having no direct CP violation, which uh, will force its value to one. The results are combined uh, with those from the previous analysis uh, at ATEV, and uh, the result of the combination are shown in this slide. We can see from the plot that uh, uh, the uncertainty of ES is greatly reduced thanks to the increase in the target accuracy but uh, uh, delta gamma s uh, did not improve. 
because uh, it's only sensitive uh, to the total statistics and not to the tagging accuracy. Another thing to note, to note in this plot is that uh, the standard model prediction for delta gamma s in, uh, shown in the plot uh, is a fairly recent uh, result, which greatly improved uh, the uncertainty. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we measured the, C the CP violating phase uh, phi s and uh, the decay white difference delta gamma s using roughly 50,000 uh, single events collected by CMS at 13 TV using uh, an integrated luminosity of uh, about uh, 96 uh, inverse femtobarm. Uh, we developed uh, a novel opposite side tagger based on deep neural network, which can predict the mistake probability on each event, which led to an improved precision in the FIAS measurement. Uh, we combined the result with those from the from a previous analysis, yielding the result shown here, and both are consistent with the standard model prediction. The full article is available at the link uh, shown here. Here is uh, a small comparison with other uh, LAC experiments. In the future, we plan to analyze the full uh, run two dataset, adding a complementary trigger that requires a JPSI plus two char charge tracks. And uh, to improve even further the tagging performance, uh, we will deploy an electron and jet based taggers together with the current beyond base one. Uh, after uh, this new trigger, we expect the, the precision on, of the measurement of yes to improve by about 30% and of delta gamma s about a factor two. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Enrico. Uh, questions from the audience? Yes, Niels, go ahead. Hi, hello, I'm Niels from LHCB. Thanks a lot for your interesting talk. I'm not sure if this is a question to you or, or maybe to the previous speaker, but um, can you maybe comment on, on how you see the difference in the uh, delta gamma s, the decay width difference with, uh, between Atlas and CMS? Uh, yes, we have noticed it, but uh, we have no comment on it. We hope that uh, the continuation of this analysis with the full run two data set uh, will uh, shed some light uh, on, uh, on the difference. Okay, thank you very much. I have a Any question. other question? Um, sorry, I just jumped in. <laughs> I have a question on uh, on the fit projections that you have on page seven. Um, do you have a comment on uh, on how good they are? There seems to be some shifting around uh, in in cost t to t, for example. Yeah, sorry, could you repeat? Um, the, this uh, this uh, fit projection. Um, I know they they don't tell the whole story, so um, that makes sense. But uh, there seems some some shifting, for example, in the fit in cos theta t, uh, where there is a, like a like a, a linear trend, for example, or the the low mass the part of the JSI RKK environment mass. Yes, uh, of course, as you said, these are just projections, so. We cannot infer uh, too much. Uh, for the mass, uh, we tried, uh, uh, we uh, optimized the fit uh, in uh, one dimension and uh, it showed uh, no issues there. Uh, we don't think uh, the, we also tried the different mass models in the, um, and used them as a systematic. Um, we don't think it's an issue uh, for us, the, the not good projection, but, okay. I hope uh, this uh, Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any other comment or question to Enrico? Otherwise, uh, let's uh, move on now to charmless two-body BDKs at LHCB from uh, Davide Fazzini. 
Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, let me show this line. And so, good evening. And uh, uh, I can't see yet your slides. Okay, oh, okay. Now Let's you can see. see. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, good evening. Uh, today, I will give you a talk uh, on the uh, latest results of the measurement of CP violation in charmless two body bimeson decays at LCB. Um, so, the motivation of this analysis uh, is that the CP observable are sensitive to the CKM angle alpha, gamma, beta, and beta s. And there are a rich set of physics processes that contribute to the generally called HB to HH decays, that the small h stand for a k on or a tarion. We have three and penguin decay topologies and also neutral mixing, as you can see uh, from the diagrams in the bottom of the slide. So the key point is that in many of these diagrams, there are loops. And the effect of this loop is introducing adonic uncertainty as additional parameter on the decay amplitude and also make the CPV several sensitive to, to the new physics contribution. Uh, so what we want to measure in this analysis are the time integrated CP asymmetry uh, in B0-2K pi and BS2Pi K decay, which are determined as reported in, uh, in the top of the slide. So the, as the difference between the, the amplitude squared uh, to the F bar and F state divided by the sum of the two, the two uh, um, uh, terms. And also we want to measure the time independent CP asymmetry in B0 to pi pi and BS to KK, which are defined and reported uh, uh, in the middle of the slide. And in particular, we want to measure the free coefficient SF, SF, uh, SEF, SF, and AF delta gamma, which are related to the direct CP violation, mixing induced CP violation, and their symmetry related to the different uh, in a lifetime between the two mass eigenstates. So this free coefficient uh, uh, satisfy a unitary constraint, which is not imposed in the analysis, but you use it a posteriori as a cross-check to, to, to check the final results. So at the moment, the, the measure of the direct CP violation in the B0 to K pi and BS to pi K DK are dominated by the LSCB um, measure and performance at one inverse Fentoban, as you can see from the table. And while the measure on C pi pi and S pi pi are well measured by both the B factories and the LSCB, using the B0 to pi pi decays, and the results of between the three experiments are in very good agreement, as you can see both from the table and also from the typical SCP versus CCP plot reported in the bottom of the slide where there are shown the results of the three, measure, the three experiments and also the world average. So the CP performed also a measurement of CKK and SKK using one inverse Fentoban on the BS2KK sample, and the results are reported in the bottom of the slide. But for the moment, we don't have a measurement for A delta kappa KK. Uh, so the analysis that I'm going to present to, uh, today is performed using the full run one data sample corresponding to uh, free inverse uh, Fentoban. And the CP parameters are determined simultaneously uh, using a multidimensional fit performed, simul performed on the three different spectra, K pi, pi pi, and KK. So in this slide, I point to the, the most important ingredient uh, for the evaluation of the time integrated, the time dependent uh, CP, uh, CP parameters. So for the first group, as you can see from the bottom of the slide, the row asymmetry can be determined in the sum of the three component, one related to the CP asymmetry, and then we have a symmetry due to the final state detection uh, symmetry and the production asymmetry. This, the first term is used as external input, while the second terms can be extracted directly from the SCP by means of a time dependent fit. For the time dependent CP violation, instead, the key points are the flavor tagging and the key time resolution, which uh, uh, indeed diluted the true asymmetry, uh, introducing two, uh, two factors, and the dedicated time acceptance, which is uh, uh, um, which have large effect on the KK parameters, in particular on a delta kappa KK. So the, starting from the event selection, we, this is based on two different steps. The, the first, uh, uh, the first is based on P the selection, which is used to separate the three final state KK, pi pi, and uh, K, uh, K pi, in order to reduce the amount of cross feed background contamination up to 10% uh, of the signal uh, of the signal yield. And then we perform a, a second uh, step using a multivariate uh, algorithm based on the boost decision tree, used to reduce mainly the, the combinatorial background, uh, optimized using the, the, the signal divided the square root of signal plus back. So here, 
on the on the right you can see in the table the final yields for the four main uh, signal mode and in the bottom instead you can see the uh, the invariant mass distribution for the three different spectrum in white you can see the signal which is uh, clearly visible in green the combinatorial background which is uh, very small and then uh, in red the free body uh, partially reconstructed mode and in orange the the crossfit which are very uh, reduced um, so the starting from the flavor going on with the flavor tag which is represent a key a feature for the time dependent analysis uh, in lcb we have two different kind of algorithms the same side uh, taggers which exploit the, the charge of the particle coming from the signal b fragmentation uh, which uh, in, you know, on the right there is a sketch with uh, the uh, the flavor tagging algorithm available in LCB, and the top part is the one related to the same, same side uh, taggers. So we have uh, algorithm that exploit the pion, proton, and, and kion. And then we have the opposite side charm, which exploit the charge information of the decay of the opposite bit, which is in the, the bottom part of the sketch. So each of these uh, algorithms provide the tagging decision and the mistake rate, which is quite important since uh, entered directly in the dilution term that I mentioned before. And the performance on this uh, argument can be estimated using the tagging power, which is the product of the tagging efficiency and the dilution factor squared, which is also one quite important since it is inversely proportional to the statistical uncertainty of, of the CP para asymmetry that we want to measure. Of course, in order to have an unbiased estimation of the mistake probability, we have to calibrate the information provided by the uh, tagging algorithm, and this is performed on a specific control sample. Uh, Going on with the decay time resolution, this is calibrated using uh, simultaneously uh, the B0 to the pi and BS to the pi decay, performing a time dependent fit. Uh, so as you can see from the, 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 the plot on the, uh, on the left on the, on the slide, uh, uh, the, 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 the symmetry in the B0 to the pi is basically reduced only by the, the dilution effect of coming from the flavor tagging since uh, Delta D is very small, and so the dilution from the decay time resolution is negligible. While for the BS, we have both the uh, we have both the dilution factor. So from the first sample, we can estimate the dilution for the flavor tagging, and then looking at the difference, estimate the dilution from the decay time resolution, and then performing it a calibration. Regarding the reconstruction efficiency, uh, this is determined as a function of the decay time using the B0 to k pi decays. Indeed, for this decays, the untagged decay, decay rate can be expressed as a poor exponential. So it's quite easy to retrieve the, the related reconstruction efficiency. And then for all the other decay signal mode, we basically correct the, the acceptance for the B0 to K pi for some factors that are estimated from fully simulated sample. Yeah, on the right, uh, on this slide, you can see the acceptance function for the B0 to K pi. Um, going to the last, uh, uh, ingredient that I mentioned before, that are the, the production and the, the final state detection asymmetry. So the time dependent asymmetry can be measured as, this, as, report, as described here in the top of the slide. So we have different contribution, a term related to the CP asymmetry, then a term related to the, the, the final state, two terms actually, the, the one terms related to the detection asymmetry, and then one another term related to the uh, to the PID uh, requirement applied to select the, the, free, the free spectra, and then the production asymmetry. As you can see, this last term is uh, multiplied by a, a cosine term, so it can be extracted by means of time dependent fit and measured uh, directly on the B0 to K pi and BS to pi KD case. While for the other two, con two, two terms, we have to take, uh, to take their value as external input. And so for the, the PID asymmetry is estimated using the, the star plus to the zero pi decays while the detection asymmetry is measured using the raw asymmetry of Kabipo favorite uh, charm decays, D plus in K pi pi and D plus in K zero pi decays. And of course, at the end, the, the, this asymmetry are convoluted with the B0 to HH phase space in order to, to have a proper correction. Here in the bottom of the slide, you can see the value for this asymmetry uh, for the B0 to K pi and for the BS to pi K decays. So going to the results, is for the K-pi final state, we obtain the most precise measurement from a single experiment. Uh, here in the first box, you can see the, the, the value for the direct CP asymmetry. And on the right, there is the invariant mass uh, distribution for the K-pi spectrum. 
And as I said, the production asymmetry can be determined uh, directly prime by means of the time-dependent fit. And here I report also the value that uh, we obtain for the B0 and the B sub S, and these are compatible with expectation. And we also perform a test on the standard model validity, assuming the U-spin uh, symmetry. So we evaluate this discriminant delta, which is defined as the ratio between the SCP asymmetry between B0 and B sub S, plus the ratio of the branch diffraction of the two decay mode, times the, 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 the ratio between the lifetime of the B0 and the B sub S. And we obtain the results reported here in the slide where the, the first error is related to the, uh, the fixed parameters, the fixed value uh, report used for the evaluation. And the, last, and the second term is related to the CP asymmetry. And this is found to be compatible with the standard model expectation, which is uh, zero. So moving to the PyPy -Pi and KK uh, final status. So for the PyPy, -Pi, uh, also in this case, we, we, we obtain the most precise uh, measurement from a single experiment. We basically have uh, all the, the, the uncertainty, both statistical and also systematics, uh, obtained in the first LCB analysis. Here you can see uh, the, the results for CPyPy -Pi and SPyPy, -Pi, where the first uncertainty is statistical and the second is systematics, along with their correlation. In the bottom of the plot, you can see the, the asymmetry for the, the this spectra using only the opposite side and only the same side target. Uh, going to the KK final state, this was the very first measurement of A, K, 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 A, A delta gamma KK. And performing a chi-square test, we, we, we obtained the strongest evidence of CP violation in time-dependent uh, analysis for the BS sector, confirmed at, at more than four sigma. And here you can see the results for, CK, for the various CP parameters with their statistical and systematic uncertainty. And as before, in the, in the, bot, in the bottom of the slide, you can see the, the asymmetry plot for uh, obtaining using only the opposite side and only the same side attack. Uh, going to the conclusion, um, the latest, uh, which I, today, today I, will, I, I show you the latest measurement of CP violation in B meson uh, the case to charmless charge to body final state. Perform at the LCB. And this is based on full run one corresponding to integrate luminosity of one inverse phantoban at, uh, collected at uh, 7 TV and two inverse phantoban collected at 8 TV. We, get, we got a significant improvement with respect to the previous measurement. We, we obtained the best measurement for CPyPy -Pi and SPyPy -Pi performed from a single experiment, obtained from a single experiment, uh, as well as for the direct CP violation in B0 to KPy and BS2 pi K. And we also get the strongest evidence of pure relation in the BS uh, sector uh, at more than four uh, So the analysis, uh, the analysis update based on RAN2 uh, data is close to be published. Uh, we expect that uh, the combination RAN1 plus RAN2 uh, exceed the five sigma for the CP, CP violation in BS2KK. And then the target of the analysis are the summer conferences. So in the next few months, you should see uh, the uh, new presentation with the new results. So please uh, stay, stay tuned. And that's all from my side. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, David. Uh, questions, comments? Otherwise, thank you again. And you. Uh, remember to make questions at the Mattermost channel. So now we move to three body. Charm, charmless BDKs uh, in LHCB uh, from uh, Tomas Grammatico. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, let me share my slides. <clears throat> okay, is it uh, working? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so today, um, good evening everyone. Uh, today I'll be discussing the recent measurements of CP violation in Charmless uh, three-body beam and decays at LHCB. Uh, I'm Thomas Gramatico and I'm talking today on behalf of the LHCB collaboration. Um, today I will focus on two uh, amplitude analysis, um, the amplitude analysis of B2 pi KK decays and the uh, amplitude analysis of B2 uh, three pi M decays. Uh, why is it interesting to uh, perform such uh, amplitude analysis? Um, if we take a look at those two plots here, um, <clears throat> so those are the um, uh, row uh, asymmetries um, 
uh, represented as that it's plain uh, for on the left uh, b to three pi on and on the right uh, b to pi k k. And what we can see is uh, that uh, we can see the large row asymmetries. Uh, in the case of b to three pi on, there's even asymmetries where there is no known uh, resonances. Uh, and so for those reasons, it's quite interesting to have a look at the, uh, to perform the amplitude analysis. Uh, and also, uh, so this uh, analysis will use um, three inverse phantom bound of uh, uh, data sample. Um, <clears throat> and the decays are coupled through uh, rescattering processes um, between a pair of pion and a pair of km. Um, in both uh, amplitude analysis, uh, the Azobound model will be used to, um, to describe the amplitude. Uh, so the Azobai model consists um, of some of products over the different con contribution um, <clears throat> to disrupt the, uh, the amplitude. Um, the, um, the product uh, contains um, the C term, which is CP evaluating and contains the weak uh, dynamics, and the F term, uh, which is CP conserving. Um, <clears throat> and it's uh, a product of um, a max line shape, uh, most of the time to be a Bragg Digner, um, with an angular dependence uh, and uh, the barrier factors. Um, <clears throat> in the case of B to three pi um, the S wave amplitude will be described by three different approaches. Uh, the first one is the Isobar model we just discussed. Um, next, uh, the, there is also the K matrix formalism that will be used. Um, this formalism uh, conserves the two-body unitarity uh, when the dynamics is dominated by two-body processes. <clears throat> and um, the third uh, approach would be the quasi-model independent uh, procedure um, in which um, the s wave story would be described by bin amplitudes and phases. Um, and to separate the S wave from the other contribution, uh, we use the fact that the S wave amplitude is constant in cos uh, theta elicity. And um, now discussing further the amplitude analysis of B to pi k k, um, the signal yield uh, is about 2000 events for the B plus decay and 1600 events for the B minus. Uh, this is the first time that uh, this uh, the amplitude of the amplitude analysis of this mode uh, has been performed. <clears throat> um, if, we have, if we take a look um, at here on the left, the Dalit's plane for the B plus and on the right, Dalit's plane for the B minus, we can already see, for example, in the green boxes, um, a clear CP evaluation uh, effect when we compare the two uh, distributions. Um, the reason contributions uh, here are limited. Um, in the pi k channel, uh, this can occur only through the penguin diagrams. Uh, for the kk uh, resonances, uh, they can come, they can come both from the tree level and the penguin diagrams. Uh, and the SS bar contribution is suppressed by OZ rule. And the B plus and B minus are fitted simultaneously, uh, which allows for CP validation. <clears throat> um, the that it's plane model that best the model sorry that best describe the that it's plane um, is described here in this table and I've put on the bottom uh, left hand corner the description of the fit fa fit fraction and the amplitude uh, the CP symmetry sorry um, what we can see that the main contribution come from the single pole. Uh, the single pole is a non-resonant amplitude, uh, which is a phenomenolog phenomenological description of the partonic interaction. Um, here's a description of the, um, the form factor. Uh, and another thing which uh, should be mentioned is that the CP asymmetry of the rescattering is uh, about minus 66%, and it's a dominant uh, CP asymmetry that has been measured here. Um, and the rescattering is described as a product of a single pole uh, with the same description as above, um, with a scattering term um, here, uh, where nu is the elasticity and the inelasticity, sorry, and delta is the, the phase shift. <clears throat> uh, we have here on the right, uh, the projection of the number of entries on the invariant mass square of the pair of KM. And 
uh, looking for, uh, at both the B plus results on the top and B minus on the bottom, uh, we can see that the data described by the triangles is quite well modeled, uh, the model being the, the line. And also, uh, again, when we compare both distribution, the CP relation is clearly visible. And so, yeah, uh, as I mentioned, in the S wave, um, <clears throat> the CP relation is uh, around minus 66%. Uh, which is the largest CP relation observation for a single amplitude. Uh, <clears throat> and this result is consistent what with, uh, with what is observed in B plus to uh, 3 pi n. Uh, another thing is that the B to rho 1450 uh, pi fit fraction is quite large at around 30%, which is larger than expected uh, as the, the rho is uh, mainly decaying to two pions, and its contribution to the um, um, the three pion that it's plane is uh, not so high. So we hope that the run two data uh, will give a more um, uh, will help to yeah understand the, this effect. Uh, we can move now to uh, B two three pion decays. Um, <clears throat> The Tinel Hill year is uh, of about 20,000 events. Uh, we have here the valid plane distribution for uh, the B plus on the left and the B minus uh, on the right. Uh, here we have um, two positively charged pions that can be assigned arbitrarily. Uh, and so both symmetry uh, applies uh, here. Um, the model that best describes the Dalit's plane has as main uh, contributions the rho 0, 70, 7, uh, 770, and the S wave. Uh, no CP violation was observed in the rho 0 case. Uh, another thing that it was mentioning in the, the, is that the F2, 1270 um, has a CP violation of uh, around 40%. Uh, which is the first time that uh, CP relation is observed in a process involving a tensor. <clears throat> and uh, also the three approaches uh, are in good agreement, um, as you can see on those tables. <clears throat> uh, if we could take a closer look to the rho omega region, we can see that there is no CP relation uh, observed. Um, uh, when we integrate over cos theta L, as we can see on the projection here of the asymmetry on M low. Uh, but when we look at the asymmetry uh, projected on um, cos theta LCT uh, for um, the mass of the puff pion below 0 0.78 gigaelectron volt here and above this value here, uh, we can see that there is a signal CP violation. Uh, which changes sign uh, on each side of the row peak. Uh, and this effect uh, cancels when we integrate uh, over the ACT angle and or the invariant mass. Um, in the PP S wave, in the PyPy, sorry, S wave case, um, we can see from those uh, projection of the amplitude square on the mass of the pair of pion, on the invariant mass of the pair of pion, we can see that. Uh, the three different approaches are quite consistent with each other. And also there is a clear CP asymmetry uh, below the K plus K minus threshold uh, where it changes sign. Um, and yeah, in the F2-1270 region, uh, as I said, there is a, a CP violation, a, a CP asymmetry in the zone of about uh, Forty percent, um, as we can see also on this plot, which is the asymmetry uh, projected on the on M low. Um, this is the again the first time that uh, such an asymmetry has been observed in a process involving a tensor, and this result is robust with respect to the experimental and model uncertainties. Uh, to summarize. Um, <clears throat> To better understand the, the row asymmetries that were, that were observed uh, in B uh, to pi kk and B to three pi indicates, uh, challenging amplitude analysis were performed. In the case of B to pi kk, um, as you can see on those plots, a large CP violation was observed in the S wave contribution. 
which is consistent with what is observed in the B2-3 pion. Uh, for B2-3 pion, um, the S-wave contribution that is included in the, the model that described the dense plane um, give, uh, consistent, uh, is well described uh, by the three approaches and they are consistent with each other. Um, and there are three uh, sources on, of CP variation that I would like to mention now, which are the um, CP variation uh, in the S-wave, in the interferences between the S and the P-wave, uh, and also uh, separation uh, in a, a D wave, which is the first time that uh, this has been uh, observed. Uh, and so, yeah, we we expect that the run two, we hope that the run two will bring new exciting insight on these decays. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Thomas. Questions, comments? I don't see any. So in that case, thank you again. And now we move to charmless Bibariums. Thank you. From uh, Matteo Bartolini. Okay, I see the slides. Ah, uh, you're muted. Okay. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Um. So uh, good afternoon. Uh, so I will, uh, in this presentation, I'll be talking to you about the latest uh, results uh, from LHCB concerning uh, the search for CP violation in charmless bivalent decays. Um, uh, as you know, a CP violation is well established in a KB in the Mason's decays and is well consistent with standard model predictions, but it, it has not been observed yet uh, in bivalent decays. Also, uh, lambda B and XIB production is uh, abundant in LHCB, uh, in LHC, and this gives uh, the LHCB experiment uh, uh, an opportunity to study multibody case of B flavored virions. Um, multibody final states uh, are a very interesting place to search for speed violation because they can exhibit uh, average resonance structures, and therefore, uh, which can which can cause uh, local CP uh, by, uh, violation effects. So this talks, uh, I'll be talking in particular about uh, this, this case with this topology where either uh, lambda B or, or XI B, uh, the case for proton and three mesons, which can be either pions or chaos. Uh, so uh, to this talk, uh, two approaches will be used uh, will be shown uh, the standard XP evaluation methods, which measures the asymmetry between uh, the decay rate of a, of a baryon and its charge conjugate, and a complementary approach, uh, which is uh, uh, called typical product asymmetries, where one builds a uh, odd observable by combining the momentum of the final, of three final state particles in the matter rest frame. And, uh, measure, and by splitting the samples according to the sign of this of the C variable and the, and the flavor of the B variants, one can measure uh, these two CP violating asymmetries and also uh, these uh, two B violating asymmetries. Uh, these two approaches are complementary in the sense that they have different sensitivity to the, to the physics. The standard CP violation is uh, more sensitive to CP violating effects uh, that have uh, when the difference in strong phases uh, of the interfering amplitude is large. On the contrary, the CP to the symmetries is more sensitive to effects uh, where the, the difference in strong phase uh, is uh, small. Uh, they also show different sensitivity to systematic effect because uh, by definition, uh, the CPTO, the symmetry is not affected by reconstruction efficiency. Uh, 
and, and the potential behavior of production symmetries. Um, okay, so let me first start with the, the first experimental results uh, concerning the, the sexual simulation in lambda B to protons and triple pines. Uh, these uh, using triple culture symmetries. This decays uh, is very rich, has a very rich resonance structures uh, where contributions proceed mainly through these quasi two body uh, decays listed here. Uh, the first measurement was uh, released uh, uh, by LHCB uh, in 2017 by using a, a sample of uh, corresponding material luminosity of three inverse Ventobarn in run one. And uh, so both the phase based integrated asymmetry was measured where both the uh, CP, uh, CP uh, and P asymmetries are consistent with zero and also asymmetries in the regions of the phase space to, to be more sensitive to local simulation effect. So two schemes were defined, scheme A, which were one beans on these resonances mainly, and also on, on the phi, phi, which is the angle between, between the angle defined by the planes uh, of this uh, combination of these two particles. And one sees here that for the first time, one sees the first uh, evidence of local CP violation effect at 3.3 sigma level. A similar approach, uh, so uh, same approach, but with slightly different uh, decays uh, listed here, was used, uh, it was measured in uh, using uh, the run one data set in, uh, in 2011, 2012. And, uh, both the phase based integrated asymmetries for the three channels are consistent with zero. And also, the asymmetries in the regions of the phase space, uh, like for example, this decay uh, binning, on, uh, binning was done on these resonances, uh, renouncing contributions of the resonances, uh, and also on the angle defined by the, uh, this, uh, these particles. And no evidence of force evaluation is found. Now, uh, the, uh, the, the, this decay, lambda B to protons and tripines, was, uh, was recently up updated by adding uh, uh, also the two data sets uh, corresponding to an integrated luminosity of 6.6 uh, .6 inverse phantom burn. Also, uh, an, op uh, an optimized selection was used, uh, which led to an yields which is four times larger than the previous analysis. Uh, two methods have been used, uh, the uh, standard triple parallel asymmetries uh, and uh, with an uh, optimized binning scheme and also an ambient energy test. Uh, so going to the, moving to the results, uh, for the uh, phase space integrated asymmetries, uh, we see that uh, for the CP asymmetries, uh, it is consistent with, uh, with zero. But for the, but we see a difference. Uh, or we see a deviation of the, the five point five sigma level for for the p symmetry. And whereas uh, for the uh, symmetries in the in the specific regions of the phase space, uh, the scheme A and B previously defined that were also in this case were separated by a cut on the on this uh, mass combination to announce uh, these particular contributions. And what we see here is that. Uh, we see also no evidence uh, for CP violation where the high significance is reached in this, uh, uh, say, in this uh, scheme, scheme B2, where the high significance is 2.9, and it, which is uh, slightly reduced with respect to the uh, previous analysis. Now, a uh, complementary uh, method is known as energy test method, which is, uh, say, uh, a model independent approach. And uh, it's method is sensitive uh, to local uh, differences between two samples. And the test is defined here, where this psi is, uh, is, is defined uh, as follows, where D is uh, an Euclidean distance between two candidates in the phase space uh, defined by uh, the combinations of by, by these uh, coordinates in the phase space. Delta is uh, a distance uh, in the scale in the in the phase space and is uh, treated as a few parameters. So and T is large when uh, there is a significant localized differences between two samples. So 
So going to the results, uh, uh, what, what, what was done is that uh, the sample was divided into four subsamples, uh, which are linked to each other according to the following P and C transformation. And, uh, and the four one can uh, uh, say, uh, do three tests, uh, CP, P of tests by uh, combining the one uh, uh, and the and four uh, subsample and also the uh, two and three as, a, as the second sample. Uh, a CP P and test when the first sample is done by combining by adding one and two and uh, uh, three, three and four. And a P test where, uh, where the first sample is uh, obtained by adding one and three and uh, two and four. And the results show it was calculated for uh, three different values of the, of this delta. And the results shows that uh, we have the higher significance uh, in uh, the CP even tests, but the combined significance is less than three sigma. Whereas for the uh, P tests, uh, we see a 5.3 sigma deviation from the P symmetry. And okay, now uh, uh, search for CP violation was also performed uh, in these channels. But by using the, the standard CP uh, asymmetries, uh, and uh, so the data sample cor also corresponds to a three inverse Fentubarn uh, collisions collected in 2011 and 2012. And uh, so, so this is the case of every standard case that have been studied. And okay, and uh, the, the method is the direct CP asymmetries, uh, which which is uh, whose formula is we are familiar with, and uh, but this is a, this is a, is a symmetry which, which can be say uh, affected by track detection efficiencies and the other production asymmetries, and therefore in order to get rid of it, uh, we use, what we use, what they use is is a control uh, a channel control channel with similar kinematics uh, and no simulation expected in the standard model. And so and one measures the so the following uh, CP asymmetry, true CP asymmetries, where the fake CP asymmetries are eliminated at the first order. And uh, so the the, the asymmetries are extracted by an unbinary maximum likelihood fit, uh, where the data are split according to the charge of the protons you know, to extract the asymmetries. And and now going to the results, uh, uh, we see that the integrated asymmetries uh, are, are consider all consistent with zero for the channels, and so we see no evidence for deflation. Uh, also, but the search was also performed in specific regions of the phase space uh, to search for local effects of the deflation, and mainly. Uh, Two regions were defined: are regions of the low invariant mass on the baryonic pair, where they re where we place a cut on this combination of protons and uh, mesons, and also in the specific regions of the phase space that contain quasi two-body or three-body decays. Now you see here the S weighted uh, distributions of, uh, of, the, of, the, of some combination of invariant masses, and you can see the resonances uh, were no resonances. And the results uh, also uh, for the both for the low body mass regions and the positive body region leads uh, sh shows that there is no evidence neither for the low body mass regions and the, in the positive body regions. Uh, this brings me to the conclusions of this talk, where I, I have shown you that uh, multi body decays uh, is a very interesting place to search for civilization due to the, the fact that they have uh, a rich phase based structures. Um, so there, for the moment, we have no evidence for CP violation in, in both in lambda B and xi decays, uh, but uh, CP violation was found in this particular decays at 5.5 sigma level. What, what is interesting to note is that the, we, we already reached a precision of few percents in many, many channels, uh, and a significant improvement is, is expected for run three, because uh, actually we run at much at, 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 uh, high luminosities, and also because uh, in particular, the channels with fine state hardens would benefit a lot from the removal of the L0 arbor trigger. Uh, so that's all, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Matteo. Any questions?
Okay, don't see any. So we finish the CP violation block and we move to our last uh, talk of this block and of the session with uh, Salvatore Ayola on the dipole beam experiment. Hello, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, do you see the slides? Yes. Okay, um, so good evening everybody. I'm gonna present today the Dipole B project, which is a project uh, aiming at measuring, uh, the, measuring the dipole moments of uh, electromagnetic moments of short lived particle at the LHC. Uh, um, so first, just a, a quick introduction about um, electromagnetic double moments in particle physics. We know that uh, all uh, fundamental uh, particles uh, have non-zero magnetic double moments. Uh, well, most, no, not all. Uh, well, there are fundamental particles with non-zero magnetic double moments. For example, the electron and, uh, um, and all most of the particles that we know of. Compo composite particles such as hadrons have a magnetic dipole moment that's stemming from their constituents. Uh, and uh, for example, for the proton and neutron, the values that uh, we have are, uh, from the theory are in qualitative agreement with uh, the experimental measurements. However, we have uh, no experimental evidence of electric dipole moment of any fundamental and we also have a limited uh, experimental da data for electromagnetic dipole moments of unstable particles, such as the tau, the lambda zero, and the lambda c. Um, so why there is no electromagnetic dipole moment in fundamental particles? This is due to the fact that uh, a permanent EGM um, violates uh, both parity and time reversal symmetry. And uh, assuming that the, the CPT uh, theorem holds, this means that uh, a permanent EDM violates also CP. Um, this can, the, um, according, since we know that there is a, a the CP violation in the standard model, uh, this uh, uh, allows for a very tiny electromagnetic double moment, but this is uh, so small that uh, it's uh, very far away from uh, what we can experimentally probe. So if we, we do see uh, an, an, electromagnetic, an electric dipole moment in any fundamental particle, this is a direct evidence of beyond standard model physics because uh, it requires additional CP violation uh, beyond what is uh, um, in the standard model. So these are, are the current uh, limits on the, uh, on the electric dipole moments of uh, uh, some of the non some um, particles. Uh, so and so, the the, the magenta uh, bars from the from below are the limits coming from uh, the um, expected uh, values from the standard model. From above, the red bars indicates the current uh, experimental limits, and we see that there is a large gap between the experimental limits and the standard model prediction. So there is a, a large uh, a large region for uh, potential discovery. In particular, I'm going to focus on uh, these uh, on some uh, unstable particles, on these unstable particles, so particularly the lambda um, zero and the charm variance, where we see that indeed the uh, separation between the limits, uh, the experimental limits, and the standard model prediction is quite uh, large. Uh, so, how do we measure a particle electromagnetic dipole moments? Uh, we do this by measuring uh, the precession of the particle uh, uh, type of moments in a strong electromagnetic field. Uh, of course, in order to observe uh, precession, we need uh, to have uh, polarized uh, beam of particles, and we must measure the initial and final polarization, so before and after the precession magnetic field, via uh, the angular distribution of the decay products, since these are unstable particles. Uh, the tricky part of this uh, measurement is that if, uh, this since these are unstable particles, they must travel in the electromagnetic field long enough uh, to gain a sufficient precession before decaying. So I'm going to uh, talk about two different uh, measurements that we plan to do. 
Uh, one is uh, about the lambda zero. In this case, uh, we look for uh, production in weak decays of heavy variants, where uh, the lambda zero is, uh, produ is uh, produced with the longitudinal polarization because of the, the relation of the weak decay. Then we will look for precession in the LHCB dipole, mo uh, dipole magnet. And we reconstruct the lambda zero, uh, looking at the case that occur after the, the magnet uh, before the um, tracking stations that are placed downstream of the magnet. Uh, the second uh, part of the presentation will be related instead to another measurement uh, that, uh, is, um, that aims at measuring the electromagnetic moments of uh, charm variants. Uh, in this case, we will look for uh, uh, charm variants produced in, uh, in produced promptly in fixed target uh, uh, proton tungsten collision. Uh, we know that uh, uh, these uh, variants are produced with the transverse polarization. Uh, this is because Parry is conserved in strong interactions. And uh, we, will look, we will look for um, precession through the cha through channeling in the bent crystal. I will uh, explain how this uh, is done. And then, we and then we plan to reconstruct the charm variants uh, inside the LHCB detector. So let's start uh, from the lambda zero measurement. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we uh, look for uh, uh, lambda zero that come from every variant decay, for example, just uh, for an illustrative purposes, but it can be done in different case. And here we will look for Xi C, that case in lambda zero K plus K pi. The lambda zero is polarized longitudinally uh, due to the parity variation with the case. The um, K pi uh, particles are reconstructed as long tracks, uh, and uh, their vertex coincides with the vertex of the Xi C. So the vertex of the K pi can uh, allow us to know where the Xi C decayed, which is detached from the uh, primary vertex. Uh, the lambda zero then will uh, proceed, process in the uh, magnetic field of the of, of LHCB, and um, um, and and we will uh, select only those lambda zero that decay after the magnetic uh, uh, field uh, region. The um, proton and the pion coming from the decay of the lambda are reconstructed using tracks uh, with the stations downstream of the, of the magnet. The challenge is that uh, we have a very limited momentum resolution uh, for T-tracks. Uh, in fact, uh, the proton and uh, the pion mo uh, momenta are uh, measured uh, based on the presence of the magnetic field that leaks out of the dipole uh, magnet. This allows for a uh, momentum resolution uh, of around 20%. However, uh, this can be improved using uh, constraints from decay kinematics, because as I said earlier, uh, we know that um, um, the, ver the, the vertex, uh, the decay vertex of the Xi C, thanks to the reconstruction of the K on the pi in the case, uh, in this case. So we um, used two bench benchmark study cases. Uh, one is lambda B that case in the, in the um, J psi lambda, the other lambda C that case in lambda uh, three pi, three pi's. Um, we choose these two ones uh, because the reconstruction is uh, particular is um, easier than other decay channels, particularly the one with the J psi. Uh, however, these uh, channels will not uh, provide the best uh, statistical significance because those are uh, quite rare decays. Um, so using uh, this decays, we made a proof of principle that uh, using LHC run two data that uh, we can reconstruct these decays. The um, promising pro progress has been done so far with the lambda zero mass resolution of around 15, 20 MeV over C squared. Uh, we, we, are, we use an MDA to improve the signal background discrimination and the resolution using uh, boosted decision tree and uh, artificial neural networks. And um, we also identified the main source of background, which is quite abundant for these, uh, uh, for these uh, decay uh, reconstruction because of the secondary interactions uh, with the material that occur in the beam pipe and uh, uh, in the superstructure of the tracking stations. 
Uh, now, uh, we are, we're also working on preparing a trigger strategy for uh, CRN3. LSCB will take data using a fully software-based trigger. So this, of course, uh, um, puts also some requirements, not only on the physics um, efficiency of the measurement, but also on the computing efficiency of the algorithms. So let's move to the other uh, measurement that uh, we plan to do. Uh, this is, uh, as I said, this is based on uh, particle channeling bed crystal. There's a long history of channeling physics. Uh, and um, so let me just uh, say briefly what uh, is about, what it is about. So channeling is a phenomenon whereby uh, the trajectory of a charged particle is constrained in the, uh, by the planes or axis of a crystalline solid. Um, channeling efficiency has been uh, observed also in uh, particles with uh, 100 GeV of energy and even uh, 6.5 TeV protons at the LHC. Uh, in particular, if the crystal uh, is bent, then the, uh, it can be used to guide the particle in the cut trajectory. The spin precession of polarized particle traveling to a bent crystal was theorized already in uh, the late 70s, and it has been uh, a proof of principle measure that was done already in the 90s, uh, measuring the, the, um, the MDM of uh, lambda aerobic sigma variant. And um, what we plan to do now is to use this uh, similar technique to measure the uh, electromagnetic double moment of the lambda C, with, with the challenge, of course, that the lambda C has a much shorter decay length. So the plan is to put uh, a crystal uh, in um, um, about 100 meters away from the interaction point of LHCB. Uh, so this uh, first crystal is a crystal kicker that will deflect the beam halo towards um, a fixed target uh, of tungsten. The, the, the protons will interact with tungsten target and produce a lambda C that will uh, enter a second pair of crystals that uh, where the lambda C will um, undergo precession. And uh, then we will uh, measure the lambda C uh, decays in the LHCB detector. Uh, then we, there will be absorbers uh, downstream of this experimental setup to absorb all the products that uh, do not interact with the tungsten target. So these are the projected limits on the electromagnetic dipole moment of, the, uh, of several particles by uh, charm and the beauty variance that can be measured in this um, configuration. And we see that, uh, they, uh, that, that they are quite uh, competitive compared to what uh, we have now. I mean, for most of these particles, we actually have no experimental limits at all. Um, then we, okay. then we have also projected limits on the magnetic type of moments uh, that uh, would provide a very, uh, very stringent QCD precision test. Um, so the status of the project is that we have uh, done um, an extensive R&D on long band crystals. Uh, we had two crystals were tested, uh, one made of germanium, one made of silicon. We have observed uh, channeling in uh, these long crystals with the good efficiency that is uh, uh, enough for the experiment, for uh, our experiment. So in this uh, figure, you see the, um, the, the, the peak at zero corresponding to particles that traverse the crystal without uh, entering the channeling, uh, um, the channeling uh, condition, whereas uh, uh, at uh, 16 uh, millirad, you see the particles that come out of the crystal after being uh, bent uh, by, the, by, the, by, by the crystal structure. Uh, so in summary, uh, the measurement of um, magnetic, electromagnetic double moment of unstable, unstable particles extends the LHC physics program. It's a unique program of measurements at LHC using the LHCB detector. Um, so far, we have, uh, so regarding the lambda zero measurement, we have achieved the reconstruction of the case beyond the magnetic region uh, using an MDA to discriminate signal background, and we have studied the background uh, sources, sources. And the next steps is to study the elicity uh, measurement resolution and define a pro and propose a trigger strategy for our entry. Regarding the uh, fixed tar target setup for the charm baryon uh, measurement, we have the long-bent pro, uh, crystal pr uh, prototypes that have been uh, um, 
uh, the, the tested and um, are uh, uh, good candidates for this experiment. Then we have done some preparatory studies uh, for and um, simulations so in LHC. The uh, machine layout has been uh, designed by the experts of LHC, the, of the accelerator. Uh, and uh, so the next steps will be to prepare a technical design report. And uh, this is all uh, I have uh, for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Salvatore. Um, questions? Comments? This is Alexi Petrov. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, so, so this uh, the channeling. Uh, I, I'm not a specialist in, in in channeling bent crystals, but this seems to be qu quite exciting technique. Would it work for leptons as well? I mean, for instance, if I would like to measure, you know, uh, MDMs of of, ta of tau leptons, for instance. Yeah, certainly. In fact, uh, I didn't talk about this because uh, of uh, time constraints, but uh, there is indeed a proposal. I can send you um, a link to a paper that was published uh, a few months ago about the proposal to use a similar technique uh, to uh, apply it to the measurement of the tau uh, electromagnetic dipole moment. It is uh, more challenging because uh, of, um, of how the tau decays, so it's a, it's, a, it's a more challenging measurement. It requires a lot more statistics, but uh, yes, certainly it's, uh, it can be done also for, um, for leptons. Cool, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? I have a, a couple. Uh, so the idea is to, to start by the start of round three then? Uh, no, the idea is to start uh, perhaps in the, in the, during round three. So, uh, maybe uh, to to install uh, these uh, the equipment should should be possible maybe I mean with this we have to still negotiate with the with the accelerator expert but uh, uh, certainly we will not be ready for the start of round three so if we manage we do it uh, in um, in one of the technical stops uh, end of year technical stops that uh, during round three otherwise it will be done in round four. Okay, and another thing due to my ignorance. So uh, what uh, can you comment on possible new physics uh, models that would lead to EDM? I think uh, th there, there could be many. I mean, it, it, it just requires additional CP violation uh, in the standard model. So I think pretty much any model that, uh, that uh, adds CP violation to the standard model um, could have uh, an electromagnetic dipole moment. I think it's not difficult to uh, to have this in a model. It's, it just requires more CP violation. More CP violation, okay. Yeah. So, uh, are there any other questions? So, otherwise, uh, this is the finish of the session two of the quark and lepton uh, flavor track. Tomorrow, the, the third uh, session, uh, the premiere will be in the morning, starting at 8 a.m. Uh, European time. So we move to the morning for uh, Thursday and uh, Friday. So see you tomorrow. Thank you all. For those who want to stay here to discuss further, the, the, the Zoom room will be open for a while. Thank you.